So hey guys welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto was neglected by his family and adopted by Ichi. Part 4. If you guys enjoy this, what if? And you want the next part of this video? Comment down below. And let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So let's start the video. Chapter 17. The Magicum Blooms. Naruto called off the protective cloak of demonic energy with a rare smile on his face as he started to walk off to the waterfall. He had gotten in three progressively more difficult fights and had come out victorious, each time pushing himself to new limits, even he didn't know he had. Now all he needed to do was retrieve the cargo if you will and it was all over. Or that's what he thought until he heard someone speak from behind him. Hello, Naruto-kun. Turning around alarmed that someone had gotten behind him so easily, Naruto knew this would not be good for his health. If this person was capable of sneaking up behind him then there was no doubt that they would easily be able to kill him in his weakened state. All of those mortem thoughts vanished however, when Naruto's blue eyes met with the familiar stoic expression of his sensei and the brother of the shinobi he had just battled. Itachi Ichi. Of course Naruto knew that he was called one of Kanahagakure's greatest traitors, but in Naruto's somewhat biased opinion, his sensei was nothing like the snake Sanin. Naruto's breathing was still heavy as the toll of using most of his chakra, then the exhaustion from accessing the Kaiubi's chakra slowly continued to take effect on his tired body. He smiled a tired smile at the welcome sight of his favorite sensei. Ayatachi sensei what are you doing here? Shouldn't you be out with Mihik sensei traveling around doing whatever it is you two do? Sure the raven-haired Yuzumaki was glad to see him, but that didn't mean he wasn't confused as to the reason Itachi was here. Itachi ignored Naruto's question in favor of looking towards the waterfall, where he knew his brother had just been sent towards before looking back at Naruto emotionlessly. He had a few questions that needed to be answered himself, such as was Danzo involved in this at all. I was coming to the leaf so I could check on you like I planned on doing before the Chunin exams, but something came up that took a majority of my time until a few weeks ago. That brought a smile to Naruto's face, since he never really had anyone checking up on him aside from Makoto and Hiruzen, but here Itachi would travel across the continent to check up on him. It just felt good to know that the man he saw as a big brother cared about him enough to put himself at an inconvenience. Naruto did note that Itachi's eyes kept flickering between him and the waterfall, but Itachi didn't comment on it. However, right now he didn't care. He was finally seeing his sensei after so long and he wanted to enjoy it. Now that I am here I need to tell you about the person, or I should say group that caused me the delay, because it will more than likely involve you eventually Naruto-kun. Itachi said with a slight frown on his usually emotionless face. He didn't like the idea of a group of S-rank Nukunin going after his student and surrogate little brother. Naruto watched silently as Itachi brought his hand up towards his eyes, where he then pointed specifically to his Sharingan enhanced gaze. Understanding the silent message Naruto brought his dwindling chakra to his eyes, unleashing his own pair of cursed eyes. The two then locked gazes where the younger shinobi allowed his sensei to put him under a harmless jinjutsu that was meant for Itachi to be able to share his memories with the Uzumaki clan head. It would show Naruto that he and Mihik had encountered the Akatsuki and the goal that the missing nin allowed to leak in his confidence. However just as they got to the point between the point of no return and where the information was about to be transferred, Sasuke emerged from the waterfall, sporting a massive spot of red flesh around his stomach, showing that Naruto pulled back, so only the demonic chakra seared his skin. The furious and equally exhausted Sasuke looked ahead, but from his position, Sasuke could only see Naruto's back and not his brother who was ahead of Naruto. The Avenger's lips twisted into a smirk as he fired up the last Jidori he'd be able to manage until he was fully recovered. The sounds of the chirping birds created by the powerful lightning release technique went unheard by the two in the Jinjutsu world. Sasuke seizing his opportunity lunged forward and drove his hand through Naruto's chest just barely missing the heart. Naruto's eyes widened when he was cut from the Jinjutsu and his vision already faded from the Sharingan and started to get bleary. Looking ahead Naruto saw that Itachi seemed to still be looking on stoically as he coughed up a mouthful of blood and before he could gather any thoughts on the matter he was unconscious. Sasuke's satisfied smirk turned to a downright furious expression when he saw his brother of all people standing there. Ignoring that horrified look on Itachi's face, the cursed warrior ripped his arm from Naruto's chest before throwing him into the water with a loud splash. Seeing the source of his hatred, Sasuke's curse mark went straight into stage 2. The hate-filled Nin quickly went to perform another Chidori that would have surely killed him until he felt a sharp pain on the back of his neck. Sasuke fell forward only to be caught or more specifically draped over the arm of a man in the Akatsuki's robes with an orange spiral mask showing off one dark hole so the person behind it could see. 
Itachi who watched the whole thing happen in less than a second, from the man appearing to knock out Sasuke and the elder of the siblings, immediately reacted by firing off a grand fireball, but sadly the man had already absorbed Sasuke into a black wormhole, and the ball of flames passed through him harmlessly. Ah. Why would you try and set Toby on fire? Toby is a good boy. The masked man now named Toby asked in a childish voice that could easily make any person think that he was an idiot. Itachi thought better, he remembered this man from the night that he slaughtered the Ichiha clan, and he knew that he was no good. Drop the act. I remember you well from when you contacted me the night of the Ichiha clan's massacre to join the Akatsuki. What do you want with Sasuke? Itachi hissed angrily seeing how his brother was just abducted. Even with all of his Anbu training to control his emotions, he still couldn't tame the great love he held for his brother. Toby's lips twitched into an amused but satisfied smirk behind his swirling orange mask, seeing how the Kamacha has started to show any kind of emotion. Of course he had plans for Sasuke, but Itachi didn't need to know what that plan was. Seeing no point in holding up the childlike charade Toby spoke in a much deeper voice. It doesn't matter what I want with Sasuke. If you care so much stay alive and find out. Goodbye Itachi Ichiha. Then like he was never there in the first place Toby was sucked into a black wormhole that came through the space behind him. Itachi stared angrily at the spot that Toby once occupied before shaking his head and hurrying down the river, his Sharingan desperately searching for Naruto's body, which he found was quickly traveling towards a shallow set of rapids. Humping chakra through his system, Itachi hurried to Naruto's aid, pulling him out of the current before the rocks below could do any more damage to Naruto's delicate state. Laying the unconscious wounded shinobi on the ground, Itachi prepared the mystic palm jutsu until he felt a familiar signature closing in and fast. The Ichiha prodigy knew who this person was and had no desire to be around her, especially when she was angry. Taking a step back Itachi proceeded to vanish in a perfectly executed shunshin, and just before the person he was avoiding made her presence on the scene. Eyes wide in fear and disbelief, Kishina looked at the sight of her son bleeding, and she acted quickly getting a stasis seal ready to apply to Naruto. Sachi. The pain groan escaped from Naruto's lips as he woke up, eyes slowly blinking the sleep out of them as the seconds ticked by. After a few moments in the silence of the dark, hospital room Naruto managed to get a grasp on just where he was. He remembered going back to recover Sasuke, but it was dark then as it was now so for all Naruto knew he could have been out a day or a week. The thing that had the young shinobi stumped was how all of this happened because he was 100% sure that he had everything under control back at the valley of the end, so that raised the question of what happened to put him in such a state. Closing his eyes Naruto began and tried to recall what happened after he had put Sasuke in the waterfall. In the silence and dark the hospitalized Uzumaki continued to recall things his mind had locked away from him, and in the end he broke through that mental barrier. He remembered Itachi showing up and talking with him about a few things then shortly after putting him under a Jinjutsu. Slowly Naruto's mind pieced together his own version of what happened, and the end result made the teen's blood boil. He knew that Itachi was looking toward Sasuke a little too often for his liking. So in Naruto's mind it made perfect sense that it was a way for him to stall enough so that his brother could recover. The Jinjutsu was all just a move to put Naruto in a position where he couldn't protect himself from Sasuke's Chidori. He always knew that Itachi loved Sasuke even for all of his faults, and there were quite a few. Naruto sat up and glared at the wall in front of him as he hissed in pain, putting his hand to his chest, only making it worse, but it didn't quite compare to the hurt he was feeling psychologically. I always knew that Itachi loved being a big brother, even if it was to someone as spoiled and arrogant as Sasuke, but I always thought he cherished the bond we had as much as I did. Why would he even train me if it meant he was going to stab me in the back later on? Naruto asked in nothing more than a whisper as he gripped at the sheets pooling around his waist, his anger growing the more he thought about what happened. He even remembered his own last sight before passing out, and he swore it was clear as day. He didn't even look surprised. Naruto's knuckles went wide as he continued to force as much of his physical strength as he possibly could into his grip, as if it could do away with some of his anger, but it only continued to grow as Naruto put everything in a greater perspective. Why is it that everyone I am supposed to be able to trust wrongs me? I trusted my parents to give me a life of care and nurturing instead I was left with neglect and abandonment. I trusted the village to be a place where I could live in peace and be safe. I got a massive mob of citizens who would only allow me to be in peace when it was in a grave they sent me to. I was supposed to be able to trust Itachi to be my big brother, but instead I was pushed away in favor of a self-absorbed megalomaniac. Why is it that I am the one left in the trash? Naruto shouted out towards the open window like the answer would come to him. The anger and feeling of betrayal fueled Naruto's ocular powers, and his red and black eyes slowly began to transform. The black tomo in each eye suddenly grew and turned each eye completely black. Slowly a red flower sprung out in the center of each purely black eye, the red flower became more defined as each second went by. 
the petals of the Japanese rose that were each started to get much more curved to the point that every flower petal looked like a small reaper's blade. The pain of awakening his Manjukum Sharingan quickly took its effect, reaching for his eyes Naruto clamped down on his skull with his hand, but before he could pass out due to the pain he felt something land on his lap. Peering through the spaces between his fingers with his Manjukum, Naruto smiled seeing that it was Susei. Are you okay Naruto-kun? I could feel your distress building through our link, and I hurried over as fast as I could. Susei asked with no small amount of concern as she looked into Naruto's floral pattern Manjukum eye, with a matching set on her face. Staring into the eyes of his familiar Naruto, knew that her eyes evolved as he did so he realized just what had happened. He had finally gained his next Sharingan, so it looked like Itachi's betrayal had served him some good. Yes but we are both about to pass out Susei, but can I ask you a question before that happens? Naruto asked, his voice soft and his Manjukum fading back to his normal blue eyes, as he waited for the crow's response. Susei tilted her head to the side, her own eyes going back towards the standard black for crows, before she nodded slowly, telling Naruto to go ahead and speak his mind. Please promise me that you'll always be there when I need you. Susei stayed silent for a few moments, but not because she had to think about the answer, it was because she had never heard Naruto sound so vulnerable, he was always so strong, steadfast. I will always be at your side, Naruto-kun. What are partners for if not that? Susei's answer brought a small chuckle from Naruto before he and Susei both succumbed to sleep so their bodies could adjust to the new powers in their eyes. Naruto's azure eyes made their way towards the door to his hospital room where there was a soft click on the other side of the door. He was wondering when someone would come to check on him, but he did realize he woke up just after sunrise, so he did expect to have to wait some time for someone to come and do the checkup. From his slightly reclined position Naruto felt a sense of relief, seeing that Shizun would be the one doing his checkup. With her as the medic Naruto knew that he wouldn't have to worry with any unfair treatment and that her decision would be the best for him. Hello Naruto-san, I am surprised to see you up so early this morning. Shizun spoke walking into the room with a friendly smile that Naruto knew to be normal for the female medic. The pupil of Tsunade walked towards the chart at the foot of Naruto's bed, so she was sure about the last recorded results from the previous night and didn't make a careless mistake. From his slightly inclined position on the hospital bed, Naruto nodded his head slightly, since he was sure that as a medic, she was used to walking into a room with a sleeping patient, or at least a drowsy patient. I am sure that my body knows it has been bedridden long enough. If I may ask Shizun-san, how long have I been under your care? Humming to herself Shizun finished her assessment of the medical records on hand for the Yuzumaki clan head, before she walked to the side of the hospitalized teen's bed with a gentle smile. Activating the mystical palm jutsu the medic nin began to perform maintenance procedures on Naruto's body. It has been four days since Kashina-san brought you back from the valley of the end and you have been here ever since. Naruto closed his eyes and remained still so Shizun's hands could take inventory and discover if there were any lingering problems with his health. Naruto opened his eyes and looked to his caretaker for an assessment on his health. Well Naruto everything is fine aside from the massive scarring on the right side of your chest. The only major problem is that to get your arm back to full capacity, you will need to go through physical therapy. Now Naruto had a general base of knowledge on many things, something that only increased after he became the clan head of the Uzumaki here in Konoha, but that did not mean he knew everything, and this was one of those cases. His face scrunched a bit as he tried to think why that was. Shizun picked that up and immediately began to explain the situation to her patient so he could understand what was going to be expected of him. The lightning nature of the attack that struck you did a number on the nerves and muscles in your arm, so if you want to be able to use it as effectively as before you are going to have to rehab the muscles in it. A despondent sigh made its way out of the raven-haired teen's lips as he seemed to sink into the mattress he was on top of. He really didn't like the sound of that because that meant he was going to be stuck inside of the village when he really liked to be out on missions or training if the first option wasn't available, but with his arm in shambles, he wouldn't even be able to do that. Naruto looked at Shizun with a look of fake optimism because he doubted this would work, but it was worth a shot. I doubt that means I can go out and start training again. No you cannot and as the person who has chosen to take the role of your physical therapist, I strictly forbid you from doing anything that will put too much stress on that arm until it has been properly treated. If you need to train then train your mind. Shizun said with a playful smirk that made Naruto grumble under his breath. Shizun was about to leave the room until she turned back to Naruto who was looking up at the ceiling. Oh and Naruto you have visitors. Who are they? Naruto asked without removing his eyes from the ceiling overhead, but his voice did carry a certain amount of intrigue. Makoto-san and here is Insama. Along with your family, they are all waiting outside in one of the waiting rooms to hear if they can come back here. Shizun saw Naruto's eyes take a hardened glint at the mention of his family. She knew that the relationship between them was extremely strained and she would listen to what Naruto would say since it was her job to make sure he wasn't stressed during his stay at the hospital. 
if I only see Makoto-chan and the old man, then Minato and Kashina would surely insist on coming here, and I don't want to have to make Shizun deal with that. I can just see Naomi and Narumi and talk to Makoto-chan and the old man later. Naruto thought to himself, sighing softly since he could feel the fatigue trying to come back. Can you send my sisters in and tell the others that I don't want too many people back at once? Naruto requested looking back at Shizun who looked a little confused but nodded anyway since he requested it. The medic knew that Naruto disliked his sisters or so she thought, but if he was asking for them then maybe they had started to make amends. She smiled at the thought and at Naruto, since it seemed like he was maturing because it took a strong person to forgive another. Nodding Shizun left the room leaving Naruto and Susei who were resting near the windowsill, making Naruto chuckle. Hearing footsteps coming towards his room, Naruto instantly appeared more stoic just on the off chance that Minato tried to pull the Hokage card on Shizun, therefore disregarding his request. The door opened and stepped both of his sisters with small smiles, seeing their brother up and not sleeping like he had been for what felt like an eternity to them. Naomi took another step forward with her hands behind her back getting Naruto to arch an eyebrow. She quickly brought her hands in front of her and showed Naruto a rather large stuffed bear which he stared blankly at making Naomi nervous while Narumi tried to stifle her laughter seeing the odd scene. The more the moments went by the more that the young red-headed Kanoichi thought that her gift was going to be rejected. Naruto couldn't hold it any longer and his stoic appearance crumbled as he began to laugh, surprising both of his sisters who had never heard the sound. Narumi who was the smarter of the two knew why and soon joined in giggling into her hand. All the laughter around her made Naomi embarrassed which the heavy blush on her cheeks represented. She voiced her irritation trying her best to not start stammering as they continued to laugh. W what's so funny you two. Naruto who was breathing heavily due to his heavy laughter sat completely up hoping to get more air into his lungs before they started to burn from being deprived of oxygen. Moving his hands away from his ribs, Naruto looked over to the pouting Naomi with a slight grin on his face. What makes you think that someone like me would want something like that Naomi? Naruto was actually interested to hear the reasoning behind her thoughtful but childish gesture. You may be strong Nai-san, but you have to recover, and things like these are meant for people who are recovering, you big jerk. Naomi said in mock anger though on the inside she was glad to see this side of her brother, the same for Narumi who was watching with a smile. Acting stubbornly Naomi pushed the teddy bear into Naruto's chest, unknowingly pushing against his still hurting torso. Narumi moved forward and put her hand on Naruto's shoulder when he recoiled as the bear pushed up on his still tender scar. Narumi moved her hand back and forth on his shoulder soothingly, while Naomi looked fearful, thinking she really hurt her brother, something she never wanted to do. Are you okay Naruto-kun? Letting out a deep breath, Naruto slowly nodded his head looking at both Naomi and Narumi with an easing smile. He gently removed Narumi's hand and sat up straight, rolling his stiff neck, hoping to work out a few kinks. I am fine. It's not her fault that there was a massive hole in my chest. Naruto spoke dryly while also making note to thank the Kaiubi when it was up again for fixing his chest. He knew the great chakra monster could heal his arm, but if he did not then Naruto would not ask him to. Narumi's sky blue eyes widened at the admission of her brother and how nonchalantly he could say something as serious as that. Narumi stared sternly at her brother, making him wonder just what he had done wrong. What do you mean there was a massive hole in your chest? The way she was looking at him showed it was an order and not a question. Naruto stared back at the two not giving any emotion away, but he was surprised that the two were not aware of what happened to him yet. He was operating under the assumption that his sisters would have been in the loop of what had happened. The question he was thinking on was if he could trust them enough to share what he knew, he determined this would be their test. I will tell you what happened, but you have to promise me that whatever is said in this room will stay between us no matter who asks you, even if it is Minato or Kishina. Naruto's blue eyes changed back to his Sharingan, so he could detect any slight shift in any of their facial muscles that would be a sign of them planning on lying to him. What the Achiha did not know was this was just the opportunity that his sisters were waiting for to prove themselves in the eyes of their brother. Without a moment of hesitation they nodded sternly, both staring right back into Naruto's eyes unafraid which made Naruto smirk. I was called on by the Hokage to become a recovery team meant to back up a team created by Shikamaru with the goal of retrieving Sasuke Achiha, who had defected to join up with Orochimaru and Odo. I successfully recovered Choji and Niji before I teamed up with Shikamaru to defeat his opponent that Orochimaru had sent to ensure Sasuke's successful arrival. Naruto went on telling them the bare basics of what had happened on his mission, earning him two nods and then silence as they waited for the rest of the story. Naruto was pleasantly surprised that he was not to be interrupted. I managed to stop Sasuke at the border of the land of rice paddies and the land of fire, more commonly known as the Valley of the End. Even though I was running low on chakra, I managed to subdue Sasuke, even with the aid of the curse mark given to him by that snake. However, I had an error in judgment and paid for it by taking a Chidori through the chest. 
Naruto spoke derisively while ridiculing himself for letting his guard down even with Itachi in the area. He did notice Naomi's hair seemingly breaking into nine tendrils, while Narumi's cold blue eyes reminded him of looking into a mirror. Naomi, being the more reactionary of the audience, quickly exploded in anger, all of which being directed at her former comrade, who she had almost come to blows with on their last mission together. That bastard what the fuck does he think he is doing? Next time I see him I am going to put him down and painfully. That's a promise. Language, Naomi. Narumi chastised her sister even though she was still looking at Naruto equally angry and nodding in agreement with her sister's sentiment. Naruto smiled since he never imagined even a year ago that his sisters could be so protective of him. It was an odd feeling, but he knew that it felt nice. Though I don't understand how the traitor could do that to you since last time you two fought you defeated him easily. Naruto nodded slowly since it would be confusing to compare their last battle and then expect that Naruto would be the one in the hospital almost dead. Sighing Naruto ran his hand through his hair and knew he would reprimand himself for this for quite a while. It has to do with this error in judgment I spoke of earlier. You see, before I could secure Sasuke, someone made an appearance. Itachi Uchiha showed up and caught my weakened state in a jinjutsu that allowed Sasuke to plunge his hand through my chest cavity. Naruto spoke, his eyes spinning as they resonated with the anger coursing through him. Why would an S-rank missing nin show up to save Sasuke unless he had a plan that involved Sasuke? Narumi asked aloud looking out the window where Susei was still resting peacefully, which got an agreeable hum from her sister who had a similar thought. Naruto found no need to correct their assessment about the man he thought he knew. Here is the part that I need you to be completely silent about. I won't even be telling the council about this development. Do you understand? The intensity of Naruto's words brought both girls' attention back to them. Straightening up on instinct both Narumi and Naomi nodded their heads. Returning the nod Naruto closed his eyes and slowly opened them back up showing his sisters his Manjikam Sharingan. Both girls found themselves getting lost in the beauty of the deadly floral iris pattern Naruto's eyes now possessed. Naruto stared at them until they eventually broke free from the naturally hypnotic nature of his Sharingan. Sometime after Kishina was brought back to the hospital I woke up in the middle of the night and pieced everything together and the emotions I felt at the time awakened the second stage of the Sharingan, the Manjikam Sharingan. Naruto spoke calmly while Narumi and Naomi nodded slowly taking in this new information on the Achiha, since they had never seen such a thing while in the village. Wait, why aren't you going to tell anyone about your eyes? Naomi asked, not completely sure why he would want to hide something that made him so powerful. Or at least look powerful to her. She thought it would make more sense to appear strong at all times, and the eyes she was looking at definitely looked powerful. These eyes are like gold to people who would like nothing more than to further themselves, such as the council. And to be honest I have yet to discover what these eyes can do or even train them. I may have them but they are not combat ready. Naruto said letting his manjikam fade back to his natural azure colored eyes. We understand Naruto kun nai san. The pair of sisters said in perfect unison which had Naruto smiling. He decided that he would trust his gut and that same gut was telling him that he needed to trust his sisters on this occasion. If it blew up in his face then he would deal with it but something told him that it would not. This time. Naruto flashed them a brief smile before he looked back to the window, wondering if any more needed to be said right now, but in the end he decided that nothing more was needed at least not at the moment. If you two could go out there and tell everyone that I am going back to bed I'd appreciate it. I really don't feel like dealing with anyone else right now. You got a nice an, but before that I think I'll take that hug you have been holding out on me. Naomi said grinning since she knew that in his weakened state there was no way Naruto would be able to resist. Yet it was still not to be because Narumi quickly stood between the two putting her palm against her sister's forehead, keeping her at arm's length. Oh no you don't Naomi-chan. You already managed to agitate his injury once and I won't let you do it again. Naomi tried to give Narumi her puppy dog eyes, but it did nothing to sway her sister, so in the end she stomped off grumbling about unfair siblings. Narumi gave herself mental congratulations before she turned around and gave Naruto's hand a soft squeeze and a smile before she too exited the room. Somewhere in the depths of Odo, repeat what you just said. Orochimaru hissed out in fury from his seated position on a chair that looked very much like a stone throne. His yellow eyes glared down at his faithful servant, who would not even dare to meet gazes with the legendary Snake Sanon. The furious Snake Summoner was just informed as to the results of his mission to recover what was to be his next vessel, and better yet it had the Sharingan. If he was able to use his arms which meant access to his hands, he would surely be gripping the arms of his chair in effort to cope with his anger. I apologize to Orochimaru-sama, but by the time I arrived on the scene the area was void of any presence. The only things left were signs of a struggle and a rather large amount of blood, which I couldn't place on a person, since my knowledge is not in that field. Kamimuro said meekly as he tried to say anything that would not anger his master further. He wouldn't even think about removing his eyes from the floor at his feet. 
He was angry with himself over the failure since his master needed him and he failed, but he knew he could make things right before his body gave out on him. That's what I thought you said Kimimuro-kun. Orochimaru said in a pseudo-calm voice that even made Kabuto who was standing at his right side feel a sense of dread, and he wasn't even the one who was on the end of the legendary shinobi. Kabuto tried to remain passive as his eyes flicked from the last Kagaya to his master, all the while trying to figure out what they could do to try and retrieve the Ichiha from wherever he was. The S-rank shinobi opened his mouth and dislocated his jaw, allowing his elongated tongue to slowly slither out of his open mouth. The long appendage was wrapped around the handle of a beautiful blade that was said to be able to cut anything, the kusanagi. Before anyone in the room could even blink, the sword was being driven through the heart of Kamimuro, who never saw it coming due to his eyes being plastered to the ground. Kabuto watched on without any sign of surprise since Kamimuro failed, thus he became expendable. The only sound in the room was that of Kagaya's blood dripping on the floor in a constant melody. Grip, grip, flicking his teeth around his tongue Orochimaru pulled his sword out of the corpse, and with a quick flourish, the snake-like man splattered the blood on the steel onto the ground where it would be cleaned up later. A disappointed frown made its way to the face of the normally smiling Sanin, even if it was a sinister smile. The Sanin lowered his blade to rest it against the side of this throne, since now his plans had to be changed around. Kabuto-kun I want you to go and retrieve Gurin so that we may move on with the changeover. The cells from young Yukimaru-kun have completely ruined my arms, it seems like we haven't enough knowledge of how his power works. Pick up a few more cadavers so that we may continue to test with his cells. The Budo pushed up his glasses, getting them to gleam ominously for a moment before a creepy smile crossed the bespectacled medic's face. He never liked that Gurin woman, and now she would finally serve a purpose, instead of simply annoying him. It will be done by a master. Kabuto assured the man on the throne before looking back down at Kabuto's body. Shall I store away Kimimuro kuns body for later examination? Looking down at the body of his former subordinate, Arachimaru nodded, since even dead bodies could provide invaluable resources that other people would find inscrutable while he saw opportunity. Kabuto bowed one last time before he took the corpse and vanished in a shunshin taking Kimimuro with him, leaving Arachimaru alone with his thoughts. If I can make proper use of young Yukimaru kuns gift to interact with the Sambi, I can easily make myself a Jinchuriki. Kukuku, then I will be able to not only destroy Kanoha with my amassed power, but then I can turn my wake of destruction on my former colleagues in the Akatsuki and their leader. With the Sanbi and Ito Tensei at my beck and call I will be invincible. Orochimaru's disturbing laughter echoed off the barren stone walls of his underground hideout and research bunker. It is a shame that I won't be able to use that old fool Danzo to further my own plans like I would have normally. There is no way that old tool would willingly hand me something as powerful as a tailed beast. That's okay though because whatever that warhawk gets involved in usually fails and miserably. Once again Orochimaru started to laugh as he imagined the shocked expression on not only Danzo's face, but all of Konoha's when he crashed into Konoha with the power of his zombies and the strength of a biju behind him. Then just like he had imagined back when Minato was chosen as Hokage over him, Konoha would be nothing more than a large pile of ash, waiting to be scattered in the winds of war. Patience always pays off, but not quite as nicely as being prepared does. For all of this to work I need to complete the seal that will allow me to incorporate the power of the three-tailed turtle. Hirachimaru told himself as he got up from his throne and made his way towards his private study where the seal was awaiting his attention. Let it be known that Jureya was not the only Sanin who could excel in the field of Fuinjutsu. Hirachimaru while favoring ninjutsu would be a fool to overlook the sheer amount of possibilities that Fuinjutsu could provide. He was a man known for many things that were mostly terrible, and a few good deeds were long since buried under the uproar created by his human experimentation. He was a man known as a Sanin. He belonged to a group of shinobi who were all S-ranked and were now feared as the Akatsuki. There was one title that he had not obtained yet, and that would be the one that he cherished the most when it finally became a reality. He would be forever known as the Bane of Kanahagakur. Kanoha, Council Chambers. Now that all of the civilian matters have been discussed and moved on, I believe that it is time to address the mission to recover one Sasuke Ichiha, something we had put off until the Uzumaki clan head was out of the hospital so we could hear his first-hand report. Hamura began, looking towards the seated Naruto from behind his glasses. His statement earned him a nod from his fellow advisor, while everyone else waited patiently for Naruto to begin. The raven-haired Uzumaki sat back in his chair with his eyes closed as the rest of the room waited on in a growing suspense. Internally Naruto sighed since he really found passive open-ended statements to be a waste of time, but in this instance, Naruto would oblige them so he could be out of their presences even faster. I was called into the office of the Hokage where I was informed that I would be backing up a team already sent to recover Sasuke Ichiha. I had two goals to complete. The first was to recover any injured comrades which I did. Both Hiyashi and Choza nodded their heads, happy to have their clanmates back safe and sound. 
after a few battles with Orochimaru sound guard which were nothing more than cleanup I cornered Sasuke in the valley of the end. He wanted to test the power he received from Orochimaru and willingly engaged me in battle. I was able to defeat Sasuke in that battle. Naruto said staring straight ahead but not at anything specifically as he remembered the conclusion of his encounter. A few of the counselors looked at each other confused as to how Naruto could claim that he was victorious when he ended up hospitalized and how they assumed Sasuke was currently in the clutches of the snake Sanin, Makoto was particularly torn at the moment, wondering just what she should feel. Ashina interjected here wanting one of her own curiosities, stated something her son could hopefully provide. Can you explain that foul chakra that was in the area when I came into the valley? Naruto's blue eyes panned over towards the female Yuzumaki, his facial expression showing no signs of worry that she may have found out that he had access to the chakra of the Kaiubi. Yes, there was an evil chakra in the air. It came from Sasuke who, using his anger, was granted access to what appeared to be the second stage of the curse mark. That is what I believe to be the source of that foul chakra. Ashina looked into her son's calm countenance and nodded slowly, although internally she still had her doubts. What Naruto said may have been true, but as the Jinchuriki of the Kaiubi for so many years, she knew what the fox's chakra felt like. She knew it wasn't from Naomi or Narumi because they were with Minato at the time, so that only left Naruto, but he couldn't have access to that part of the Kaiubi. Both she and Minato were sure that they left Naruto with the soul of the beast. Yuzumaki-san, you said that you defeated Sasuke. May I ask how it is that things ended like they did if you had actually beaten Sasuke? Shibi asked stoically from his position at the council table. With his body mostly covered up, it was hard to tell what the Aburam clan head was feeling, but it could be assumed that it was disbelief. The state I was left in when Kishino arrived on the scene was the result of an unforeseeable factor. Causing me to be struck by a Chidori, one that apparently just missed my heart. Naruto said aloud looking up at the ceiling where he knew there were any number of Anbu were probably stationed, since this was where every high priority target in Konoha was currently located. Though Naruto did not state it explicitly, all of the shinobi in the room were seasoned veterans and knew what his words meant. What Naruto really said was that there was a third party involved and it was someone that he personally didn't expect to be there, which meant Orochimaru and Odo were out of the discussion. Who or what was this person that created just havoc on your operation? Naruto looked over to Danzo who was squinting at the young clan head currently fuming over the loss of yet another pair of Sharingan. Naruto blinked once and then uttered two words that had everyone in the room tense. Itachi Ichiha. The atmosphere in the room became very tense as every person in the room tried to formulate some kind of logical conclusion. The most desperate to do so was Makoto who couldn't believe that Itachi would allow Sasuke to seriously harm Naruto, but one look at the team and she knew that Naruto believed otherwise. That alone left her conflicted on what she should believe and more importantly feel. Ignoring the heavy atmosphere Naruto continued on as the others tried to form their own uninformed opinions. His blue eyes changed to his Sharingan as just thinking about what happened innately triggered such a response. I was running low on chakra thus unable to maintain my Sharingan and as such Itachi was easily able to trap me in a Jinjutsu. While I was immobilized Sasuke struck me with a Chidori. I blacked out quickly after that and woke up here in Konoha in the hospital, so I too am unaware as to Sasuke's location. Naruto's honest account of what he knew had Hamura and Kaharu sighing, since they had hoped that the Yuzumaki could shed some light on what had happened. It was true that he had answered some questions, but they could still use some more information. That's when the council members in the room all looked to the wall behind the Hokage, where Jiraiya stepped out with his arms crossed and a frown on his face. From what I gathered from my contacts Sirachimaru hasn't shown any recent activity in the bases that we know are somewhere in the land of rice paddies. That could be a good thing or a bad thing. A good thing because it means my teammate probably doesn't have the Ichiha brat and a bad thing because that means someone else does and we don't know who for sure. Jiraiya's conclusions brought deeper frowns on the faces of a few of the counselors because no matter how one viewed the subject, Kanoha lost a valuable asset. Asuma who had been listening silently until this point sighed, finding this whole thing to be one, large mess. He could totally see why his father had passed this duty down to him because it was extremely taxing. If only his brother was still alive to be pawned off with this, but at least the traitor who had murdered him was now gone from this earth. Well what do we do about Sasuke then? Minato closed his eyes for a moment as he thought about what were the options they had and then what was the correct path to take. Furrowing his brow the yellow flash finally came to his choice, the choice Kanoha would follow. We cannot put Sasuke in the bingo book. He is still too young, and doing such will make us appear incompetent, so until we reassess the situation we will look for Sasuke Chihan's secret. But that Minato dismissed the council for this session, and Naruto quickly exited the room, not wanting to be stuck around for any political maneuvering that may occur afterwards, but much to Naruto's irritation, he could not use the shunshin, so he was relegated to walking back to his apartment just like a civilian. 
opening the door and walking into his home Naruto was greeted by the sight of Fu doing some stretches, which gave him quite the view of her rear. He coughed hoping to get her attention. Fu blinked and immediately turned around staring in at Naruto in embarrassment being caught in such a compromising position. The only thing that made her feel slightly better was the fact that Naruto was also blushing at what had just inadvertently happened. Fu quickly recovered and walked over to Naruto being careful not to touch him, just in case he still had an injury she wasn't aware of. Smiling at the sight of her first friend in Konoha and maybe the entire world, Fu rocked back on her heels. How are you feeling about Naruto-kun? I was going to come and visit you, but I wasn't sure how the villagers would react to me if they figured out what I held, so I decided to just wait. Fu admitted with a sad shrug that visibly brightened when she made it clear that she really would rather talk about her question than the statement. Naruto would have loved to tell his fellow Jinchuriki that she could just scare the life right out of the civilians if they said anything, but he held his tongue, seeing she'd rather talk about something else. Naruto motioned for the two to take a seat which Fu nodded to and sat down next to her friend so they could talk. I feel just wonderful considering that I will basically be on lockdown here in the village until my arm gets better. Her orange eyes blinked as they looked at Naruto's arm much more intently before she poked his bicep a few times, with her cock to the side clearly confused. Naruto looked at her confusion with no small amount of amusement. Something is wrong with your arm? Are you sure because it looks fine to me? Apparently the nerves and the muscles in the arm need to be reworked so they can perform at 100%, so I am going to be going through physical therapy here in the village. Naruto said, sighing despondently as he thought about all the time he would have to spend around the citizens and their mutual dislike for each other. Fu laughed at the expression that Naruto was giving her, while adding in a patronizing pat on the shoulder that only made Naruto feel worse about the whole thing, only fueling her amusement. Good that means you can spend more time hanging out with me. I can finally get a full tour of the famous Kanahagakur. I mean Hinata only shows me some places before she gets called off to either do missions or clan duties. Oh don't you worry Fu-chan sooner rather than later your probation period will be up and you'll be doing so many missions that your head will spin. Naruto fired back with a vulpine grin, making Fu sigh sadly, since she kind of liked the free lifestyle she was currently enjoying. Naruto was glad to hear that Fu was getting out and about instead of dwelling in his apartment like a cave bear. Fu's disgruntled expression quickly changed to a mischievous one as she giggled internally at how perfectly Naruto had chosen his words. Putting on the most innocent expression that she could muster to hide her devilish intentions, Fu looked at Naruto innocently, making him gulp internally. Since I am not working that means you will pay for my meals right Naruto-kun. I mean you are quite the gentleman after all. To top everything off she gave the shock to Chiha a smile full of admiration that made it impossible for Naruto to deny her. Fine. The Uzumaki clan head mumbled looking extremely downcast, a look that could only be compared to one who had just lost their puppy. It was quite the sight to anyone who had seen Naruto before in the public setting because they would never have thought these two could be the same person. The mint-haired former Taki Nin completely ignored Naruto's sudden depression and rushed for the door with a bright smile on her tanned face. Yay, Ichiraku time. Fu did not notice Naruto's expression get even worse when she said that because he knew he'd get an earful from A.M. who he hadn't seen in a while. He just knew this was going to be one painful experience both for his wallet and for his head when A.M. smacked him with a frying pan. Anoha, Ichiha compound. Naruto sat there by himself in the library of the Ichiha compound, surrounded by a series of books, all of which had to do with information on the Manjikum Sharingan. He was surprised that when he showed up that Makoto was not present, but he guessed that she too had responsibilities she had to take care of so Naruto let himself in knowing she wouldn't mind him doing so. He was surprised to see so much information on the evolved cursed eye, but maybe they were more common back then. Different times bred different situations or so Naruto would think. The part of Naruto was glad that his surrogate mother was currently absent because he wasn't quite sure what to feel about her, considering what had just happened between him and Itachi. It was that lack of certainty that would have had the young Ichiha hide his new eyes from Makoto, just on the off chance she would stab him in the back like both her sons, one literally and the other metaphorically. Shaking his head, Naruto activated his Manjikum Sharingan and picked up the book on the top of the stack. He figured there wouldn't be any better place to start his search. The basics of the Manjikum Sharingan Naruto smiled reading the title of the book, seeing this was just what he needed since Itachi never told him anything about his own Manjikum, but what Naruto found to be the most interesting was that the book was penned by Madara Cha. Figuring he wouldn't find any more reliable information on the eye anywhere else Naruto began to read, skimming through and eventually finding what it was he was looking for he began to read. I have recently awoken what myself and my kinsmen have named the Manjikum Sharingan, which to have deciphered is the second stage of the Sharingan's development. After a few days I have come to realize that these eyes came to be because I underwent a period of extreme emotional distress. While I have yet to discover what these eyes can do I do know that I have never felt more powerful than I do now. 
With this strength I will surely be able to defeat Hashirama when we next come to blows. Naruto left the book open up to that page before he slid the book over to his left so that he could search for a book he had seen earlier while he was collecting everything. Tabbing his thumb against the spines of the book, Naruto stopped with a smile when he found the piece of literature that he was searching for. The book was titled A Catalogue of Known Magicum Sharingan Abilities. Opening up the book Naruto proceeded to look over all of the abilities the Magicum was able to perform, but he did note that it said only certain eyes could do certain things, which meant he may have one or more of these abilities, or he could have none of them. Amaterasu. The jet black flames of the Amaterasu, said to be the fires from hell and as hot as the sun, ignite at the focus of the user's vision. These flames are unavoidable and will continue to burn for as long as the object they are attached to continues to exist. It is currently unknown if the flames can be manipulated. However the stress of this technique will cause the user's eye to bleed. Users. Itachi Ichiha, Kodamatsu Kami. The ability to cast a subtle but very powerful mind controlling Jinjutsu on a target. The technique allows the user to enter their opponent's mind and manipulate them by giving them false experiences, making it seem as if they were doing things of their own free will, making them completely unaware they were being controlled. It does require a time period before it is capable of being used again. Users. Shisuiche, Susanu. A humanoid being that surrounds the user and fights on their behalf. As one of the strongest techniques granted to those that have acquired the Magicum Sharingan, it acts as the user's guardian deity. Users. Madara Echeha, Izuna Echeha, Itachi Echeha, Shisui Echeha, Tsukiyomi. A very powerful Jinjutsu that could be considered the strongest to exist where the user brings out the spiritual world of darkness. To be performed Tsukiyomi requires eye contact which allows the user to completely control anything in the world, including time. The target of the Jinjutsu is exposed to severe amounts of mental trauma that could lead to a coma if the time in the world is extensive. Users. Itachi Echeha. Note. Well, not Magicum abilities it is suggested to look up the Aizanami and the Aizanagi. Naruto smiled at all the information that he had and there was only more to be read, but before Naruto completely immersed himself the raven-haired son of the Hokage had to make sure there was no sign that he was here in the first place. Sealing up a few of the books that he wanted to hold on to for the time Naruto quickly put back everything else before hurriedly leaving the compound, wondering just what these eyes of his could do, reading about all the other eyes only made that need to know much stronger. Naruto knew that he needed to play his cards right so that he could take the next opportunity presented to him so that he could train his new eyes under the guise of secrecy. To do so he needed to escape from the eyes and confines of the village. He had the eyes created from a time of chaos and he would not be blind. No, he would make sure that he saw everything and not in the traditional black and white that the current shinobi system was comfortable with. No, he would change his future and his Magicum Sharingan would help him do it. Chapter 18 what lies ahead. Okay Naruto, why not try and throw a punch to see how far your strength has come since we started the strength exercises a few weeks ago. Shizun said with it was something that Naruto noticed and had him respecting the medic nin more than he had before he became her patient. He had already respected her ability, but now he respected her character and work ethic in making sure he was ready no matter what his name was. Hell, he was a clan head and she still told him no when he was being particularly stubborn. Taking a deep breath Naruto nodded and lowered himself into the Ichiha-based interceptor fist style of Tujutsu. Eyes alive with his standard Sharingan Naruto launched himself at Shizun, using his average speed of movement with his arm ready to deliver a blow. Shizun who had instructed him to move at a moderate speed was easily able to take the blow with her palm, but there was a solid thud and Shizun slid back a few yards and was forced to shake her arms at the tingling feeling that was coursing through her arms. The result of the attack caused the first apprentice of Tsunade the Sanin to smile. It seems like you are getting some of your natural strength back, but in saying that we still have to get you back into combat shape now. You won't be of any use to anyone if you get tired after three minutes in battle, so get ready Naruto here I come. With a small smirk Shizun fired a hail of from a launcher hidden in her loose hanging sleeves. The raven-haired Yuzumaki Sharingan red eyes widened slightly and his Keke Genkai allowed him to track the path of the thin ninja tools. Having just come out of the stance he needed to adopt so he could dodge he batted and a fist just to the left of his head. Eyes of Kanoichi and Shinobi locking Naruto gave his physical trainer a small smirk. Your skills as a Jounin have been well earned in Shizun that much I can see. Sharingan Jinjutsu. Najire. Copy we lie illusion. Distortion. Naruto muttered making effective use of his blessed eyes to put Shizun under a subtle Jinjutsu that would affect depth perception and put a sluggish aura around her. Shizun however was extremely perceptive, a skill honed through medical training and quickly bit the inside of her lip and dispelled the through pain, which was a surefire way to escape most illusionary arts. When Shizun planted her foot on Naruto's chest and kicked him away to provide some space between them, Naruto frowned at his failure. 
he wasn't sure if it was Rust or Shizun was that good, and for the sake of his ego, the Achiha decided on it being the latter. Physical activity is all good and well but. Let us see if I can keep up with the Jutsu, something that all Yuzumaki have the gift of using at will. The raven-haired clan head said in his thoughts while going through the seals for a once the young Chunin finished with the last seal, Naruto lifted his fingers to his lips and fired the chakra building in his lungs. Katen. Kakaki no Jutsu. High release. Grand fireball technique. A blazing ball of flame spread from his lips and grew in size just before engulfing the space that Shizun was occupying. Naruto did not bother to allow himself the time to fret over his rehabilitation teacher, since he saw the quick substitution she used to escape being baked alive, and from the very back peripheral of his vision, he could see a flare of chakra, and acting on instinct to survive he ducked, just as Shizun's hand came cutting through the space he just vacated. His eyes narrowed slightly when he saw one of the few techniques that the most skilled of medics learned to defend themselves. He was slightly alarmed when he saw a few locks of his hair were shaved away, showing him that her close was much closer to hitting than he first thought. Those attacks can cut things. That is not good because it works perfectly with her extensive knowledge of human anatomy. One blow could spell the end of me. Though I doubt she even has those thoughts, mistakes can still happen. Naruto grimaced a bit when his sudden drop down put some jarring pressure on his still recovering arm. Although it wasn't much it was still enough that it provided him with some mental discomfort. Naruto was forced to backpedal as Shizun continued to aim for debilitating blows that she could eventually heal, but despite knowing that the raven-haired shinobi had no desire to take a blow. Naruto continued to back up dodging the strikes thrown at him, but what annoyed him to no end was that he could not parry the blows because of how much of her hands and partially her wrists were being covered by the chakra scalpels. Hatching the glimpse of a tree approaching from behind him, the Yuzumaki clan head rolled to the left at the last moment, causing Shizun's hand to catch the tree and for her to curse internally. Almost had him. But it is good that he is able to move so nimbly. Shizun kept to her thoughts, showing she hadn't completely fallen into the swing of the battle. Those hands of yours can give life and take life. I wonder why people call the Hyuga dangerous, if any capable medic like yourself can do such damage. How scary. Naruto said to himself but loud enough so that Shizun could hear his complimentary words. Shizun for her part let a light blush spread over her cheeks, since she was rarely complimented on her skills which may seem ridiculous, since she was the apprentice of the slug queen Sanadi Senju. Hiding back her blush Shizun then dropped back into a readied stance unperturbed by Naruto's ever-watchful Sharingan eye. Her confidence was almost palpable, a confidence built through skills and having the utmost faith in those same tools. Those are very kind words to Naruto, but flattery won't get you anywhere. Now then, get your guard ready because here I come. Ichiraku Raymond, Kanoha. There were two compass sounds of people eating food and a slightly more frantic unrefined source of slurping coming from between the two more civilized people. Behind the counter were the smiling faces of the father-daughter combination of Ichirikus, the fine Raymond providers of Kanahagakur no Sado. I know how much you love our Raymond, and I do appreciate it Naomi-chan, but maybe you should take a moment and take a deep breath so you don't suffocate on Raymond. The daughter of the duo, Aim said with a good-natured smile and a slight teasing jab, aimed at the energetic daughter of the Hokage. Aim is right Naomi-chan you or else you will choke yourself out on the noodles. A message saying how the daughter of the Hokage passed out eating at Chiraku won't do them any good. They might even have to close down if something like that was to happen. The blonde-haired Kinoichi said though it sounded more like an idle thought that she just so happened to think about at the moment than a threat. There was also a small smirk that she wore when the blonde heard the struggled, muffled protests from her redeated sister, which she chuckled at enjoying how predictable her sister could be. Moving herself back up into a standard sitting position instead of the slightly hunched one she was using to eat a ramen, Naomi slammed her fist against her chest in an effort to help the noodles go down. Naomi took in a deep breath before turning and leveling her sister with glare of betrayal for the word she had chosen. One would think that her sister had just physically struck her from the look that she was giving off. One each and you should never say anything like that ever. Not even if you are joking. Ka-san would never let it happen anyway so ha. Naruto who was sitting to the left of Naomi ignored the small bickering competition that was going on between his sisters, but there was a small smile pulling at the corners of his lips. If someone would have told him a few months ago that he would be doing this very thing he would have laughed in their face and he was plenty sure it would be a dry, mocking one too. I guess here is Injiji was right when he said that I was growing up. The younger me would never be doing something like this with them. It feels. Nice to be honest. His thoughts revolved around him being able to let go the hatred that was constantly lingering over him like a dark cloud that would shadow his life. Yet there was something that he missed despite being so mature for his age, there was something even Naruto could see. He couldn't see that his hatred, his darkness, was simply moved to another target or targets. Naruto was so far in his own thoughts that he had failed to notice that the damp ends of his chopsticks hit the end of his bowl. 
He was only free from his mind when he heard the empty dink of the sticks hitting the porcelain bowl. Naruto looked up for a moment and saw that Tuchi was smiling at him, seemingly having already noticed. Would you like a second bowl of Naruto? Naruto looked up to the elder kind man for a moment before his azure eyes shifted towards his sisters, who seemed to be on the final stretch of their argument that they were holding. His eyes shifted back to the Raymond provided, and he gave a gentle nod that Tucci seemed to be expecting, since he was quick on taking the bowl and moving back towards the kitchen area of the small Raymond stand. Naruto wasn't the only one who seemed to notice the elder chef's departure, because when he glanced to the left, he could see Naomi, giving him a cheeky grin that almost made him want to groan. The second bowl Nai-san, you almost never have seconds. I knew you were starting like us and don't even try to deny it. Naomi cheered with a victorious grin that made Narumi giggle from behind her, since she could see the slightly annoyed expression that was forming on her wayward brother's face. Before Naomi could gloat further on the change in Naruto's heart, she was forced to yelp and nurse the slight red spot on her forehead, before sending a pouting look to a smirking Naruto whose hand was holding his chopsticks and slowly being lowered back to a resting position. Satisfied that he had put down the slight ego boost that Naomi was getting, Naruto turned his eyes back to Narumi, who was laughing at her sister's misfortune, getting her to stop laughing in case Naruto turned his strange form of behavior correction on her. Giving her an approving nod, Naruto then looked back to Tucci, who had just placed his bowl down before leaving before Naruto could thank him for getting the raven-haired male to quirked an eyebrow. He looked back to his sisters while waiting for his Raymon to cool. I am only having a second bowl because Shizun is a slave driver when it comes to her duties in the hospital, nothing more or less. Something in Narumi's sky blue eyes seemed to click with a wave of realization when she glanced back to her brother, which Naruto noticed and waited for her to tell him whatever it was she had floating in the forefront of her mind. Naruto-kun I am supposed to let you know that Hokage-sama wants you to come to his office in two days for some kind of meeting that we are to attend. Narumi spoke calmly while also using the title of Hokage so that she could maintain a level of professionalism and increase the chances that Naruto would attend the meeting. Both she and Naomi watched in building anticipation as Naruto seemed to be ignoring them in favor of his bowl of food. After one last spooled up mouthful of noodles Naruto patted at his lips with a napkin before humming and looking ahead, but at nothing really in particular. A few silent moments later Naruto shifted his eyes and looked at his sisters, only now his eyes were alive with the Kekei Genkai of the Achiha, the Sharingan. Naruto simply stared at the two wondering if they had given away his secrets to Minato, Kishina or any number of people that would love to know about it. Is that so? It seems that the Hokage requires his children to come to him, but should I give him a refusal as a clan head or no? Naomi and Narumi frowned slightly, but before either could offer some form of retort to try and convince Naruto he had vanished in a swirl of black crow feathers, leaving a half-finished bowl of ramen as the only sign that he was there in the first place. The sisters let go of tired sighs in stereo when they realized Naruto was not going to be able to treat their father like he was willing to treat them. Naomi pushed away her empty fourth bowl, no longer finding her body capable of wanting to eat more, appetite gone. Mumbling incoherently for a few moments the redeed eventually turned her head staring inquisitively at her sister with sad violet arises. Do you think that we will be able to convince Nai-san to come on the training trip with us? Naomi asked quietly while glancing back to the seat that Naruto was just using, right beside her, a feeling that was now worlds apart from what she was feeling now. I don't know Naomi-chan, but if there is one thing that I know it is that Naruto-kun is very independent and won't be forced to do something that isn't part of his own plan. His will is as strong as any person I know. Only time will tell. Narumi said with the same kind of frown as she offered her own insight on the enigma that was their brother. She was just as disappointed as her sister, but she would wait until the meeting before she made a comment, since her brother was anything but predictable. Two days later, Kanoha, Naruto stood there with his Sharingan burning and the three Tomo in his eyes, rotating with a frightening intensity, considering he was only shifting his gaze from the tree a few feet away, and his blade twilight that he was holding secure with his left hand, before swapping it over to his right. It was a skill that Mihik hammered into his muscle memory, saying that a swordsman with tendencies was a dead man, which always had Naruto snort out a laugh at how his sensei always wielded his black blade in one way. But when you are as skilled and as dangerous as Mihik sensei is, I suppose you do what makes you the best. It was the thoughts of his sensei that brought a rather prominent frown to the raven-haired Yuzumaki's lips. Thanks to his rehab sessions and time off he couldn't get in any form of swordplay, and now Twilight felt like a foreign presence, rather than an extension of himself. Such a thing was unacceptable for any kind of swordsman down from the most average of blade wielders to the legends. Fingers clenching with more force around the hilt of his tri-colored katana Naruto closed his eyes and crouched low to the ground. Shoulders rising as he took in one last inhale. Then he vanished. 
it was only a moment later before the tree that was in the center of Naruto's vision was marked by three clean passing slashes, and another moment after that, before the once tall tree fell to the ground in the varying portions that caused quite a loud impact and nearby forest animals to flee in an effort to preserve themselves. It was another second before Naruto would reappear seemingly from the air himself, in what was a perfect body flicker, not quite as fast as Shisui, but the tips he left for him all those years ago, sure showed when there was no signs Naruto used a shunshin. The Uzumaki clan head clicked his teeth in annoyance when he caught sight that it took a trifecta of cuts to dismantle the tree, when his previous record was two aiming for a single cut. Sighing, the shinobi calmed himself and turned around just in time to find another presence standing in the impromptu clearing regarding him from behind the porcelain mask over their face. The purple hair however was more than enough to demolish the anonymity of what the mask was supposed to provide. It was Nico, of course. An attempt to tug at some form of heartstrings for the woman who would help him out back in his helpless days. Nico. Naruto spoke in a calm voice that was void of any form of emotion, apart from a sense of civility. It was something he forced himself to learn right before announcing that he was to be the Uzumaki clan head. The stern tone would make any plans he might or might not have all the more difficult to implement if he was to alienate himself amongst his peers, and too soft of a tone would let people think he could be walked over. The Anbu with a mask and the codename Nico gave a slight dip of her head that caused her long purple hair to move with the flow of her motions. It was standard Anbu protocol to respect those of the council which Naruto certainly was. Perhaps if she was off duty she'd use his name, but that was neither here nor there. Uzumaki-sama the Hokage has requested that you report to his office immediately. Thank you for informing me Nico. Naruto replied calmly, but despite what he said it was clear that the Chunin was not at all considering what was spoken and instead was looking to continue on deeper into the forest where he could continue training. Hopefully undisturbed. However before he could move any further Nico once again appeared in front of him, ending any forward progress. I am afraid that Hokage-sama made sure that I expressed to you that this meeting is urgent and that if you are not willing to comply, I will have to use force. Naruto of course sighed softly when she said that. He was not foolish enough to believe that he would pose much of a challenge to Anbu level Kanoichi in his current state. Silently he took his eyes from the woman before him and guided them north to the sky, where the red eyes faded back to their natural blue shade. Upon his reluctant nod both ninja vanished within the respective shunshins. A minute or so later both shinobi appeared in the center of the Hokage's office, with only Naruto remaining in place, while Niko went and took back to her post hidden in the shadows and ready to protect her cage. Not at all concerned but definitely intrigued, Naruto glanced over his shoulder to see his sisters and mother standing, and in front of him was his father and his teacher. I wonder where this will go. Clearing his throat the Yandame Hokage was the first to speak when his blue eyes leveled on his son, who remained still with a look of clear detachment. Naruto there is something very serious we thought that we should include you in now that you have proven yourself to the village. Then there is how this affects the state of this political climate, the fragile peace. The truth be told, it was that he never trusted Naruto with the information on the Akatsuki, something they were unaware that Naruto already knew about. Everyone in the room looked at Naruto wondering how he would react, but when they were greeted by nothing but a stony-faced stoicism, they were not at all surprised. Growing even more anxious by the silence and the importance of the news that had yet to be delivered, the famed Toad Sage continued on for his most prodigal student, with all intent on drilling the gravity of the situation into the wayward son's stubborn head. Naruto you don't know this, but somewhere out there a group of s rank criminals are amassing assets and connections in preparation to gather the nine-tailed beasts. They call themselves the Akatsuki. Right now we know of three members. Adara an explosive release user formerly of Awagakur, Kisum Hashigaki, a man infamously known as the Monster of the Hidden Mist, wanted for the murder of his predecessor to take the Blade Samahata. And finally we have Karento also from the Hidden Mist and was known to be called the Eight Swordsmen of the Hidden Mist before leaving the village upon Mei Turumi's appointment and leaving a trail of dead Anbu on the way out. Naturally growing anxious from hearing of the threat that two of her daughters were facing Kashina couldn't help but burst into the conversation. Her hopes for this meeting was to make her son even stronger than he was now so that both she and Minato could rest at night, better knowing that there was yet another powerful shinobi there to protect Narumi or Naomi from the threat of Red Dawn. That's why we want you to come with me, Naomi-chan, Narumi-chan and the perv to Yuzu, where we'll teach you more about your Yuzumaki blood. Ignoring how the aforementioned pervert stumbled behind the Hokage before managing to regain himself just before unceremoniously hitting the ground, Naruto breathed out a simple, one-word answer. No. What do you mean no? This is no time for you to hold on to that stubborn grudge of yours kid. These shinobi are no joke, and if you continue to refuse our aid not only will your sisters lose the Kaiubi, but the entire world will be in danger so open your eyes. 
Now the first time that the black-haired teen refused to be trained by him, Jirei was peeved, but now he was more than agitated that Naruto would still not let go of his hate when things like the world were at stake. He didn't have time to appease an upset child. My answer is what it means, but if you must know why a certain crow in the Ichiha clan decided to pay me a visit during my mission with the Fuma Weasels. I learned of the Akatsuki and the basics of their delusional plan to try and control the Biju. Naruto said calmly like he was not dropping hints about his former teacher and brother figure meeting with him. Not that they knew that Itachi taught him or actually met him during his fight with Sasuke, but Naruto just chalked that up to them not needing to know. Watching the signs of realization forming on the faces of the two legendary shinobi in front of him, Naruto continued on with his small, informative speaking session in hope that these bits and pieces of information would keep them from bothering him too much. Because of this I have already taken steps to do the training that I need to undertake to prepare myself. From behind his desk the blonde Hokage could feel something growing in his gut. Not wanting to call it dread because the word didn't fit he just narrowed his eyes slightly on Naruto whose lips started to twitch. Naruto, what are you planning? Minato all but demanded to know what was running through his son's mind. Worthless smile firmly painted onto his lips Naruto rolled his neck, causing his eyes to close momentarily before they slid back open, revealing his standard Sharingan eyes, the smile still in play. I am training these eyes and the secrets of them that even I am unaware of but to do that I needed to find somewhere special. Naruto would pause there and shift his eyes to gaze out the window in front of him, past the two shinobi in front of him. Actually the real Naruto should be there now. No need for me to hang around anymore. And without so much as another word the teen standing there went up in smoke, signaling a shadow clone. The room stared at the spot that Naruto. Or his shadow clone was standing just a second ago with varying degrees of disbelief on their faces, not quite believing that they couldn't tell that they were talking to a shadow clone, even though it was next to impossible to distinguish the difference between the original and the clone. A few moments of silence later Kashina took her two daughters and moved to prepare for a trip to their ancestral homeland, while Minato turned to look at his sensei with a serious expression and play on his sharp features. Knowing his student like the back of his own, dirty hand, the white-haired pervert showed a moment of rare seriousness and gave a slight nod before crossing his arms over his broad chest, a frown lightly in place. I'll have my spy network try and dig up signs of where he may have gone, but I doubt it will help if he had time to think of a plan. He wouldn't not count for my spy network if he didn't want to be found. Jiraiya made sure to warn his pupil before his hopes got too high. Rotating in his chair just as his teacher made use of his favorite exit. Minato knew that he was right, but still couldn't help but hope that somewhere in Naruto's soul, heart, or consciousness that he would accept and join up with the rest of his family. Before he could delve any further into the subject the door to his office opened, and the Hokage was forced to school his features as he came face to face with the darkness of Shinobi, Danzo Shimura. Flashback end, yes that was all flashback. Get ready for current times. The sound of wind breaking around the constant flapping of what sounded like wings was the first thing that a sleeping Naruto Uchiha woke to. Groaning slightly still, tired from yet another night of almost endless training, the teenager was clearly fighting against the urge to fall back asleep, but soon enough a loud cawing sound started to fill his ears. As loud as any blurring alarm clock the Uzumaki clan head sat up stiffly, his movements a bit sluggish, but yet the shinobi's eyes remained closed like he was hesitant to find what kind of lighter freight would greet him on the other side. Eventually his eyes would draw open, and from behind those eyelids came to be exposed two black pools with a red ocular rose pattern, with each petal curved to appear as a blade of a scythe all through natural evolution. The unique design of Naruto's Manjikam Sharingan would have pierced through all that he looked to, but here there was no fear, only acceptance from those who awoke him. Hearing the same call once more Naruto nodded in complete and total understanding to what would be incoherent nonsense to others. Swinging his legs from the makeshift bed he had created the raven-haired crow summoner would move to put on his clothing for the day. The ones he wore to bed were scuffed and cut from training and needed to be replaced. Opening the dresser that once again had to be carved from wood during his stay in Kurahane Forest and with good reason seeing that crows had no necessity to have such furniture in the already minimal amount of rooms they had available. From the wooden drawer Naruto withdrew something that was folded over itself and a deep shade of ebony. Closing the drawer and taking a few steps back he would slowly unfold the article of clothing until it was straightened out. When it dropped out the clothing item appeared to be a black trench coat that went past Naruto's hip slightly from just hanging in front of his body. The material of this trench coat at first glimpse may have appeared to be a smooth, uninterrupted material that was quite clearly black in color, but when examined in greater detail, it would become apparent that the material was actually feathers interlinked so expertly that they were weaved to have no openings. Now under normal circumstances a coat made from a bird's feathers may have been a devastatingly poor choice, but Naruto knew better than that because he personally watched and assisted in making this coat out of the feathers of Shikei himself. 
the head of crows assured the Achiha that his feathers alone could stand up to the protective capabilities of a loss to time the coton, the steel release. Meaning it would hold strong against blades, kunai, shuriken and even some low level. Zipping the coat up over his bare chest, there would be the slightest peak of crimson red lining inside of the coat that was meant to keep the body warm and stable, should the need arise, with the only requirement being a small feeding of chakra into the gear. Just switching his pair of navy, shinobi pants for a similar black pair Naruto would glance into the mirror with his manjikum sharingan and give a shrug before heading off to meet the old crow, giving waves and nods to those crows that acknowledge their second summoner. It took about 10 minutes for Naruto's leisurely pace to get him to the perch where Shikai could be found on most occasions, and like the start to their usual meetings, Naruto simply gave his boss summon, the slightest nod of his head, that was the sign that Shikai took to begin with this meeting. Tell me Naruto how long has it been that you have been living in our forest now? Don't tell me that you have gone senile in your old age, Aoyabin. Naruto asked with a small quirk of his eyebrow and a condescending smirk, perhaps before this trip to the homeland of his summons Naruto may have been more formal and respectful than he was at the moment, but with time bred familiarity in this case, and now more than ever, Naruto felt a new sense of kinship with his summons than ever before. When the clear, all too visible twitch that formed on the large crow's brow line started to give a slow throb, Naruto knew he had ruffled the bird's feathers, so that was why when the large bird flapped its impressive wings, causing the bottom of his trench coat to flutter behind him, slightly from the pushing pressure caused by the light wind that the wings created, but Naruto barely batted an eyelash. Brat sometimes I wish I could just pick you up in these talons and drop you to your death. There was then a period of silence between human and summon, neither of which speaking instead opting for staring in a test of wills. The ending to which was suddenly broken by their combined laughter that lasted for a few minutes before ultimately the pair fell back into their respective, serious states. Crossing his arms over his chest with a stoic expression plastered on the features of his face, Naruto blew a bang of hair from his vision, before regarding Shikai with his Manjikam Sharingan. We weren't supposed to have a meeting until I was getting ready to head out in another three months, so what is it you need? Yes, it had been 32 months give or take a week or so since Naruto had left the village to go and train in peace with his summons and without hindrance. Just as was the plan. There was no contact or even concern about the hidden leaf in finding him, and it worked in reverse too. During his time in isolation from the world the young Ichiha kept himself shunned from the world around him, unaware of anything from the hidden villages to the Akatsuki. Every moment he could spare had been infused into strengthening his body, his eyes and his skills as a shinobi. Right to the point as always. The head of the murder murmured under his breath with a tired sigh hinted at under those words, and Naruto knew that Shikai made that audible on purpose, but made no comment. Anyways. Some of the young ones have picked up some interesting information that gives me reason to be concerned. Tell me Naruto do you know anything about the Box of Ultimate Bliss? Box of Ultimate Bliss. Naruto parroted the last four words spoken to him with his head curiously tilted to the left, clearly showing that the Uzumaki clan head didn't have the faintest idea of what the aged crow was speaking about, which didn't at all surprise Shikai, considering the consequences around that damnable box. That is no surprise considering that the box itself was something of an artifact back during the times of the Sage of Six Paths and the rise of Ninshu. The crow started off immediately catching the attention of the human before him, who was clearly interested in hearing about the father of Shinobi. During that time the box of ultimate bliss was used by Kusagakur to try and take over the world, with the box's power to create with utopia with them at the seat of power, but the sage of six path put an end to that so that the peace Ninshu was meant to create could prosper. Confused but still very much intrigued, Naruto used a pause to pose a question that was itching at the back of his mind. Wait. They attempted to take over the world with a box. A box. No matter how credible that Naruto knew his boss summoned to be, the black-haired Yuzumaki just could not help but be baffled by the thought of a box of all things leading to a state of domination that would reach across the world. The story tells that the box of ultimate bliss is capable of granting any wish that one may ever conceive. Immortality, wealth, power. None of these things are out of reach for the box. It was this line of thought that drove Kusa to seek it and the other nations to bury the box deep under the earth, of where Sunagakur has now expanded to cover over the past five decades. Seeing the look that Naruto was giving him, Shikai just continued on with a more factual statement or two rather than myth and legend. Shaking his head and causing a few of his feathers that naturally rose from talking about the box Shikai continued on with his tale, a tale that would hopefully keep a young man he saw as his own son out of trouble. It is good to see that you don't buy into that fantasy, because the reality is that all of that is a trick to get people to open the box and release the avatar residing in the box of ultimate bliss, the Satori. What is the Satori exactly? 
Naruto asked while silently wondering why Shikai was giving him an extended rundown on the history of such an obscure but potentially dangerous weapon that was the box of ultimate bliss, because despite that potential of a long existing threat, Naruto did not see why it needed to cut into his time. Satori is the puppet that carries out the dangers of the box, because its job is to take victims and toss them into the box itself, where once inside the horrors of the box, corrupt the minds of its victims until the warping is no longer repairable. And once that process is complete the box uses its victims as stock so that Satori can continue to be reborn for as many victims as the box has claimed. Which is limitless. Naruto whether he consciously recognized it or not swallowed at the thought of having to fight an endless slaughter of demon after demon. What? What is the point of this Oyabin? So far all you have been telling me are stories that mothers would tell their children to keep them from misbehaving. This is tiring my patience. Naruto said with an ever-growing tone of annoyance, a deeper frown slowly crawling across his face, causing the crow to internally frown at the denial of his summoner, but nonetheless he acquiesced and got on with the purpose of this call. An unsettling amount of the little ones have informed me that there has been a stirring among the elemental nations about this very same box. Naturally this has sprung a certain amount of well-founded concern on my part, so I sent a few scouts to take a look over Sunagakur, and though I am not certain about if this is true, I am certain that there is quite the amount of activity going in and out of the prison located in Kusa, Hazuki Castle. Knowing Naruto was going to question him on why this was important in the grand scale of things he acted before his subordinate got any more unruly. Quickly he pushed forward the real point of this. I come to you with this because a few crows have reported to me that forces from Kumagakur have been spotted around the area secretly taking information on the caste prison, such as its layout and manpower. As you know Kumagakur has had a history of being power hungry and greedy when it comes to things like this, and you have the unique position of being able to insert yourself into the famous blood prison. Slowly Naruto's black eyebrow slowly arched up into the cover of his hanging bangs, a reaction all too telling for the wizened crow. He knew that he had Naruto's attention now, no doubt thanks to the intrigue of possibly meeting Satori. It was not so secret that Naruto enjoyed a good fight. Oh. And how am I in such a favorable position Shikai? The son of the Hokage, clan head of the Uzumaki, and a member of the fabled Ichiha clan. Despite not going out of your way to attain fame, you have built quite the reputation amongst the people of your generation. It is that reputation that has no doubt led to people noticing your disappearance and a long one for sure. People just may have considered that you have gone. Rogue. Eyes widening with realization Naruto's arms uncrossed from his chest and reached into the confines of his trench coat and out from it, he withdrew his headband, unmarked but just not on. I know that we have talked about leaving Kanahagakur before, but at this point in time that is just a fantasy world. I am simply not ready. Naruto admitted with a bit of a bitter frown as his hand slowly slid back into his coat to store away the hit I ate while looking to the crow for some kind of reasoning. Naruto, you misunderstand me. You don't have to leave the village at all, you just need to trick those responsible for transporting prisoners to Hazuki. Make them believe that they have been captured. Let them think they are doing their superiors a favor, and then you have your way in. Chikei pushed the subtle thoughts into Naruto's mind and watched as the gears had started to turn in the young human's head, and if the crow could do so he'd be grinning cunningly. Where the crow could not, Naruto was grinning much like a fox up to a rather fulfilling prank on someone who had antagonized it. Eyes flashing slightly as some of the spiritual power of the forest channeled into his body Naruto straightened out his posture and regarded his summon with a smirk. You are really sly, but I suppose that is to be expected of someone like yourself who has quite the number of years under your wings. Not giving Shikai a chance to respond, Naruto turned and made way to go and study up on this blood prison before his capture by the hidden grass forces. Wait, Naruto, how are your eyes? Shikei asked with a bit of concern having heard from Naruto about the pitfalls of his powerful dejutsu when he explained it to both he, Shikei, and Susei upon arriving when they were activated by the presence of the forest. No need to worry Oyabin, it looks like you were right about Kurahane, because my vision hasn't gotten any worse considering how my eyes have been activated all along. Kurahane's abundant spiritual energy is feeding the Sharingan and is actually placing something like a stasis seal on them, but should I use these eyes outside of this place, then the path to blindness will surely begin. Now then. Have a good day. Naruto said with the faintest ugs of a smile on his lips before he walked out of the meeting place just like he had entered it. The distinct sound of the whistling of a strong wind echoed out throughout the field that was littered with soot and sand, with numerous boulders spiking up from the inhospitable ground below. It was so very strange to see such a barren wasteland when only miles away from this spot was the forest of the crows. Naturally this caused Naruto to wonder if the reason for such a drastic difference was the sheer amount of nutrients the forest would need to run on being sapped from the lands around them. Time to see how far I have come since I first tried to do this. 
Closing his right eye the black-haired Yuzumaki focused his left eye on a rather large boulder positioned in the center of the desert field and channeled the chakra into his eye. Feeling his magicum pulse with power Naruto breathed out a simple word that would cause many to shake in fear under the legendary. Amaterasu. Heavenly illumination. Just a moment later the rock in the focal point of his vision was engulfed and set ablaze by the legendary black flames produced by the Ichiha bloodline, the Manjikum Sharingan. Standing still Naruto watched as he slowly ate away at the rock until there was nothing left of the rock but a scorch mark burnt into the sand which was already being covered up by a fresh coating of sand courtesy of the winds. He would sigh after running a few fingers through his hair while mumbling to himself. Still can't get the shape manipulation down, but at least it takes less time for the flames to materialize. Next Naruto would create a shadow clone and have it lock eyes with him for a few moments before Naruto would mutter the next gifted to him by his so-called cursed eyes. Tsukiyomi. Moon Reader. Not even moments later were both Naruto and his clone now in an inverted world with all black color aside from the bloody red sky. With Naruto standing there and staring at his clone that was crucified on a pair of hooked-off T-shapes. Taking a simple glance around Naruto gave a brief nod and dropped the ultimate Jinjutsu and hence returned himself to the real world. Okay now that I have tested those two let us get on to the grand finale of this little training run. The black-haired shinobi spoke under the howling of the wind while focusing chakra back into both of his eyes to activate his personal guardian. Susanoo. Tempest God of Valor. Suddenly a white almost shining energy started to gather and build around the Yuzumaki becoming brighter and brighter until it pierced through the gloomy covering of the sandstorm. Slowly the large humanoid chakra construct started to become visible, which included what appeared to be fur draping off from its shoulders in true cape fashion, while the front of its armor appeared to be more tribal in nature than refined samurai or knight. From the jagged lines of fur and spaces of exposure, it all screamed self-sustained much like Naruto's own life. Head slowly snapping upwards there was nothing more defined than those piercing almost amber-shaded eyes of the mighty Susanoo. The glow of those eyes was only magnified by how there seemed to be a clean-cut head of a massive bear worn over it as a head guard and a trophy. From the angle of the bear's open mouth, it was very difficult to say whether it was the chakra construct that had fangs or it the bear itself, but one thing was for sure. The chakra being slightly released from the shadowy space of the mouth seemed to escape like a light steam, adding to the menacing visage of the tribal warrior. Reaching behind himself Naruto's will had Susanoo pull what seemed to be a sword shaft from out behind him, which would fit Naruto's swordsman upbringing, but at the end of the shaft and on both sides were no straight blades, but cured outward double axes, giving the massive weapon for blades and a very propeller-like appearance. Slashing one hand forward from his position levitating inside of Susanoo Naruto caused the weapon to go spinning into the sand before him, and immediately there was a deafening crash and a geyser of sand spewing into the air, causing a layer of sand and debris to fill the impact site from sight. A glimmer of white gleamed through the cover of sand, and it appeared to be something akin to a chakra string, with tension on the chakra tether and another pull back the weapon came twirling towards Naruto's position and at a dangerous speed. Susanoo's hand quickly came upward and caught the twirling weapon with ease, showing Naruto's lack of concern to be well-founded as he stared down into the chasm created by his attack that seemed to lack an end while sand came pouring into it, making it appear to be a sinking chasm. Taking a deep breath Naruto slowly let the chakra creating Susanoo go, and as the being dispersed Naruto fell towards the ground only to land with a graceful crouch. Pushing back he would settle on a new position away from the threat of the massive chasm he had just created for the sure footing of the boulder below his feet impressive but nothing I couldn't replicate with ease. The Kaiubi commented from within Naruto watching through their shared link of senses, and while not openly admitting to such a thing, he was pleased to see that destruction being wielded by his container for once and not against him. Apparently the introduction of the chakra creature caught Naruto slightly off guard if the uptick in his eyebrow was meant to be any indication. Oh. I was unaware that you had decided to watch my little test run in Kaiubi. Naruto murmured slightly not bothered by the voyeur inside of him, but rather intrigued as to his reason for doing so. Hearing a distinct scoff coming from the back of his mind, Naruto couldn't help but grin a bit, knowing that the Kaiubi much like himself would try to keep a mask up for certain things, and in this case, it was to hide his acknowledgement. Don't get too cocky ninja. It is just refreshing to see that power fighting. And not against me. The orange fox would then give off a slight growl as memories of the Achiha patriarch filled his mind. Already aware of where his tenant was going with that line of thought, Naruto interjected himself before the nine-tailed demon would go recluse and brood in his more dangerous thoughts. Well it doesn't matter how overwhelming or precise my attacks can be inside of the blood prison. After some reading up I learned that the warden there uses a seal of sorts to cause combustion to prisoners who try to access their chakra. The pseudo Jinchuriki muttered with the telling of a frown on his face. And what is so dangerous about that? You are still Yuzumaki underneath all that Ichiha aren't you? 
just craft up some of those damnable seals that your ancestors loved so much and destroy that prison. Naturally the Kyubi no Kitsune would have a natural hate for the idea of prison, be they a human one or the body of a human, the prison of the Biju. Laughing slowly at the words of the prideful beast stored away in his mind, Naruto simply hopped from off his perch on top of one of the many boulders and began to walk back towards the forest of the crows. Hands folded behind his back and a devilish smirk in play on his face, Naruto looked into the desert sky with a very fox-like grin, now morphed onto his lips. Of course. After all, who do you think I am? Two men walking side by side glanced opposite directions of each other to cover as much ground as possible, while also trading small, verbal jabs at each other to pass the time on their patrol. Finally getting fed up with the lack of anything substantial happening not only this time, but God knows how many times before the one on the left threw his hands up into the air with a groan of exasperation, coloring his voice. Gah. I really hate this shift. It's dark, usually raining or cold, and we never find anything because no one else is stupid enough to be out here when it's this dark. The man growled out his anger and punctuated it by kicking a small rock, sending it slamming into a tree base where it fell back to the ground harmlessly. Giving the man a be quiet hiss the second man would slap him on the back of the head, causing it to droop downward and begin to ache harshly. Ignoring the obviously pained look on the first man's face the second would then proceed to lecture him on their duties and how vital they are. You idiot, we can't just not do this job and let someone sneak into or around the prison. What if those idiots from the fruit group try to sabotage Mui-sama's plans huh? Then who do you think they will throw into those eddies down below? It will be us. It doesn't matter at this point because then at least I will be able to see some action unlike the past few months. These idiots in the flower group have been saying something about a project that will save all of Sunagakur, and we still haven't seen shit. The first man continued on his tirade without concern for the treacherous words uttered from his mouth and for the consequences that would no doubt accompany them should they be heard by the wrong pair of ears. Expecting some kind of scolding but only getting silence the prison guard would turn to see what was up with his partner, only to find him standing near a cave entrance. The interesting thing however was not that there was a cave, but the fact that there was a faint light barely escaping from the depths of the cave into the night just outside of the natural shelter. With the second man waiting for his partner to come over he would try to listen in on whatever was inside of that cave and only be greeted with the crackling of embers. Seeing his teammate in position both would nod before each drawing a kunai and stepping into the unknown cave. To both men each step felt like an eternity with the sound of their step sounding like class, five explosive tags to their ears as they got closer and closer to that light source. Thankfully for the sykes of the two Kusa shinobi affiliated with the flower group, they only needed to take a few more steps before the cave widened and they were greeted by the dying light of the campfire. Lowering their kunai but not putting them away, one of the two men walked around the fire and found a person there sleeping without a care in the world. However this was not just any run-of-the-mill camper no, this was Naruto Uzumaki or Naruto Ichiha, depending on who you'd ask which alone was enough to widen the eyes of the one who found him lying there on the floor. I think we just found the ticket that will get us off of this patrol that you hate so much my friend. The man said to the one that had been so avid about complaining about their assignment, who looked none the wiser about who he was looking at, if the blank look on his face was anything to go by. Yeah I don't get it. How is picking up some random bum going to get us promoted? Sighing, the Kusanin would then reach into his pocket and pull out a bingo book, one that held names of any notable shinobi in the five major villages. A standard for any minor village. Thankfully for the man who was confused, the page was already open to Naruto's page. Fool. We are looking at Naruto Che. He has been missing for two years, and some villages have speculated he had gone rogue. Blinking a few times eventually the man holding the book would make a small look of realization on his face. Snapping the book shut and looking down at the sleeping black-haired shinobi with a small frown the jail guard murmured under his breath. This is the kid who beat the Ichibi before it fully transformed in the Chunin exam finals. The man's companion nodded with a small smirk on his lips while his hand would fish out something that looked like a complicated seal that he placed on Naruto's wrists and activated with a flare of chakra. Yes but this boy is also an Uzumaki and that means he has both plentiful and potent chakra, just what Mui-sama is looking for. That is why Naruto Uzumaki is our ticket to getting a promotion. Grinning from ear to ear as he envisioned a future in the cozy Hazuki castle surrounded by comfortable beds and warm food, the other man put the book into his coat and moved to help his partner with the lugging of the still sleeping Naruto off to their superiors. Well then shut up and let's get going. This meal ticket is getting into Mui-sama's hands on his own, now is he? The excitement and downright glee was unmistakable inside of his voice as his eyes almost twinkled with anticipation. His partner would nod with a smile of his own, while both looked ahead to the castle looming over the tree line in the night sky, because both of the shinobi were so engrossed with their own thoughts of grandeur and expectations that they missed the look on a very much awake Naruto's face. 
it was a look of a predator that had just captured its prey and was about to have a very, very satisfying dinner. It was now safe to assume that all the pieces he had to set up were done so perfectly, and all he had to do was wait for the major players to reveal themselves. Chapter 19. Blood Prison. The weather outside was very uncharacteristic for a night out on the nearly plains country of the land of grass, with thunder rumbling and lightning flashing, it made for quite the unsettling scene for those scared of storms. And up in the retaining, isolating walls of the blood prison sat its warden who was currently spending the night up in his study, behind his desk with his gloved hands placed together under his chin, eyes peering through the window into the night sky. It took just one glance into those soulless eyes of the warden, Louis to see that he was a man who didn't have much to live for, but that was only a first glance. A second look revealed a man with much more of a drive. Currently it was that man who was reliving a happier time in his life, a time where his wife was very much alive and in fact pregnant with their son who was soon to be born making him a happy father. Then much like everything in his life there were complications and his wife's organs started to fail after delivering their child and with a normal medic, there was nothing anyone could do to save her. At first he blamed his wife for not being strong enough to welcome their child into this world, but that was his initial reaction in his deepest grief. After a few weeks of searching within himself the now father had come to the conclusion that it was indeed his son who was the one to blame for this. It was his burden that destroyed their family before it could start, so to atone for this Mui set out to make sure his son, Nyuku became as strong as he could possibly be, so that he could make his wife's dream of a perfect Kusa a reality. There was only one way to do that, and that was with a chakra powerful enough to open up the box of ultimate bliss, it was a box meant to grant wishes, making the impossible possible. But the benefit of hindsight the master of the infamous blood prison came to realize that too was a mistake, one of many he had made. His first mistake came in assigning blame because it was indeed his fault for not finding a medic that could save his wife. His second mistake was offering his son to that box, because all it did was take him away, and his third mistake was believing in this polluted world, but now he had his own vision for the power of the box, and this was a wish that he had kept from the rest of his flower group in the prison. We know where the box is since we held onto it after our first failure, but the truly difficult part of this whole thing is finding someone with powerful enough chakra that we can use to open up the box of ultimate bliss with, but the only thing I can think of is a Jinchuriki, but what village in their right mind would hand over such an asset? To even think about something like that it would take not only an inexperienced leader, but also for the Jinchuriki to attempt to murder their leader. Thinking about it for a few moments he shook his head, all the current cages were much too tested to fall into a decision like that. Barely able to stifle the frustrated growl tearing through his throat, the man with long hair stood up and slammed both of his large gloved hands on the top of his desk, causing the wood in his hands to create a loud slap that rang out sharply in the room, with only the storm outside providing any noise. Louis took a calming breath that stopped the light tremble in his shoulders before he slowly moved his hand to tuck some hair behind his ear and out of his face when there was a knocking at the door. What? He all but snapped at the door as his eyes glared into the dark wood, hoping that his piercing anger would somehow reach the person that was on the other side of the door. Louis remembered specifically stating that he was not to be bothered tonight, so whoever this was who was explicitly going against his word was going to be getting fired and then having the Tenro, heavenly prison, Mark bestowed upon them. Yes, sir. We have a report from one of the teams that was assigned to sweep through the fields around the prison's island, and we actually came upon someone. They recognized him as Naruto Chihas, sir. What do you want us to do? It was no surprise that the masculine voice on the other end trembled on occasion out of fear. Hearing this caused the man's eyes to go wide for a number of reasons, the first being the magnitude of the capture his forces just made, and the second being that Naruto Uchiha was also an Uzumaki, the shinobi bloodline with the strongest chakras known to the world. Surely if there was any kind of person outside of a Jinchuriki that could open the box it was in Uzumaki. Calming himself down from overreacting to his silver platter presented an opportunity, the warden of the prison cleared his throat before speaking up. Very well done, I want you to keep him in a cell with chakra restraints on until the morning where he will be processed in, along with the rest of the daily filth that comes to our illustrious prison. He waited until he got the traditional yes sir, which was quickly followed by the hurried sound of feet rushing down the hallway to relay his orders to those beneath that officer. Now that he was sure he was alone, Mui allowed for a very pleased smile to cross his facial features as he gazed at the picture of his son's stoic face, framed in a lasting picture on his desk. Soon, my son. Soon you will return and we can become the happy family that we were always meant to be. Even without an audience to hear him the passion in his voice was real for the few moments that he could be heard before a rumble of thunder rained across the area, drowning out any other noises. Oh ho, not so tough are you? So much for the feared and powerful Ichiha clan, if you ask me I'd say you're nothing more than a lousy cur. Naruto by this point had tuned out the incessant chatter that was coming from the rot unman with a bad haircut and sunglasses, who was hiding behind the other guards who were escorting him. 
that had started from the very moment he was forced from his cell and only three minutes into the walk and the imprisoned Achiha was already sick of it but sadly he was unable to do anything about it. Being pushed through the doorway Naruto's blue eyes fell upon a line of people in a similar position to the one he was in, the only difference being that they were indeed in line. Feeling a baton being pressed into the back of his neck, Naruto sighed under his breath and allowed himself to be guided towards the end of the line, where he just closed his eyes and waited for something to happen. And nothing did for a handful of minutes causing a few of the prisoners to get a bit antsy. What a childish tactic. Naruto muttered in thought. Everyone's eyes, sans Naruto's, turned to a pair of doors that slowly opened up at the top of a flight of stairs. There were a variety of different reactions on the faces of those lined up as they watched a warden of the jail descend the stairs with his stoic expression in play. Bui's eyes momentarily kept on Naruto's frame before his dead gaze wandered across the rest in line, causing many of them to straighten up upon being examined. All of you are here for the worst reasons. Murder, treason, and rape being a few of those reasons. Your villages have decided to wash themselves clean of your sins by sending you here to Hazuki Castle, which will be your home for the rest of eternity. There is no escape, and those foolish enough to try will die. He was more than pleased seeing a number of inmates stiffening with fear, which would help promote obedience, thus creating fewer headaches for him in the future. He was ready to turn around when there was a scoff that came from someone in the middle of the line. Spinning around with a glare in place Mui's gaze steadied itself on a bald man formerly of the Hidden Mist, who seemed less than impressed by the whole spiel that was given. I see that you don't believe me. That is good, why? It is good because now I can make an example of you. Moving until his shadow lingered over the shorter man, Mui slowly lifted his hand, and without so much as a shred of emotion flashing across his face, the warden delivered a flat palm strike to the man's chest. Katen. Tenro. Fire release. Heavenly prison. The whole crowd watched in horror as a red seal appeared on the man's chest before it started to glow, causing the man who was previously defiant to gasp and grasp at his chest, before crumbling to the ground, clawing at his chest. Oh god it burns, it burns. Please make it stop, anyone please. Ah. Turning around with a smirk on his face, Mui ignored the pained screams of the man who could feel his skin being burnt off his bones as he continued his speech. What you all just saw is the imprisonment that has been passed down in my family for ages. The Tenro is a that stops wars because it stops chakra. Anyone who either tries to access the chakra inside of them or leave the prison will be set on fire by the activation of the seal, a seal that will be placed on every single one of you. Mui looked in Naruto to see what kind of impression his little display had made on the person of importance to his plans, but found that he was quickly frowning when he saw that the raven-haired Yuzumaki wasn't even looking, his eyes were still closed. Yes, then there is Naruto Che. A shinobi that had suddenly vanished over the past few years, I am sure that the hidden leaf will pay a nice price for you. First I will play something of an insurance policy on you, the Tenro. Yet another smirk crossed his face when Mui saw the momentary wince that crossed across Naruto's face when the initial burning sensation that came with the application of the seal was registered by his nerves. Now you are no better than anyone else here. Those famous ancestors of yours, that family of yours and those eyes of yours. None of them will be able to help you here. Turning around, the warden proceeded to set the imprisonment technique on those who had yet to receive the seal. One by one the man slowly destroyed the hopes of man after man with a simple tap of his hand. Now then, every single one of you will be put through screening where we will be removing all of your dangerous weapons before you will be allowed with the rest of the prisoners. You will be receiving the prison's general schedule while being screened, other than that. Enjoy your stay at our lovely home. And with that simple dismissal Mui was already on his way back to the same entrance that he came through leaving the new batch of prisoners to the whims of his guards. I dare you to say that again, shrimp. Bellowed out a large man with clothing on that was clearly too small for someone as large and rounded as he was. Judging from the way that the veins bulging from the sides of his shaved head were being exposed out as he yelled, it was safe to say that he was very close to a boiling point. Standing in front of the angry giant was a man of modest height, but where he found himself lacking was in the department of weight, as he was quite the wiry, scrawny individual, and not because of his dieting, it was a simple byproduct of his genetic frame. Currently that thin brunette man was snarling up at his roadblock. I said get out of the way butterball, I'm trying to get something to eat. You know the thing you like to do a lot. That's it I am going to crush you and your bones. Quickly the larger, bald man reached out and took the other prisoner by the collar of his shirt and yanked him off his feet, held right in front of him. His other arm could be seen lifting with a clenched cocked fist, ready to be delivered. The thin man despite his unfavorable position, did not take this lying down, in fact he looked ready to headbutt the larger man in the chin, in order to get free of his clutches. Then just as it seemed like blows were about to be traded a handful of guards each wielding correctional weapons, swarmed the two, and the small audience jeered them on. Stop this instantly. Mui-sama will not have this kind of behavior here in his prison. 
The head guard of the group shouted and then without even waiting, he smashed his baton into the larger man's elbow, causing the nerves in it to fire off with pain, thus leaving the larger prisoner to drop his captive unceremoniously to the hard earth below. Looking at the guards behind him the lead ordered them to separate the two, whilst those in the small encounter took verbal shots at each other until both were out of ear's reach of the other, despite the amount of blows they got in return for being so obstinate. Without a main event to watch the crowd quickly dispersed to do other things grumbling about the guards ruining the fun before it could even be started and eventually the courtyard returned to its standard but still busy state of being. In that courtyard, off to the side one Naruto Ichiha could be seen sitting cross-legged with his back to a column, watching the entire spectacle unfold with his cool, blue eyes showing no noticeable emotion. There were more than a few people who up to this point had approached him with insults about either how pathetic he looked or how they were so glad that the rest of his clan had been wiped out, but the raven-haired shinobi was more than able to ignore such things while giving anyone who approached a thousand-yard stare that eventually got under their skin and drove them off. Before Naruto could start to think on how to spend his time here before the box of ultimate bliss would appear, he felt a presence come from out of the hall that was behind him, causing Naruto to turn his eyes momentarily to the left, where the presence stopped to lean against the inside of the pillar to his left. Arms crossing over her chest the woman took rotating turns in glancing at Naruto and the courtyard, leaving Naruto to turn his attention back to where it was before. Or at least until his newfound company decided it was time to speak up. The woman standing next to him was dressed in a green kimono top with a black shirt underneath it and matching trousers and shinobi sandals. Her white hair while mostly contained by the green bandana she was wearing did fall over her face, slightly covering one of her unique white eyes. She was a taller woman with tanned skin and held a confidence about her, a confidence that went from her posture all the way to the strength of her gaze. Tell me it's has said why someone of your stature is here of all places. Her voice was soft but still held his attention nonetheless. Her wording was blunt and clear enough to Naruto, something that once again he found refreshing considering the world they were living in, but still he wasn't going to just spill the reasons he had for being incarcerated here in Hazuki Castle, just because she was being forward with him. What do you mean? Haven't you heard because it is just as the stories say. I got careless and fell asleep a bit too close to this place, leaving me vulnerable to a passing patrol that scooped me up as I enjoyed my rest. He did try to keep his voice as genuine as he could for the sake of his cover, but found that comparing himself to a genin in the same way that he'd fall asleep like that to be sickening down to the depths of his stomach. After all he was an Achiha, and every Achiha had their pride. Taking a glance back at the woman beside him, it was clear that she was not there with the rest of his group earlier in the morning, so that brought up the question of how exactly she knew who he was, especially after his absence from the world, given he didn't really change all that much appearance-wise, except from height and muscle growth. Please don't take me for a fool like the rest of the men you have fooled here. I know that someone who was skilled enough to defeat an out-of-control Jinchuriki years ago is not foolish enough to be caught like some fresh from school genin. Her words about his past put Naruto on alert, not only did she know about what he had done, which many knew about so it wasn't that big of a deal, she was also able to identify him and hide her presence from his ordinary senses long enough so that she could get in close to him, if he had to guess he would say at least a Jounin level Kinoichi. You are quite the perceptive one, but before I go into any possible reason for being here, why don't you share your name with me Kinoichi-san? Oh and don't bother trying to tell me you are male because one look at your face and the bone structure of it is a very big giveaway for anyone with anatomical knowledge. It was childish and he knew it, but still Naruto couldn't help but find amusement in the few moments that the white-haired Kinoichi had lost her composure and gawked at him, causing Naruto to chuckle. A few moments later and the woman coughed into her bandaged hand, bandages that ran all the way up to her elbows. Once she had fully regained her composure the woman narrowed her eyes on the man in front of her. You may be able to determine my gender from a look, but do you care to explain how you can accurately claim that I am a Kinoichi as well? Naruto took a glance at her before standing up and turning his body so much like his company for the moment that it was leaning against the inside of the large white column, leaving the unnamed woman firmly set in his gaze. Well to start you were able to identify me quite easily in the span of a few hours of me arriving. Now normally this wouldn't be too large of a point except for two things. 1. You were not in the group of prisoners that I arrived with, and there is also the fact that I haven't really been seen by anyone in years, so my description is a bit out of date. Plus you also hid your presence long enough to get close to me, a sign of shinobi training. However, enough of that, I am going to ask that you stop stalling before you find yourself with an enemy that you do not want here in this place. She looked at him running through the points he had made in her head, and after she had gotten done doing so, she had to silently curse herself for her need to confirm her information, along with her instinct to be stealthily. It was only natural thanks to the training she had undergone, but this time it had clearly gotten her caught by this man in front of her, because he was smart enough to know what he was looking for. My. 
My name is Raizetsu, and I am a Kanoichi acting under the orders of the Land of Grasses Fruit Group, a group that is in direct opposition to the flower group that Nui and the elders of the prison here belong to. It was a risk to reveal herself to Naruto that much was certain, but she was certain that gaining the raven-haired man's trust would be quite beneficial to her plans. Naruto looked at her for a few moments before nodding in acceptance towards the information that he was just given. It wasn't as widely known about or as talked about as the civil war in the land of water, but Kusagakur did indeed have its own internal strife, and this conflict came in the form of small-scale battles and espionage between the flower and fruit groups respectively. Naruto himself while aware of the conflict itself, was not so aware of the situation to say what the goals of each group was, but if he had to guess he'd say one wanted domination while the other coexistence. That seemed to be the norm for ideals nowadays. Meanwhile, as Naruto went through his own database in his brain, Raizetsu was looking at the space just over Naruto's shoulder, clearly going back and forth about what she wanted to say next, if she wanted to add something more. Letting this information out would let out more chances for a leak she knew that, but if she could convince Naruto Uchiha to choose her side in this matter, it would make a strong ally for the Kinoichi one she'd rather not see as a foe for this mission. I'm here because our group has uncovered Mui's plans to do something here in this prison that could ultimately be the end of this world. He wants to open something that will only cause pain, misery and catastrophe. He wants to open. He wants to open the box of ultimate bliss in hopes that this box will be able to grant him any wish. Naruto ended up finishing Raizetsu's sentence for her without much thought of what he was actually doing, unaware of what kind of reaction it would stir up in Raizetsu. At first Raizetsu didn't seem to have any kind of reaction, but once that moment passed a white-haired Anbu operative took sneaking glances around them to make sure no one was looking, and once she confirmed that there weren't any eyes on them, she took Naruto by the collar of his black trench coat. Pulling him back into the shade and cover of the hall, she slammed Naruto back into the column standing very close to him glaring daggers into his still cool blue eyes. Why do you know about the box of ultimate bliss? Are you here to help them in opening the box? It would make sense since why else would anyone as clearly skilled as you want to come here to this hell willingly. In the heat of the moment with her anger clouding her better judgment, Raizetsu had no problems with throwing her accusations in Naruto's face. The trembling in her shoulders was quite clear as her grip tightened on his trench coat. Naruto to his credit was able to keep his calm while he rode out the wave of emotional outrage that he was being subjected to. Once it was clear that she was not going to let go, Naruto supposed it was up to him to take matters into his own hands. Reaching up he wrapped a hand around her left wrist and put enough pressure on the inside of her wrist with enough force that it slowly started to hurt physically. Naruto was all too aware of why Raizetsu was reacting like this and what was the reason behind this behavior, but even with all of that knowledge, he still wasn't going to allow himself to be treated like this. I am sure that you have a lot invested in this mission, but if you don't release me, you will find just how terrible of an enemy that I can be. Now. Please. It was clear that despite how calm he tried to remain that there was a growing indication of annoyance spreading through his voice. Thankfully for Raizetsu she was skilled enough of a Kinoichi to be able to pick up on the subtle shifting of Naruto's tone to tell that perhaps her rash lashing out at him may have done more harm than good in her sudden questioning. Taking a calming breath that stopped the slight angry tremor in her shoulders, Raizetsu's fingers slowly uncurled, releasing Naruto's coat from her grip. Moving a step back Raizetsu gave Naruto one last apologetic look before she nodded, letting Naruto know that she was now calmed down. Pushing off of the column he was pressed into first, the raven-haired Yuzumaki straightened out the few wrinkles near the collar of his coat before he straightened out his posture, leaving him a few inches taller than Raizetsu herself. Sighing, Naruto used the back of his hand to brush some hair from his face so that he had a clear view of grass Kinoichi. Now then as I was going to explain to you before you so rudely gripped my coat. I had learned about the box of ultimate bliss from the boss summon that my summon animals answer to. He advised me that I should try to stop the resurgence of the Satori, since he knows of the evil that something like that could spread across the land to leave it fester. Raizetsu had to rein herself in from actually vocally scoffing at the thought of one shinobi alone, no matter who they were, fighting and coming out victorious over such an infamous creature like the one known as an avatar of enlightenment. You actually think that you could fight something as powerful as the Satori alone, something that almost alone brought ruin to the world. I hate to say this, but it appears that even you are vulnerable to the curse of the Ichiha pride. Rather than look offended by her mention of his personality, Naruto looked at her with a slight hint of amusement in his gaze. Before answering Naruto chuckled and gave what could be called at best an indifferent shrug. Perhaps I am aiming too high, and yes you and others could see that as arrogance on my part, but I am also part Yuzumaki, which means I have one thing going for me that my past kinsman didn't and that my fellow jailbird is Fuinjutsu. Naruto was not so blind as to not realize how people thought of the Achea, but unlike those say like Sasuke, he was not bothered by people mentioning his arrogance, if anything it made them underestimate him, a fatal mistake for any shinobi. 
To be honest Naruto had been expecting a retort from the white-haired Kinoichi, and when all he received was silence and a look that said she would require further elaboration, Naruto decided that it would be alright for him to let her in on his little plan. As far as I see to release the monster you need to open the box, and when they do that I am sure that this creature won't be as friendly as they think. They never are. Anyways, with the chaos that will ensue I can not only seal the monster back into the box, but this time I can seal the box way entirely, not simply burying it like the last time. That. What is your plan? That can hardly even be called a plan. Everything you just said revolves around chance and things falling in your favor. There is no certainty in this. Raizetsu immediately disputed the plan because her shinobi training required that whenever she'd undertake something like this, she required something concrete that she could count on, and not something that could change as easily the direction of which the wind blows. However if she was going to comment on one thing that seemed to be a positive out of all of this, it was the fact that he was very confident about it all. If Naruto was bothered by her opinion of his plan, he did not show it as his face kept decidedly neutral, despite the disbelief that was dripping from her words. In fact her doubting of his plan seemed to light a fire inside of those chilled blue eyes of the Acha. Yes I will admit that this will take some things falling in the right direction, but the end result is the most effective in dealing with this wish granting box for good and that can't be denied. There were few things even in the world of Shinobi that could rival the strength and danger of an Uzumaki clan styled sealing technique, which was the very reason that most, nearly all of the clan from the Whirling Tides, had been wiped out by the combined forces of Iwagakur, Kumagakur, and Karigakur, back before the last Great War. That fact was something that still saddening for Naruto, provided him with the advantage, because even as in Yuzumaki people underestimated that blood, since very few people believed that practitioners so skilled in ninjutsu even existed outside of those who had decades of experience, something Naruto was not above exploiting. Now if you'll excuse me I must be going. Being gone too long in a place like this will raise suspicion. I wish you good luck in whatever you plan on doing. With his peace said Naruto folded his arms across his chest and gave Raizetsu a respectful nod before stepping back around the column and back into the courtyard where the shinobi from the land of fire hence made his way forth towards the mess hall, easily ignoring the few jeers that were thrown his way by disgruntled prisoners on both sides. Meanwhile, left alone to her thoughts, Raizetsu stood there in silence, her eyes still trained on the spot that Naruto was occupying. It was one thing to believe your abilities when it was just your life at stake, but the way that Naruto was willing to risk everyone here, and then some left Raizetsu uneasy about the battle that could happen. It won't matter because I will succeed and Mui will fall, and with him all of their plans too will crumble. A few nights later, once again night had fallen over the world shrouding it in the darkness which to each and every prisoner was a welcomed reprieve from the intensive labor and all too frequent brawls, night was a time for rest and recuperation. However where some took it as an escape from the realities of where they were there were others who took this time of peace to think. Those thoughts ranged anywhere from those left behind to revenge on those who placed them here in the blood prison in the first place. Yet most of these thoughts ended up taking place behind the isolation that the bars of each cell provided, the security of servitude and condemnation. However that was not the case for Raizetsu who was standing out on a cliffside with her wide eyes staring down intently at the violent swirling riptide of water that was below her. Having been in this prison long enough Raizetsu knew that the strong undercurrents around the island paired with the Tenro seal was all that was needed to keep its perfect record intact, because when nature is against you and hope is removed, there is no one that would even dare trying to attempt such a foolish thing. The pain of the seal shutting down any shinobi's ability to survive and removing the one thing that shinobi relied on was chakra. Well all that meant was death. The white-haired Kinoichi belonging to the fruit group stood there atop of the precariously hanging landmass with her hand under her chin and her face clearly taking the expression of thought as she mulled over all that had happened thus far over the past few nights. Was what that man said true? Can I trust him considering that he was working for Mui or at least with him? But he said he needed his trust and doing his bidding from the inside was the only way to earn that trust. It was just too much to take in and try to go through in just one night, and currently Raizetsu was too busy trying to go through it all to be in the right mind to make any decision at the moment, and she knew that. Normally Raizetsu would take this time to think about her past and the number of personal tragedies that she had to go through that made her into the Kinoichi that she was today but not tonight. No, tonight she had to turn her attention towards the information she had gathered after her assassination attempt on the prison's warden, a failed assassination attempt, because if it was true it changed a number of things happening here in the prison, and that change would be soon coming. Feeling the frustration building up within her the Kinoichi closed her eyes and took a deep breath using the moment to force herself to calm down and to even her temperament. Scrunching your face up like that will give you a lot of wrinkles when you get older Ryuzetsu. But the thoughts that were running around in her mind, she didn't know who to expect that voice to belong to. Mui, one of his guards, the man doing Mui's dirty work. 
Raizetsu turned around, her eyes wide in alarm, and without so much as a second thought or preservation instinct kicked in as she threw a straight right hand towards whoever it was that made their way up behind it. It was only after it was too late to pull her fist back that she was able to decipher whose face it was that was hidden by the cover of night. Naruto. It wasn't quite a horrified look on her face since it was just a punch, but it was indeed a panicked look on her face, as the last thing she wanted to do was harm her newfound acquaintance without reason, which she thought she had just done, but just before her fist could find its target, Naruto held his palm out, and instead of a dull thud of fist hitting face, there was the thud Naruto catching, Raizetsu's blow just inches from the bridge of his nose. The two of them stood there in silence for a few moments before Naruto's blue eyes drifted south to the fist he was holding, the action nearly causing him to go cross-eyed for a moment. Blinking once then twice Naruto moved his eyes to the still slightly shaken ones of Raizetsu before the corners of his lips twitched into a wry, if not slightly amused grin. That was quite the greeting Raizetsu, a good way to keep people on their toes that much is for sure. Naruto said under a chuckle clearly making light of the situation. Naruto, what are you doing here? Raizetsu asked, ignoring his attempt at humor, her voice still a bit shaky from the surprise lingering in her system. Since there wasn't supposed to be anyone outside of the prison ever let alone at these hours she thought it was a question that was rightfully asked. Before he even answered Raizetsu could tell that something was off by the dry look of disbelief that she was receiving from Naruto, but even with a few moments of silence, she still couldn't come up with a reason as to why he was giving her that kind of look. I snuck out here after leaving a clone sleeping in a cell. For being such a large, impenetrable prison the security is pretty lax, but what are you doing here? Naruto asked, making sure to emphasize the point that no one should be out here which included her leaving him hoping she understood. In Raizetsu's defense she had been here for so long, much longer than Naruto, that coming out here to be alone had become close to second nature, so much so that her mind had associated this with not breaking the rules. Back during my time in actual combat I was used more for sabotage and espionage than doing the same sort of thing in a controlled environment like this is easy. The white-haired Kinoichi replied with a slight shrug as Naruto released her first, allowing her to turn back to face the sea ahead, leaving Naruto to do the same as he stood beside her, with his hands folded against his back. Uncharacteristically it was Naruto who broke the silence between the two. Just going by the look on your face something happened that has seemed to put some doubt in the back of your mind. Do you feel like sharing whatever your problem is? Naruto wasn't one who normally went out of his way to ask things like that, but maybe it was because in this prison there was only one person he could really talk to semi-openly. That's what he was going to go with since it made sense with his human need for social interaction. Silence was his answer or at least it was for the time that it took Raizetsu to decide if she wanted to tell him or if she wanted to remain tight-lipped and silent about it. A minute later Raizetsu let a sigh leave past her lips and decided to tell Naruto what had happened. The other night I, I planned on assassinating Mui in his sleep, but things didn't go as planned. She could see Naruto's body slightly tense up in what she guessed was a precautionary defense, but she didn't say anything or even visibly react to it. Then it is safe to assume that was your plan, not a bad one, but then again it didn't have much creativity to it. Despite the fact that it was a clear insult Raizetsu strangely enough didn't feel too offended by the slight at her plan. Maybe it was the even tone that he said it with, or the fact that there wasn't a pair of eyes that she could see clearly judging her, as both were still looking out into the elemental sea. I do have a question of my own however. If you failed to assassinate the warden of this jail then how exactly are you moving around so freely and saying not laying in the morgue somewhere? And there was the question that she was hoping not to hear, but expecting at the same exact time. Not that either of those made her any more willing to answer. As Raizetsu tried to come to a decision about her response the silence stretched on for a period of time longer than she was even aware of. In that time Naruto had seemed to pick up on her indecision and spoke up on the hunch she had. Something happened. Something that you aren't sure that you can trust me with which is why you're hesitating. Natural and thus expected. This time the Uzumaki's words were enough to provoke Raizetsu into turning around and staring into the side of Naruto's face with a look of suspicion plastered on her face. After all, who was really okay with being left out of the loop? No I am not reading your mind Raizetsu, well not your mind specifically. Any one of us from the most benevolent of cage or the most infamous missing nin, we have certain factors that make us human. We search for trust, acceptance, social interaction and dreams. Those are a few things that keep every one of us ticking and driving. Even the most deranged madmen carry at least one of those physiological needs. This insight into the basic working as their species as humans while simple and easy to decipher, only further strengthened the belief that Raizetsu held that Naruto Uzumaki or Naruto Uchiha, no matter what name he was called, was still a dangerous man, even without the arsenal of bloodline powers he had at his disposal. It was a terrifying prospect if you were considering him to be an enemy and something to be admired and fought for if he was an ally. 
it was a polarizing kind of power, a natural charisma and way of thought that could change things around him from simply existing much like stories and documents written about Madaracha that she had studied growing up as a child. As the two stood there under the darkened sky with the only real source of light being the smooth beams of light coming off of the moon, it seemed like silence would be the order of the night. At least until Raizetsu spoke up. Do. Do you really think that you have a realistic chance of beating that? That monster? Even though she didn't specify what creature she was talking about, it was 100% implied that she was indeed referencing the Satori. To Naruto it seemed like she was seeking out in him some kind of hope and assurance that everything would end here in this prison. Raizetsu, you have some kind of previous experience with the subject. Probably not with the Satori personally, but that doesn't discount the box. Whenever you mention it there is a fire in your eyes. It's a fire, an emotion much different than that of just doing what is right. It's personal for you. Is it revenge? His words though deep prying were kept soft and lenient because even if he was curious for answers, he knew that this line of questioning was passing some personal boundaries and was by no means information he was entitled to. There was one thing about his questioning that was planned however, and that was that it distracted her from her question, the question of victory. The white-haired woman held strong for a few moments before her whole demeanor slouched and a burdened sigh left from her lips. She had spent so much of her training, her life bottling things up that it had become second nature almost like a self-made instinct, but when Naruto pointed it out directly, it was like breaking the pillars used to support that strain on her and it showed. Turning around Raizetsu gestured for Naruto to follow her to the cave just behind them, where there was a small fire burning inside. Each taking their respective seat on opposite sides of the controlled flames it was Raizetsu who began. Growing up as a child in a wartime environment is tough, I won't say it is the worst of ways to grow up, but it provides its challenges. As a child you are trusting, naive and generally ignorant of the ways of the world around you. In the land of grass though it was different, not knowing who to be friends with because of how their parents and guardians were aligned within the war. Who to trust, who you belong with, the things you just referenced. During her tale rise Etsu hadn't taken her eyes off of the ever-changing swirls and wisps of fire, speaking each word as it came, and Naruto was by no means going to ignore her need for an open floor so to say. Fearing for my safety, my parents decided that they couldn't risk me being a normal child and taught me as much as I could learn at such a young age about the importance of being cautious and tight-lipped. And being young I complied, not wanting to disappoint them. Yet, after a few months I was tired of being alone and tried to make friends. One of those friends was a boy named Yuku. He was so ambitious. Always telling how he wanted to make the land of grass a stable place. A peaceful place that I guess it finally rubbed off on me. As his friend I wanted his dream to become a reality. She continued, her tone getting lower and sadder by each word. Yuku. He trained so hard to make sure that he had the strength to complete his dream despite being so young. It took some time, but finally he was able to have that chance to make his dream come true. It came in the form of the box of ultimate bliss. They hoped by using the box and its wish-granting powers that they could save our homeland, but then the fairy tale turned into a nightmare and the box devoured him before locking up. I lost my only true friend and to some stupid box. That's why I want the box gone forever. Then and only then will true peace be established and his dream will come true. By the end of her emotional outburst a young woman was left panting and slightly flustered in the face, looking to Naruto for some form of validation, but to her shock and outrage, all he did was shake his head. You are already losing your way. His words were measured and quiet, but aside from the crackling of the fire and her own ragged breath, there was nothing that could prevent her from hearing those words. Her passion quickly changed to anger, and it was solely directed at the man in front of her. What? What did you say? She all but hissed out as she prepared to willingly strike out at Naruto for daring to make light of her burden, of her misery. You have lost your identity Raizetsu that is what? You longed for acceptance and when that came you latched to the ideals of the person who accepted you and started fighting on their behest for their vision. Even to this day you fight. But even now as you defend your friend's dream you couldn't find it in you to say Meyer our dream. No, you said his dream. Pass it off as a slip of the tongue if you wish to lie to yourself, but can you tell yourself that peace is what you truly want? Peace for the land of grass when you can't find peace for yourself. Your dream isn't to live for others who won't acknowledge you. You want something smaller, more intimate that you can cherish. Living for others is not the dream you want. His words at first were instantly shut out by her ears, but as he continued to speak, she found herself more willing and more drawn into what he was saying, and he wasn't even trying to do it like some mad cultist. By the nature of his philosophy alone he had captured her attention, but part of her still felt the need to defend herself, defend what she had been entrenched in for so long. What about the cages and the various village leaders? Are their dreams for naught then as well? Were they lying to themselves? 
Shaking his head carefully Naruto offered her a smile as he kept his gaze locked with hers, allowing her to see the clear belief in his words and respect for those he was just about to speak about. No, their dreams are just as real as the everyday Chunin for example. Men like Taburama Senju and the third Reikage who gave everything for their village had dreams. Their dreams were to actually be there for their people, but that is not a dream that everyone can live by every moment of every day. Tell me Ryu Izetsu, do you care about some shinobi in your camp that you have never met? Can you be empathetic with someone who clearly deserves what they have, instead of treating them like something more? Despite being an Achiha, Naruto was more than able to see the sacrifices men such as the second Hokage and third Reikage made, and was able to respect it, because that was something special in their profession, that very few thought about and even less performed. Sitting there Naruto quickly realized she didn't have an answer. You don't even need to answer to me Raizetsu, but you do have to answer your conscience. Remember that. Giving the contemplative Kinoichi one last nod, Naruto stood up and made his way back to the prison with something else on his mind that was not shared with Raizetsu. It wasn't anything that concerned him. It actually brought a devilish grin to his face as he walked away. Meanwhile back in the cave Raizetsu looked down to her upturned hands with a look of clear conflict on her face as she tried to combat the mental turmoil in plaguing her. She desperately wanted for the side she was originally on to win, but the longer she sat there the more Naruto's opinion on what dreams crept into her thoughts. And for the first time in her adult life, Raizetsu had to think about what she truly wanted from this life she was given. What do I want? Chapter 20. Enlightenment Awakens. It had been a few nights, and Naruto's routine had been nailed to a T up to this point in time in the prison. The days would start with him having to go out and perform some physical labor for a few hours before eating a barely passing breakfast. After that it was free time for the prisoners who got their work done and those who had not gone back to work. Being the kind of man Naruto was usually always finished considering those who behaved like he did got the lesser extent of the work. Honestly it was a much more forgiving prison that Naruto had initially expected, but after a day of thinking about that Naruto realized that conditions were kept light, so that deaths didn't happen on premise from shoddy conditions, something that would stain the prison's reputation. In truth the real dangers or pitfalls of this prison came in the form of the less than chipper inmates who had no qualms with going around and picking fights. Naruto quickly came upon the realization that they didn't really care what kind of trouble they got in, so long as they got some kind of blow or humiliation on those they despised, and naturally being an Achiha, most of the scum here hated Naruto for the gifts he was born into which resulted in Naruto being provoked at nearly every moment. Not one to be too morbid about any one situation, the black-haired Yuzumaki just took it as an exercise in tolerance. The nights in the blood prison however were much different, they were by far the most quiet safe times there were to be had here for the sole reason that everyone was locked inside of their cells. It didn't matter if they were plotting revenge or sleeping, they were locked away and incapable of anything. But that revelation Naruto wasted no time in using the reprieve to get some shut eye, which helped the teen operate better throughout the day at the prison, not that it took all that much energy in the first place. So that's why Naruto would currently be found resting on the floor mat with his back to the cell door. The occasional flicker of candlelight cast a low shadow of the Achiha's figure against the back wall of his cell in all its static glory. Or at least it did until there was a quick break in the constant visage, a break that quickly vanished leaving things back the way that they were. However despite the clear fact that there was someone out there the silence permeated only being broken by the occasional sound from an audible insect or just the whipping wind swirling around the land, the prison laid on top of leaving Naruto, no reason to be bothered to wake up since there was no danger to be sensed. Slowly the cage door to Naruto's cell slowly slid open, miraculously the giant iron door didn't make a single sound as it slowly crept open, a fact Naruto remained oblivious to in his sleep. A moment later the cloaked head of a shadowy figure peeked in from the side of the cell, staring clearly and firmly at Naruto's back for a few moments before the figure started to move into the cell. Each step was measured and careful so that he did not set off any alarms inside of Naruto's body and wake him up. That would make the job infinitely more difficult. Creeping towards the sleeping shinobi's positioning the cloaked figure reached into his cloak and from it, he pulled out a black blanket that he made sure to keep away from both of his mouth and nose so that the knockout toxin that it release when it hit against another person's flesh, hence the gloves that he was keeping on. Sorry about this Naruto-san. It's nothing personal, but sometimes when you are part of something that is bigger than yourself people that you don't even know have to support your mission. I hope you'll understand. The voice from beneath the cloak was oddly apologetic as he reached down and knelt beside the sleeping shinobi before he threw the blanket over the top of Naruto's frame and held it tightly against Naruto's body so that the only thing that he could inhale as he gasped out and started to thrash was the toxin that the blanket released upon coming against the oil of a human body's skin. The struggle lasted for a few moments before Naruto's body went slack, causing the man underneath of the cloak to grin victoriously. 
easing the tension that went through his frame to keep Naruto restrained, the shrouded man slowly peeled the blanket back and shoved it back into the storage seal on the inside of his cloak. However just before that this cloaked operative could speak of his victory or ability to secure the objective Naruto or who he thought was Naruto suddenly dispersed in a cloud of thick smoke that was quickly inhaled through the man's mouth, sending him reeling back in a coughing fit, his violent hacking slightly construed by the voice modulator inside of his cloak. Eventually the smoke did clear and the man sat up, but the noticeable difference was that the man's hood fell off his head, exposing his face for the first time. The man's skin was tanned to go along with a head of short messy brown hair that was kept short to keep out of the way while within the prison. His facial was an extremely thin beard that lightly scattered around his jawline. The elderly man's grey looked at the now vacant floor with a look of consternation before he sighed and rubbed at his forehead, shoulders slumping in clear agitation. Well this sets things back a bit. The boss isn't going to be happy. Naruto who had just stepped back into the premise of the compound when the shadow clone he left behind in the cell was dispelled, leaving him with a few pieces of information to sort through, considering that his clone wasn't quite asleep, as the spy thought him to be. With a smirk gently pulling at one corner of his lips, Naruto paused for a brief moment before he silently sped through the corridor down back to his cell. Stopping in front of the door to his cell, the raven-haired shinobi chuckled softly at what he saw. Because the door that he had made sure was closed when he first left was now slightly opened, and purposefully so that if on the off chance that he wanted to say something about what happened that night, they'd have him explain why his cell was opened, considering that no one should be out of their blocks at this time. It made sure that any kind of explanation on his part would require him going over his reasons for breaking the protocol. Naruto personally was sure that they knew he was going to go about opening his mouth, but what he did find interesting was that even in the botched attempt to abduct him, they still managed to at least slightly cover their bases. Shaking off the light case of mirth that was spreading through his frame, Naruto deftly stepped into his cell and gently shut the door before he sat down in the center of his bed mat and started to meditate, a meditation that'd bring him into a nap. I didn't think that you'd move things along so quickly Mui, but now you have played your first card and failed. What will you do next? Will it be amusing or will you force the issue? Either way I look forward to your attempt. Naruto mumbled softly as he set his hands on the insides of his knees, keeping his posture upright as the signs of his breathing, the chest inhaling and exhaling and the shoulders rising and falling, started to even out as the Achiha went into a semi-aware state that meditation would give him until he was roused from his slumber in the morning for his duty in the prison. He was more than attuned to dealing with not-so-open agendas and covert plots, but unlike the micro-focus of it just being on him, it was usually dealing with the politics of council back in Kanoha, trying to manipulate their way into gaining his pair of cursed eyes. The only thing that was left for him to do this time was to sit and wait for his opponent's next play, much like a game of shogi. And that's what happened boss. Meroi, the man that went into Naruto's cell, said with a slight sigh as he went about relaying what happened back inside of Naruto's cell block and the reason that said Yuzumaki was not currently down in the sub-basement on a table, ready to provide all the energy that Mui and his cohorts could hope for. Staring at his warden but still his boss Meroi could feel a bit of anxiety building in the pit of his stomach as he watched Mui holding the expression of what one could expect from a rock behind the bridge that his fingers had made just over his mouth. What made the look even worse was the fact that Mui's eyes were so cold, so lifeless that it almost made it seem to Meroi that he wasn't even there in Mui's sight to begin with. He used a shadow clone to take his place. That is troubling because not only does that mean he managed to perform it with a Tenro seal on him, but he also managed to compromise the security of the prison. I should have expected that someone as skilled as Naruto Ichiha would cause some problems. Mui monologues to himself as he closes his eyes and lets his hands drop back towards the desk that he was sitting behind, a silent form of anger, but respect building for what the shinobi had managed to do. We should go and apprehend him and bring him down to the basement, we know what he did, we have proof. There's no denying that. Meroi offered his own thoughts on the matter, after watching Mui seemed to look like he was trying to figure out the correct manner of business, but to the aid of the warden, everything seemed pretty black and white right now. Naruto broke the rules, they need him for their plans, so take him in and complete the plan. Eyes snapping open to state firmly through his subordinate with a clear as day frown put on his face from listening to the suggestion offered. He wouldn't lie and say that the thought had crossed his mind, but irrational actions such as that could and would have a rippling consequence throughout the whole prison. If they heard what Naruto had managed to pull off it would inspire others and cause problems in the future, something he was not interested in spreading right now. No, no. I'll make sure to wait until Naruto makes another mistake, and I'll be right there ready for it. Frowning softly Meroi wasn't quite sure that now was the time for passive tendencies, but he knew better than to openly question Mui less he wanted to end on the floor, writhing in pain at Mui's feet because he activated the imprisonment seal that ran across the chest of every inmate here, including him. 
so instead of blatantly questioning he tried for something just a bit more subtle that he hoped to use to nudge Mui in the right direction. How do you know he'll be careless like this again? Then for the first time in quite a while that Meroi had come to work for Mui, he saw the warden of the infamous blood prison smile, but his smile was not one that was ordinary. No, this was a smile that was full of not quite malice, but no, it was something more akin to a ruthless kind of aggression that nearly brought forth a frown to Meroi's face. In here my mole, in my prison no one is above making a mistake. I will know when he stumbles and I'll be there to help him fall. Narrowing his eyes Mui's expression fell back into a stone-cold stoicism before he gestured for Meroi to leave him. If that's all you needed to tell me then leave my sight and get back into your cell. Bound, Meroi didn't say a word as he turned around and walked towards the door, causing Mui to turn in his chair so that he could look out of his window. It was that change in direction that caused Mui to miss the slight second that Meroi turned over his shoulder and gave him a narrowed stare before opening the door and leaving, shutting the door behind him, leaving the warden prisoner to his thoughts. Azuki Castle, a few days later, this work isn't something fit for an active shinobi, even if they are a prisoner. This is work for the sick and elderly. Naruto muttered to himself, quiet enough that even the prisoner just a row beside him coughing, wasn't able to hear the frustration that boiled out. It had been six days since Naruto had sneaked out of the prison to find Ryuzetsu. An accident of course then three days into those six days he was moved to file duty, which in short was nothing more than lifting boxes and moving them around whenever a reordering was necessary. In short the work was so mundane that even a shinobi like Naruto was slowly starting to lose his mind. Sensing a presence standing at the edge of his aisle, Naruto turned to look at who was just lingering there, and to his not dismay, there was the man responsible for handling him in this department, and in his hands was yet another box of files he clearly needed to be put back in place. Logically it made sense that a place as active as the prison had lots of moving documents daily, but that knowledge didn't make Naruto feel any better about being stuck in this place. Clearly from the taunting smirk that was on the man's face, Naruto's agitation must have been quite visible. Biting his tongue to make sure he didn't make a mistake, Naruto's cool blue eyes just drilled holes into the unperturbed man. Oh don't worry Ichiha-chan you only have another 90 minutes of this for today. Maybe trying to find out where this goes will help you spend the rest of your time eh? If they were in the actual world and not the haven that this jail provided, Naruto surely would have taken his frustrations out on this man by beating the daylights out of the man until he had quite the number of broken bones, but here that was impossible, hence the blatant taunting. But the thrill of Naruto reacting being taken away the man just huffed and walked away leaving Naruto with a box that was unlabeled, which was almost enough for the Uzumaki side of his blood to flare and lash out with his temper, almost. Ninety minutes later, marching his way quite stiffly out of the file center Naruto's brow could be seen twitching ever so faintly to go along with a subtle vein bulging on his forward. He did indeed spend the rest of his remaining shift having to go through the paperwork in the box so he knew where it could be stored and in the end Naruto was told by the other worker, who had been there much longer than Naruto, that the kind of papers in that box always went straight to the incinerator, which Naruto read silently as everything you have done was for no reason. Needless to say Naruto was nearly on the verge of performing a fire jutsu to set the whole building ablaze, despite the fact that using too much chakra would set his body on fire thanks to the tenro seal across his chest under his clothing. However after taking a moment Naruto remembered the mission he had been entrusted with by his summons, had refocused himself on the mission and on his discipline, and that's when he came walking out of the building. Sighing Naruto ran his fingers through his hair, pushing the bang that fell over his eye out of the way, so that he had complete vision out of both eyes instead of just one. Feeling his stomach rumbling a bit, Naruto took a glance down and chuckled softly at himself. Looks like I wasn't the only one who was annoyed about getting the short end of the stick. He mumbled to himself as he patted his stomach before shoving his hands and making his way through the courtyard to the mess hall to get himself whatever average meal had been dished out today. As he made his way to his destination, Naruto thought nothing of the two average men that were walking his way since he knew they were the two that replaced his shift from having gone by them for a few days now. That was his thought. At least until each of them bumped into one of his shoulders, causing Naruto to react on instinct and grab the insides of the elbows on the arms they used to bump into him before pushing them both back so they were in front of him and his glare. You have three seconds to apologize. His voice was dripping with annoyance, his body tensed like a cornered animal, only he was not cornered, he was irritated from working in what was essentially an office, along with being hungry that right now he was just about ready to explode. The two men looked at Naruto then at each other before they both started to laugh right in Naruto's face as his silent countdown hit three. Shaking his head tauntingly, Naruto took a breath with a dangerous grin spreading across his features. Don't say I didn't give you a chance. 
Before they even had the chance to stop laughing Naruto's left hand launched forward gripping the man on the left by the wrist and pulling it down until there was a snap, which was quickly followed by a scream of agony that caused the laughter to stop and for all the eyes in the immediate area, both guard and prisoner to look over and find that no longer was the man's bone under his skin, but rather jutting out quite grotesquely as he arrived on the ground holding onto his arm. The man's friend who was standing there beside him stared down at his friend with wide, horrified eyes that could only watch the blood flow down his friend's arms, the bone ripping through the man's skin. After gaping at his friend for a few more moments he looked to the man responsible for the situation and that shock turned to outrage. Who the fuck do you think you are? I'll kick your fucking ass. He roared as he rushed Naruto, his right fist cocked back, ready to deliver revenge for his friend. But the grin on his face, Naruto allowed for this man to rush him ducking and weaving out of the way of the sloppy, dull strikes that the man was throwing his way. To Naruto the difference between their respective skill sets. After perhaps the fourth or maybe fifth combination Naruto decided it was his turn to react. Waiting for the fool to overextend himself again, Naruto lashed out and kicked the man right in the gut with enough force for the man to lurch over before he was sent back a foot crashing to the ground. Come on, didn't you want your revenge? You can't do it on the ground like a dog. Growling much like the dog he was called, the man clawed at the ground as chaos erupted around them in what quickly became a full-fledged riot, guards struggling to contain the pandemonium around them as the inmates went into a frenzy. Pushing off the ground the man wasn't even fully to his feet before he made a wild rush towards Naruto, who was ready to be done with the last bits of irritation. Naruto waited till the man took the last possible step that he could take before he shifted to the left and stuck his foot out, causing the man to slide across the ground, cutting open the skin on his palms and chin. The black-haired Yuzumaki didn't even bother letting the man get up a second time as he stomped his head into the ground with a sigh of relief. Yeah, I needed that. Naruto mused looking at the unconscious man beneath his foot before his eyes wandered towards the man's whose wrist he broke, who was also unconscious from the pain shutting down his body. Cracking his neck, Naruto looked forward to seeing Mui walking towards him with his typical frown on his face. Glancing by him Naruto found a few piles of prisoners who he was going to assume were dispatched by Mui, leaving the guards to do something with them. You have been nothing but a problem since you have arrived at Naruto Uchiha. Even today, I know from the guards that you were the one who escalated and in turn incited a riot, something that must be punished. Mui declared sternly as he took a step forward, his posture dropping into a tojutsu stance looking at Naruto like he was expecting him to do the same. Slowly lifting his foot from off of the man's head, Naruto gave the man a curious glance before his calm expression went a bit dark. It was an expression that had Mui been any more unseasoned that it might have caused him to pause. And did you know that you and my parents would have gotten along famously? They thought I was quite the problem child as well. That and I dislike you just about as much as I do them. Despite the noticeable increase in the amount of aggression in his voice, Naruto still did not initiate on Mui. Then they were terrible as parents. I will take it upon myself to finally teach you the meaning of discipline, since it was so clearly lost on you in your childhood. Mui muttered through a shake of his head before he raced forward aiming a one, two combination towards Naruto's solar plexus. They were two strikes that Naruto managed to avoid, but to Naruto the difference between Mui and the two morons he fought earlier was painfully clear, a pain Naruto nearly felt. Shifting inward Naruto used his hand to keep the dominant extended arm of Mui at a distance, leaving with an opening that Naruto struck it however, but before Naruto's fist could find its intended destination Mui's large, loved hand stopped him and his other hand tapped Naruto's chest directly letting out of the burst of chakra through his fingers, Mui activated the Tenro seal, causing Naruto to drop to his knees as the burning sensation spread through his body. Watching dispassionately as Naruto collapsed to the ground in pain, Mui straightened himself out and gave his clothing a gentle pat down, smoothing out the few creases born of moving in a combative fashion. Turning he found a group of three guards standing there at attention awaiting his orders. Glancing over his shoulder the man wiped a strand of hair from his face before looking back at the guards and nodding. Take him into solitary confinement and leave him there for three days. He must realize that he is not allowed to do as he pleases here in my jail. Hi, sir. All three chorus together while raising their hands and saluting to the man in charge before moving around him and in hoisting Naruto up, one taking him by the arms and then each of the other two taking a leg, ignoring his groaning in pain as they moved through the much more subdued courtyard for those who didn't partake in the brawl to watch what was happening, each with a different reaction which consisted of amusement all the way down to bewilderment. One of those innocent bystanders being Rai Zetsu who when she saw Naruto being hauled off to be holed up in solitary confinement, shut off from the rest of the world hand to question his motives, which could be seen on her face from the way her brows furrowed and her skin tightened up. Watching Naruto's body disappear just turning out of her line of sight her wide eyes narrowed questioningly. Just what is he doing? Just what are you doing? 
Naruto was interrupted from what it was he doing by the deep unmistakable voice of his resident chakra monster, causing the Achiha to open his eyes and blink as he found himself inside of his mindscape, staring into the slitted dangerous eyes of the ever-power Kaiubi. Or at least the conscious and power that he had been gaining throughout the years. Just looking into the face of the Kaiubi from where he was sitting up in a tree branch with the kitsune resting on the top of his hill, Naruto couldn't help but grin. Well aren't you a sight for sore eyes. You know I was starting to think that this Tenro seal was messing with your ability to communicate with me from the amount of silence I was getting. Naruto admitted with a chuckle directed to the way that Kaiubi's brow twitched when he realized that his power was being subtly questioned, even though both knew it wasn't subtle in any fashion, after all they had been together for years now. They never once had defined what their relationship was, since it wasn't something that ever needed to be discussed with the give and take, mutual nature to their agreement. Silence you idiot. If a seal that is meant to not only split my power in two, but also keep my mind away from that power can't keep me weak, what makes you think that a pathetic chakra restraint would do anything? Kaiubi howled, wasting no time in making sure that Naruto remembered just how powerful he was, even if he only had seven tails at this point. His crimson eyes glaring murderously at Naruto as if he was issuing a silent dare for him to say otherwise. But Naruto did the opposite in the way that he reeled back, so he was slouched against the trunk of the tree, as he laughed huffing for air Naruto playfully wiped just under his eye with his finger, like he was crying before he sat back up and shot a grin the way of the Kaiubi who hadn't eased up on his glare one bit. Relax a bit large, angry and destructive. I was just messing with you a bit. You know I thought you'd have been used to this by now, but I guess not yet huh? We can work on your not provoked skills sometime soon I am sure. Sending a quick pulse of chakra through his body Naruto found that he was sitting back in the very small stone room that was just barely tall enough for him to sit in as a man of average, if not slightly above average height. In front of the raven-haired crow summoner was a piece of stone he had to work out by using the minimum amount of chakra to manipulate the wind to cut a blade-like section out of the rock. Anyway since you asked what I was going to do I'll tell you. I am going to create a blood seal that should negate and overpower the Tenro seal but there is also a second part to this that is going to require your ability to heal damage. Back within the mindscape created from the seal the Kaiubi rather casually lifted his brow, because as far as he knew from what he'd seen Naruto do with his seals, there was little to no damage coming back Naruto's way. Why would you need my help in healing something? I thought the reason for using the blood seal was to prevent you from having to manipulate the chakra while it was inside of you, thus preventing the Tenro from activating. That's what I thought, but I underestimated the amount of time it will take for my seal to fully remove Tenro, but the reason I need your help is because I believe this is the time that Mui is going to strike and try to use your chakra inside of me to open his box. Now since I don't want to be taken out of the fight that will happen, I want to make a blood clone that will have the three tails of chakra from you it will need. Naruto admitted as he ran through the plan he had to go about tricking Mui and being able to fight for the box if the need arose, which he thought it would. Ayubi's crimson eyes glared so far forward that one would think that a volcano had just erupted and wiped out his home, but he remained silent, leaving Naruto to wait for an answer from his tenant. The nine-tailed fox just got his seventh tail fully, and having to lose three of his tails for good was a harsh task, but the fox wasn't an idiot. No, he knew fully well just how much of a problem that the Satori could be, should it have the time to do what it wanted, which in the end was the deciding factor. Fine, I'll do it. Thank you, but before we get to that I need to offset this seal. Naruto murmured mentally as he took his trench coat covered by the resistant feathers of Shikai, his boss summon, leaving his upper body bare, showing the Tenro seal which formed an X shape around his chest, with the actual seal being in the center of that shape. Taking that stone dagger in front of him the Uzumaki clan head sliced across his right palm, a wound that was not regenerated by the Kaiubi, since he knew it was necessary. Letting the blood drip from his fresh cut for a moment Naruto quickly turned his palm up, letting the pool gather in his hand before dabbing the fingertip of his pointer finger into the blood ink. Closing his eyes Naruto took a quick breath before his hand went about drawing out the seal with a certainty that showed hours upon hours of practice. His starting point was the space between his pectoral muscles, where he started to draw a rectangle across his chest with one section of the bottom line missing. But in that rectangular shape there was a seal drawn with a remarkable likeness to that of the 8 trigram seal that was layered on the seals of his sisters, aside from the fact that instead of having smooth lines the corners of it were sharp. After that was done he quickly made an identical box just below the seal on his stomach, aside from the fact that where the section missing was not below but on top. Dipping his finger back into the blood Naruto took the open spot in the first box and slowly started to create a rectangular path that turned left and right randomly down his body, before the rectangular, labyrinth-like path ended at the top of the Tenro seal between the extensions on the corners of Tenro. Once that was done he did the same from the top of the rectangle on his abdomen. 
he turned the path left and right, making sure that it went around the seal of the Kaiubi before it eventually connected to the bottom of the Tenro. The seal itself was finished. You may have a seal meant to stop the ordinary man, but I am an Uzumaki. We are seal innovators, and no mortal man or creature can match our chakra's strength. Naruto said with a wicked smirk as he wrote the matching symbol on his chest on both of his palms, just before he clapped his hands together and closed his eyes, hands laced together in front of his face. Uzumaki style seal. Blood seal. Seal negation. The red blood that dried atop of Naruto's chest glowed a faint orange before the color of the blood dropped into a deep black that filled the rectangle completely before that black pool of power started to drain out of the rectangles at the same pace as they traveled through the paths Naruto had drawn on his chest. Slowly the surge of black made its way towards the center of his chest, where the seal of the Tenro was located on his body. And finally that path of black hit the seal at the same time and began to swallow it, slowly purging it from Naruto's person starting right at its core. Okay step one is finished. Naruto muttered with a sigh before he reached his side and threw his trench coat back over his body, covering what was happening on his chest. And one more step to go. Are you ready for Kaiubi to give your chakra to the clone? My chakra will sustain its form, and yours will be its power. Naruto asked with a soft sigh as he cut himself open on the hand again, letting the blood form a pool on the floor in front of him. This works better for Naruto. His simple statement was all Naruto needed to hear to be informed that he was willing to go along with the plan which honestly was a rather important part of this whole thing working. The sentiment that the Kaiubi hoped for was a feeling mutually held by Naruto, who was looking at his reflection in the surface of blood. I do too because if not then this thing will just continue to get stronger and I doubt that anyone could stop it then. Naruto whispered before he started to focus his chakra which forced a burn to travel through his body, but Naruto shoved that pain down and made use of the chakra he gathered. Ninja Art. Blood Clone. The chakra quickly traveled down his leg as Naruto stomped a puddle kicking it into the air, but instead of falling to the floor with a splash, the chakra started to give it the shape of Naruto's body as the original fell to the ground gasping as the burning started to take place, but it was lessening with each passing second. Panting once the Kaiubi repaired the damage done to Naruto's body, the black-haired shinobi stood up and placed his palm on his clone's head and allowed for the Kaiubi to slowly channel his energy into the clone, slow enough so that the burst couldn't be felled, and when it was done he sat back down with a sigh, rubbing his brow, and now we wait. Naruto knew he had one more day left in solitary as it was called, so he had some time to burn, but he was sure that his plan to get them would work which involved him casting a quick subtle jinjutsu on the clone to make sure the seal appeared untampered with. A day and a half later, standing in front of an operating table down in the sub-basement beneath of Hazuki Castle, was Mui and a group of his contemporaries, each of which were wearing a mask, but despite the fact their faces were covered, it was clear that every person creating the tight circle was looking at the body that was stirred out on the operating table. It was a person that Mui had become rather acquainted with over the past few days in Naruto Che. Casting a slight shadow over the group was a strange wall with an even stranger face jutting out of the flat surface. In fact it wasn't just a wall, but an outer face of the box of ultimate bliss. How exactly did you manage to detain Naruto Ichiha without even getting a scratch or putting one on him? It was difficult to tell just what the gender of the person under the cloak and behind the mask because of the way it distorted the voice, but one thing that could not be mistaken was the amount of skepticism in that voice. From the way every other head turned to look at Mui, it seemed like a popular question that someone was waiting to voice. Mui didn't answer them immediately, instead he remained silent, staring down into the unconscious form of Naruto, before he sighed and looked at the one who asked the question with a flat stare. I sentenced him to three days in solitary confinement where he wasn't given a single meal during his stay. Without any kind of nourishment his body shut down. There was no need for me to even raise a hand when I could just outlast him in a battle he could not win. There were a few mumblings between the people gathered around the table, some believing that the tactic was actually quite clever, where there were a few more people that were more old school in their beliefs that it was rather cowardly of the warden. It matters not what the methods used were, all that matters is that we have what we need. Mui, release the seal so we can begin the process of opening the box. To Mui there was no need to acknowledge that obvious statement. This here was a moment he had been waiting decades for, the moment for him to reclaim his son and right one of, if not his greatest wrong. Walking four steps forward Mui stopped beside Naruto and pulled open his trench coat and stared down at the Tenro seal on his face with a frown. He kept that expression for a few moments before he let a smile filled with hope shine through. Closing his eyes and furrowing his brow the warden of the prison let his chakra go in one heavy burst as those around him attached a few bands and devices around Naruto that they needed to extract his chakra. 
The masked individual at the head of the table gave one last look over everything from the way Naruto's body was prepared to the machinery that everything was going to rely on one last time, before he gave the nod to pull the lever and start the process which the person at the lever did causing the lights on the machine to illuminate and alternate back and forth between available spaces before a hum started to resonate through the machines. Naruto's body convulsed upwards and into the restraints they had fastened around him to keep him in place, as the machinery went about starting to extract the latent chakra inside of Naruto's blood clone. It took the man-made technology a few more moments before it was able to pull out a vibrant cloak of orange that bubbled as it remained its structure around Naruto's body, with three flailing tails whipping out around him, nearly hitting a few masked members, which caused them to jump back to avoid being batted aside by the manifested chakra clinging to Naruto's body. What is the meaning of this? The muffled nature of the voice behind yet another one of the masked people did not help the fact that the voice sounded panicked at what they were seeing. The person had even fallen onto their back, leaving them to resort to looking up at the wildly flailing tails that cut through the air with enough force that the sound was audible. The H that's the power of the Kyubi no Yoko. Even Mui's usually steady voice was momentarily shaken before he smirked and watched as the orange unruly chakra slowly being sucked away from Naruto's unconscious body. It seemed he had stumbled upon the not-so-metaphorical jackpot in the form of Naruto Uchiha, because now he watched the machinery doing its work and transferring the energy into the box. With an expression nearing that of glee as he watched the orange chakra being sucked into the beak-like mouth on the box. There was a moment of nothing before the eyes on the face lit up and the box started to spin like a drill. Carving through the stone like a hot knife through butter without any further assistance, the box of ultimate shot up through the stone and foundation above it, maintaining the same spinning rotation as it fired upward towards the surface, causing the secretive group who wanted to open the box to shout urgings of urgency before they followed the box to finally get their wish of a true Kusagakur. In their rush to see their dreams finally coming true, they all failed to notice that Naruto's body had turned into nothing more than a puddle of blood that was dropping down the sides of the table and into the cracks on the stone floor down below the table. There was one thing for certain however, and that was the box of ultimate bliss had been officially opened, and the world in its entirety was now under threat by one of the greatest evils known to those even before the time of Shinobi. Back in the courtyard of the prison what could be seen happening was absolute chaos. From the moment that the box had made its presence known prisoners started to panic due to the fact that some of the earth below their feet became a sinkhole, and even on the top corner of the box, there was a body that had been impaled by a corner of the box, letting a series rivet of blood to flow down the face of the box right between the eyes. Screaming could be heard from those who weren't frozen in place, as some took this as a chance to fight the guards, who were equally astonished, to gain their freedom or at least the tools to better ensure the freedom they sought. This was the scene that Raizetsu, who was standing off to the side away from the chaos, watched with wide, fearful eyes. Not fear from the prisoners who were attempting to run roughshod over the place, but from the fact that the box of her nightmares stood there in the center of the pandemonium, which was enough to show a small microcosm of what could happen to the rest of the world if the box was not contained here and now in Hazuki Castle. That however was not the only obvious but clearly important revelation that she made, the other one being the fact that to open the box of ultimate bliss meant that Naruto had somehow fallen into the clutches of Mui and his group. Great. I told him that his plan was going to get people killed and better yet he isn't even in any position to help me wherever he is. Raizetsu hissed to herself in irritation as she watched Mui being shadowed by some cloaked masked individuals who all used a hectic environment to get to the box untouched and unnoticed. Knowing there was nothing she could do now, the white-haired Kinoichi contented herself with waiting until the moment was right. There it is. The box of ultimate bliss. My dreams and hopes have led up to this point, and here it is. The feeling is invigorating. Mui mumbled to himself as he could almost feel his blood running red with excitement. He didn't even care to mention the group that helped him get to this point, showing just how enthralled with the opportunity he had in front of him. Images. No more like flashes of his dreams filled his vision as he peered unafraid into the glowing eyes of the box that was told to grant dreams to those who opened it, namely Mui. From behind him the older, more power-hungry members of his group approached from behind him, mostly talking to themselves, but there was one person in particular who stepped right behind Mui and placed their hand on his shoulder, a smile on the old crinkled face behind the mask. It was a day of glee and a day of fruition, but perhaps most important of all it was a day meant for celebration. Go on Mui, go on and tell the box to restore Kusa to the previous glory that it was so we may take our rightful place in the world. Shrugging the hand on his shoulder off Mui walked forward towards the box with the utmost confidence in his posture. He even continued on as some of the ground around him gave way in places so frantic it didn't even have anything resembling a pattern. Once he was left in front of the box he looked up and merely brushed his long hair out of his face, waiting and ready to give the box his deepest desire, his wish. 
However before anyone could say anything more a voice that seemed like it was laced in the wind itself carried through the area, freezing many colds, as they all looked around for the voice, except for Mui. What is it that you want most of all? What is it you want to wish for? I want you to bring my son back to me. Bring Yuku back to me from death. The warden was quick with his demand causing everyone who was listening to what he said look at his back with eyes wide as possible. To his group of cohorts this request came out of left field, since it had been and always was clearly established that the goal of this undertaking was to make sure that their village came back to the glory and strength it once held. Rai Zetsu too held the firm expression of shock as her best friend's father wished for his resurrection, which left her filled with both hope and dread all at once. Ui what do you think you're doing? This isn't what we agreed on, to waste a wish on bringing back your boy who couldn't even bring the box to open in the first place. Have you lost your damn mind? The moment I lost my son was the moment that Kusa was lost to me for good. Now all I want is Muku back and that's what I'll get from this box. Mui stated matter-of-factly not even caring to hear the cursing come from his back. Before the mask group could even think of possibly retaliating on Mui for betraying them, there was something that caught everyone's attention, and that was that the light in the box's eyes faded before the wall facing the group fell to the ground with a loud, resounding thud. Despite that any number of eyes stopped what they were doing and turned to try and steal a glance of what was in the box, there seemed to be an impenetrable shadow that shrouded any light from filling the box and showing what was there in it. That was the way things remained for the following few minutes until finally the sound of footsteps broke the terse silence that settled in the immediate area. At first the sound of the walking was quiet and seemed to be miles away from those around the box, but a few moments later the steps echoing in the box got much closer. What came out of the box shocked those watching because instead of some earth-shaking presence, that no matter what had to be acknowledged out came a young man who looked no older than 15 maybe. His hair, well straight, went no further down his body than about halfway down the back and sides of his neck. His ordinary clothing was torn erratically, and on top of that he had dirty smudges rubbed along his pale flesh. This young man's name was Muku, son of Mui, and what no one seemed to be able to notice was the fact that his face was dead. Muku. My son. The amount of words was few, but the raw emotion coming from the father who was being reunited with his son was nearly infinite as he watched his boy continue to walk forward. Yuku had even made it a full five steps before Mui elated by seeing his son rushed forward and wrapped his son in a tight, welcoming embrace. His chin rested on Yuku's shoulder as a lone tear rolled from his tightly scrunched eyes, memories of the time with his wife and expected son, filling his once cold heart with a nearly forgotten kind of warmth. Father. Miku's voice was quiet, but at this moment in his life, it was the only thing that Mui could even think to hear. Lifting his arms after being still Mui, believed that his son may have finally snapped out of his days and was moving to return their long-awaited father-son moment, it was that belief that led him to drop his guard. Instead of responding with a hug Muku responded by driving his hand clean through his father's torso like a dagger. Gasping, Mui's eyes opened his eyes, alarmed and betrayed, as blood slowly started to leak from the left corner of his lips. He could already feel himself losing consciousness, his sight going bleary, and those calling his name from behind sounding like a million miles away. Opening his mouth Mui tried to ask why, but the only thing that came out was a wet cough that threw blood up on the ground over his son's shoulder. Your son was gone the moment you sacrificed him to me. With an amount of strength that none had been expecting from a young man of his stature, Muku lifted his arm taking music off of his feet before tossing his arm to the side, throwing the man responsible for his life callously to the side where he went skidding along the tiled roof, kicking up a path of destruction in his wake. Your son no longer exists in this world. He has been twisted. Corrupted by the influence of the inescapable prison that the box is. He is nothing more than a shadow of himself, an avatar to give my birth. To fuel the rise of the Satori. No longer was it the voice of any normal human coming out of the boy's body. Now the voice speaking seemed to be lashing out against anything within hearing distance, with a victorious kind of gloating that inspired a certain amount of dread to those around. Everything went quiet for a moment before abruptly out of his shoulder blades came forth a jutting, misformed pair of wings that were black and laced with feathers. It was enough to see that, but then his entire body went through grotesque transformation into the eyeless crudely shaped form of Satori, it was a transformation that caused a few nearby to lurch forward and empty their stomachs. The mouth and the center of the headless torso opened up just enough that dark vapor trails lingered out of its mouth and into the air, while Satori's body moved left to right as it scanned the area for a few moments before it stopped where it was looking originally, even though it didn't have a pair of eyes to see with. Hypersensitized by fear one of the individuals in the mask and shroud, realized that all was lost and moved to run for his life, but before he could make any meaningful progress, Satori had captured the runaway in his hand. Raising the terrified human to where its mouth was, Satori's mouth contorted into a menacing grin that could have terrified even the most seasoned shinobi. 
Not a word was needed on the behalf of the avatar of enlightenment to cause the fearful human's blood to run cold. All that was necessary was that terrifying aura that Satori produced in abundance. The man who was actually under that mask didn't even get a chance to beg before the Satori turned and literally threw him into the box, where his screams echoed out of akin to that of someone being thrown down a ravine. Revenge in this moment overpowered the paralysis induced by fear, as the man's fellow companions saw Reddit losing one of their own. Each individual let loose one of their battle cries, while bringing forth their own obscure weapons, each leaping at Satori foolishly. It was a mistake that proved nearly fatal as all the demonic creature needed to do was lash its arm out, sending a large blade-like wave of wind, and then cutting them all but not killing them. Their masks shattered and falling around them the beast didn't even allow them to fall to the ground as it went around them and sent a flap of its wings at them. The powerful gust being more than enough to send their collective bodies spiraling into the box. Yuku, what are you doing? Stop Yuku. Raizetsu shouted, asking desperately just what was going through her best friend's mind, she even cupped her hands around her mouth to try and make her voice louder. Right now where everyone saw a monster of absolute chaos, the white-haired woman saw her best friend who she was determined to get back. She was about ready to run towards Satori when an arm in front of her stopped her, before she could even take so much as a step forward. The arm belonged to Meroi, a supposed agent of Mui. Listen, I don't know who you think that is, but that's not who he is anymore. If you rush out there and try to talk sense into him you're liable to end up like those elders who thought that rushing Satori was a good idea. Meroi told her the harsh truth while watching as the monster quartered a group of fearful prisoners who stood no chance as it brutalized them to a state of near death, only for them to be piled up and tossed into the box, further fueling the evil lingering in that box. Raizetsu who was watching the same thing play out with a detached expression, turned to Meroi and gave him the deadliest glare that her eyes could manage. Even if she knew the dangers of Satori, and she did, that didn't mean she couldn't try and help her old friend, she couldn't forsake him because of fear. What else can I do? I can sit back and do nothing while he needs my help. She shouted passionately at him, her face crunching further into the glare that was already there on her face. Unfortunately. The only thing that's left to do is destroy the monster that is Satori. Meroi muttered before he stepped out of the underhang and lifted his hand into the air towards the bleary sky above. It was almost an immediate transition from the warmth near the buildings to the whipping, hash cool air that lashed against his bare chest, but that wouldn't distract him from performing his task. Raiden. Denko Narashi. Lightning release. Lightning signal fire. Satori stopped its collecting when the blast of lightning shot from ground level high into sky, ripping through the thin layer of cloud cover, the constant stream of lightning acting as a beacon, causing the monster to tilt its upper body back as it stared high into the sky, wondering just what was going on at least, that was until it noticed a massive shadow coming down on top of it. Not one to stay still and allow itself to be crushed, Satori effortlessly glided off to the left, just as out of the sky fell the eight-tailed ox, whose wide eyes peered right into the face of Satori, just as a small squadron of cloud shinobi fell in behind him. The group of shinobi consisted of the Jounins. Derui, Shai, Samui and Yujito well behind them were the Chunins. Amoy, Kerry, and a recently promoted Nabui, sister of the Rakage's assistant who wanted more than a desk job. Meroi smiled seeing his friends, but he knew so long that the Tenro seal was still in play, that he wouldn't be able to do much more than watch their plot to destroy the box, finally come to fruition. Yo, yo monster man your breath stinks, really wants to knock me to the brink. The poorly crafted rap came from the mouth of the Hachibi, which was the signal to show that it was in fact Killer B, who was in control of this complete transformation. But the only person who visibly broke from the serious stare that was being sent the enlightened being's way was from Jaiwuki back inside of B's mindscape, but for the sake of the situation he remained silent so that B could focus. B continued to stare at the beast expecting some kind of response, but when it was clear he wouldn't be getting one he readied for combat. Closing the distance between the two B was quick to throw a left-right combination of fists that considering the size he was came at a rather quick, abrupt pace, but it proved ineffective against Satori as it simply gilded right, then left countering the strikes and not letting them even come close to making contact. Seeing that his melee attacks were not doing the trick and knowing that against an opponent like this that time was not his ally B tried using his tails, using four of them as staggered whips that he tried to use against Satori, but again and again whether it was moving to the side, ducking or kicking into the air the creature from the box of ultimate bliss was able to dodge his attacks with ease. For the first time in ages the man who was considered the second strongest cloud shinobi if not the first felt irritation building up in him as he could not hit his opponent, a feeling he had not experienced since he was a young child. Growling slightly B overextended a wild punch that Satori slid underneath, allowing for it to shoulder ram B into a prison building, causing the structure to start and fall on top of him. Seeing the frontline offensive down for the moment Samui and Derry shared a quick nod before they stepped up near each other, hands forming the same signs before they pointed their hands at Satori's direction. 
Ranton. Riaza Sakasu. Storm release. Laser circus. From both of their hands shot out a grid of bright laser beams that fired off in random directions, crossing left, right and sideways, before the numerous amounts of blinding beams converged on the same point, creating a small explosion of dirt and dust. Slowly Samui and Derui let their hands and arms fall into a more neutral position, while Kerry pumped her fist from behind them. See that thing wasn't so tough. Samui and Derui were able to take care of it just like that. No, Kerry we weren't quite that lucky. Came the calming and tense voice of Yujito from behind her, who had grown over the past few years, it had taken for her to master control of her biju. Before where she was a bit shy she was now much more confident after getting a few accomplishments under her belt. Perry, who didn't quite understand what she meant, turned towards Yujito with a confused look on her face. That was until she was motioned to turn around where she found that Satori was descending back towards the ground unscathed. Flicking her tongue against her teeth, Yujito turned her head to the side, causing her ponytail to follow up behind her, her slitted blue eyes leveled on Shai. A young Jounin with blonde hair and pale skin. He was a Jounin and sensory medic nin. Shai what did you sense? Did that thing teleport or something? It was the only thing that made sense to her. After all, how often did anyone avoid a tangled web of high-speed laser beams being fired around them without so much as a single mark on the flesh? Shai who was silently absorbing the battle through his sensory capabilities, opened his eyes to respond to the two tails Jinchuriki. Shaking his head, the young man released a breath he had been holding during the short skirmish between his fellow Jounin and the Yakai creature. No, it wasn't any kind of teleportation. It dodged every single attack. The creature shows a surprising amount of agility considering how fragile its spine seems to be. I'm not sure how but that's what happened. Barry sighed and let his hand reach back to take the massive sword he carried around off, just in case the need arose. Rubbing his palm at his forehead at the front line of his white hair, Derry shot Shy a glance from over his shoulder. Shy. Find a way to cut him off from the rest of the world so we can hit him. Got it. Barry asked with a serious look on his usually aloof face, causing Shy to truly realize just what kind of danger they were in. He had been on missions before with Derry where he never looked any more serious than that of a sleeping man or woman. Shai nodded his head understanding what was needed of him, but he knew his limitations were, and the fact that the monster was currently lifting one of its clawed hands up, probably intending on bringing it down on their positions. Uh. Alright but I am going to need some time, time he doesn't want to give us. Shai shouted so that his voice could reach everyone as he pointed to what Derry had not seen looking back at him. Don't worry Shai, just focus on getting you ready. Yujito commanded as she ran ahead of Shai, Amoy, and Kerry, but behind Derry and Samui, performing hand seals as her eyes refused to leave Satori's falling claw. Rearing her torso and head back, Yujito called forth her fire affinity and channeled it through her lungs and throat before her mouth opened. Katen. Nizumi Kadama. High release. Mouse hairball. Launched from her mouth came a trio of shadowy, mouse-shaped projectiles surrounded in a shroud of blue flames that were unique to the Jinchuriki of the two-tailed monster cat. Aiming for the claw her attacks forced the demon to recall his hand lest it allowed for her attacks to burn and possibly set its hand on fire. Its flimsy legs tensed before it shot itself into the air, just as one of B's tails tried to loop around its waist, but with the creature taking to the air, his attempted sneak attack failed. Snarling slightly, the head of the Ushioni tilted upward, staring down the Satori as it hovered high above B and the eight tails, its wings pointing downward to the ground B was occupying. It flapped its wings a few times, sending a hail of feathers towards B, the quill tips cutting through the air like hundreds of miniature daggers, honing in on that exact location. Not wanting to be turned into a pincushion the brother of the rakage lifted his arms and used the iron hide of the eight tails to deflect the feathers with his forearms, sending the projectiles scattering off harmless. No longer taking the defensive stance in this fight, the Satori dive-bombed B's position and skewed the talons on the ends of its feet in B's guard, penetrating the hide and drawing blood, causing B to grunt through the manifestation of the eight tails. Hissing slightly B put all his energy into throwing the Satori off of him, causing the creature's claws to rip further along his flesh, before it was sent sailing back towards the very box that it had emerged from, but instead of colliding with the box of myth, the demon gracefully righted itself before perching atop the box, its body positioned to face the group of shinobi, leaving B facing its back, the end result being Satori coming out victorious on this exchange. Majin. Ringoku Shitsu. Demonic Illusion. Purgatory Chamber. Shai shouted as he expelled all the chakra he could manage to try and trap the beast in what seemed to be an endless chamber of white. This was a technique much like the bringer of darkness, only it had the added effect of leaving the target floating and tumbling, disorienting them, as well as isolating the target. But where the technique was the most adverse was in the amount of chakra it took for Shai to use, often leaving him out of the fight for a good bit after this. Th there, it's done. He panted out with a heavy sigh. That's our cue. 
Come on Amoy, we have to get those wings while we have the chance. Kerui called out getting a right from the lowly pop-eating swordsman before both drew their finely crafted blades and charged right for the beast on the box. The closer the two got the more confident they were that this was the time that a blow was finally landed on Satori. Dandling chakra into the soles of their feet, both launched themselves at the creature in tandem with lightning chakra surging through their swords, ready to render its wings useless. Stabbing forward Carrie's amber eyes drilled holes into the creature's headless body before she and Amoy lunged forward. Eat this. The static-covered tips of their blades were mere inches away from the body of the creature before the yakai did something none of them expected and laughed. It was a hollow chill, creating laugh that made the two tune in freeze for a moment just before the Satori lashed out with its wings, creating a violent surge of wind that threw the airborne shinobi backwards violently. Luckily for Kerry, Yujito was following behind them and managed to catch her sending both Kinoichi sliding backwards, but Amoy wasn't as lucky and collided harshly with a column nearby that knocked both his breath and some blood out of his mouth. Pasting his blood around the candy that was in his mouth, Amoy groaned and spat out the candy so he could focus more on his breathing. Grunting, his body protested, but despite that Amoy used his sword to prop himself back up to a somewhat ready position, just as Shire ran over to him to make sure that the younger shinobi was alright. So it looks like Jinjutsu won't work on that thing huh? Amoy asked as he wrote his mouth of the last lingering taste of blood in his mouth. Now be. Derui shouted from where he was crouched on top of one the eight tails tails. Nodding B started to spin slowly before he threw the tail Derry was perched on top of, sending the right-hand man of the rakage high into the air behind the Satori, who was staring down the assembled group of cloud ninja who were in front of it. Of course the shinobi group saw Derry going upwards and held their ground waiting for the eventual descent, taking the role of decoy. It wasn't even an entire minute later when Derry came crashing down with a spinning blow aimed towards the center of Satori's body. But just like every other time they launched an attack Satori simply moved out of the way and perched itself on top of one of the castle's walls, just as Derry's blade came slashing down hitting against the box, but the momentum that came to an abrupt and completely caused Derry's blade to fly back, ripping it from his grip and sending the blade off to the side, leaving a frowning Derry who was rubbing at his wrists, sore from the sudden jostling. Samui who was watching all this happen while standing guard over Shai and Amoy while a medical check was insisted on by Shai frowned, seeing yet another failed multi-prong attempt have no success whatsoever. This is really not cool. She muttered marching over to where Derry's blade fell, picking it up with the aid of her chakra, and tossed it back to the man getting a quick thank you. Follow my lead, go in with speed. Be advised before he rushed forward with his tails following in first all eight of which were directed in stabbing forth at eight different angles. Normally he'd come up with some kind of plan with the Hachibi's guidance, but even the eight-tailed Biju was stunned and unsure of what to do against the Satori, who showed the ability to evade and pierce his ironhide, should it actually try to do so. Again however the demon creature glided in and out of each attack, leaving the tails of the eight tails to puncture through the walls of another building, but when B tried to pull his tails out of it, he found that each and every one of them were stuck in place. Floating back down into place behind B, Satori's misplaced mouth twisted into a sickening grin before it lifted its talons outward, so they were aimed directly at the back of an immobilized cloud Jinchuriki. Lunging forward both Satori and B disappeared as Satori drove them both back into the building, causing the rubble to collapse inward in a massive pile of destruction that swallowed both titans in size, leaving the battlefield to fall into an eerie silence that was only occasionally broken by a fierce gale blowing by. The sensei Kerry screamed, the worry evident in her voice after watching her sensei disappear from sight alone with that monster that should only be seen in nightmares. Being one of his three students it was only natural that Kerry believed that Killer B was even stronger than their rakage, which made the fact that he was being handled so easily by the Satori all the more jarring. It was a sentiment shared by Amoy, Yujito and Samui, each of whom had been trained by the Eight Tails Jinchuriki. There was a slight shuffle within the confines of the rubble pile that brought a glimmer of hope to the younger shinobi hoping, almost expecting to see the guardian of Kumagakur to emerge victorious like he had always done. However that hope was dashed once that same cruel laughter that brought goosebumps to even Derry's skin echoed out across the courtyard as Satori emerged once more without a scratch two talonfuls of people in its grip. The face on the yakai curled into a smirk as it threw even more prisoners into the box that Derry was standing on, unable to do anything about it. Yes, your fear tastes excellent, but I am tired of your constant opposition. I must destroy you. Satori mumbled out, its voice hollow and a near shriek that caused an involuntary shiver to travel down the spines of those who were around to listen. Moving on towards his box, Satori forced Derry to leap down and join his fellow shinobi. The sound of Satori's claws hitting against the metal below it was still fresh when the remaining closed walls of the box opened up and started to form a strong force of suction, causing the number of bodies that had been strewn about unconscious throughout the fight to be sucked into the box. 
Distracted by the number of bodies flying through the air, the Cloud Shinobi all recognized that there was a sudden build in demonic energy coming off of the Satori who had opened its mouth and started to emanate a faint red glow from its mouth, leaving the Shinobi a bit uneasy. Vegito who was in the middle of the group was the first to piece this together with Satori's only statement which in turn had her first to act. Leaping in front of her allies, Yujito made contact with the Nibi. Nibi, we have to go with that. It's the only shot we have against this thing. I hear what you're saying kitten, but we're not even sure what the capabilities of that are yet and one thing for sure is that whatever ugly over there is doing is that it won't be something to take lightly. The two tails countered back with her own warning, not wanting to see her container being hurt when she possibly could avoid it by talking some sense into her and in doing so, hopefully deterring her from being the first line of defense. It's the only thing that has a chance at saving us. We have to do this. Yujito implored of her tenant getting a defeated sigh from the monster cat before the Biju relented and decided to go with her container's plan. The moment she and Nibi were ready to do what must be done, Satori suddenly turned to the left before its entire body went stiff and it hurriedly rocketed up high into the sky above the prison. Then just a moment later a mass of black flames went racing across the space that Satori was just occupying and straight into one of the walls off to the side, the flames sticking to the wall and burning in place. Wait is that? Shai asked, feeling much more on edge now that he recognized what he was looking at was the legendary black flames of Amaterasu, which were said to burn for seven days and seven nights. It was also the calling card of Itachi Ichiha who personally none of the Cloud Shinobi wanted to see right now. An S-rank missing Nin along with a creature they couldn't even scratch, well the odds were by no means in their favor right now. Damn, I missed it. To the shock of those shinobi who were at the Chunin exams back at Kanoha a few years ago, the person that suddenly appeared standing in front of Yujito was a shinobi with black hair, but what really revealed who it was to Yujito was the sense she got from him, Naruto. She whispered looking at him, shocked to see him again, and shocked to see him here of all places. Hearing his name the young man turned his head, letting Yujito see the new pattern of his Sharingan, the Manjikum pattern of his eyes zoning in on Yujito, catching her staring into the center of the bladed flower design of his eyes. Staring into the blue slitted eyes of his fellow Jinchuriki Naruto's face, showed a moment of surprise, seeing a whole group of cloud ninja standing behind him, most of them faces he knew on some kind of level. He just assumed that it was Killer B fighting the monster, since their presences kind of outreached all the others, but it looks like he was wrong. Huh, so it's you guys keeping that ugly thing busy. Naruto mumbled just loud enough for Yujito to hear, causing her to nod slightly. The blonde woman was just about to reply when the flow of blood running from the bottom of Naruto's eye like they were red tears suddenly came flowing down the side of his face to his jawline. Groaning silently, Naruto resisted the urge to grab the side of his face in front of all these shinobi and kinoichi from the Land of Lightning. Ha. Huh. So this is what it feels like to make use of the Manjekyo Sharingan outside of Kurahane Forest. Gee good to know. The blood suddenly coming out of Naruto's tear ducts caught Yujito aware, and her first instinct was to ask if Naruto was alright, because after all back in the Chunin exams he did save her, and that debt had yet to be repaid, but then Yujito suddenly remembered just what Keke Genkai she was dealing with and averted her eyes. Naruto who was watching her chuckled softly and turned his gaze away from her, wiping the blood off his face, but smearing some of it in doing so. No need to worry, we have the same enemy here. Then on cue Satori came fluttering back down landing back on the box, giving the wall that was slowly burning away a passing glance, before focusing back in on Naruto in particular. After a moment of silence regarding the new combatant Satori's mouth stretched out with another of its sick, nightmare-inducing grins. I almost didn't see you coming because of all this fear in front of me but yours. Your fear is something completely different. You aren't afraid of me like them are you? Naruto skillfully ignored the taunting of the beast, directing his attention to the assortment of Cloud Shinobi without ever taking his eyes off of Satori. They had been battling the beast firsthand, perhaps they had some kind of intel on it that he couldn't get or didn't get in his preparation to come to Kusagakur. Did any of you notice any weaknesses in the Satori while well, you have been fighting him for however long that you were, because that kind of information would be wonderful right now? Naruto asked to remain perfectly calm despite the situation he threw himself into. Eri who had been standing in the back after his latest, failed attack, was able to see the respect on the faces of Amoy, Kari and even Samui, and figured that if Yujito was more than willing to be that close to an Ichiha, then it would be for the best to work with him this time. Sighing, the dark-skinned man walked up to stand on the other side of Naruto, a hand being run through his shaggy white hair. Unfortunately that chink in the armor that you are looking for isn't there. It has shown the ability to dodge all of our attacks, even ones as fast as a laser. He saw the back of Naruto's head bob, subtly showing the raven-haired shinobi hailing from the land of fire was listening to him. Placing his cleaver-like blade on his back once more Derry figured that a close-quarters combat scenario wouldn't work too well for him if B was struggling with it. 
As he went about addressing the situation Derry's eyes focused on the side of Naruto's head for a moment. We may be working together right now at Chesan, but the Rakage will still need to know about your new Sharingan, and I'll tell him. Meanwhile as Derry thought about doing his job like any dutiful shinobi of the militarized hidden cloud would, Naruto too was in his own thoughts about that little revelation, not a single scratch, that complicated things. Okay apparently this thing has some ridiculous dodging abilities, which means I probably should use a Matarasu anymore, or at least until a hit is guaranteed, the strain is just too much to use with impunity. Looks like we're going to have to do this with classic everyday ninjutsu then. Knowing he could use a shadow clone to do it, but figuring that it would be for the best if he saved as much chakra as possible even being an Uzumaki. Going through the necessary hand signs Naruto turned his head towards Yujito, letting his man Jekyo Sharingan fade back into the normal three Tomo Sharingan. You pack the firepower and I'll bring the wind. If we can't hit this abnormality with precision, let's cast a wide net and see what we catch. Waiting for Yujito to engage him Naruto halted the pace of his hand signs, making use of his Sharingan to perfectly time his to mesh perfectly with Yujito's. Futen. Tatapa. Wind release. Great breakthrough Katen. Nizumi Kadama. Fire release. Mouse hairball. Upon the call in tandem a strong squall of wind rushed through the courtyard, throwing any loosely put down clothing up just in time for a spray of blue mouse-shaped fireballs, hit the strong wind, taking advantage of the elemental relationship, creating a spread net of flame that rushed Satori's way. Despite how effectively the two blondes moved in combination, Satori was three steps ahead, already positioning itself behind the box using the durable, indestructible nature of the box to shield itself from the wave of blue fire coming its way. Satori waited until the immense heat it felt all around subsided before it came out from behind the box, but found as it came up there was a wave of Naruto's all glaring at it with their Sharingan spinning, but immediately they all dispelled leaving a screen of smoke clouding around the Demon of Enlightenment. Now. Right on cue the combination of Samui, Amoi, and Karui stood at the forefront, with the white-haired and red-haired sword wielders, holding the same combination of hand seals, as Naruto manipulated the smoke with his wind, to give them a minuscule section of the beast's black flesh, to aim at which was all that they needed, as they took aim with their Rirugan. Lightning release. Railgun. From the sights they made with their fingers, the pair fired two blasts of concentrated lightning surrounded by static, just as Samui finished her hand signs. Branton. Riaza Sakasu. Storm release. Laser circus. Following slightly staggered behind the railgun blasts from her comrades, Samui knew that it would only take a few moments for the speed of her to have her technique race past the first two, but even as she watched her soar past Amoy and Kerry, she could see that Satori was no longer there was the trio of lightning-infused attacks went sailing through the smoke. Not cool. The cool, blonde beauty muttered brushing a lock of her short blonde hair behind her ear. B who jumped back into the fight, positioned himself behind the demon and brought down another one of his tentacle tails, trying to lash across the monster from the box, but just like every other attack that was thrown its way the monster swerved out of the way, but this time instead of engaging the perfect Jinchuriki Satori glided over the wall and gathered up another gaggle of prisoners which was what Naruto stumbled upon watching until the raven-haired Yuzumaki clan head heard a familiar voice shout out. I am not afraid of you Yuku, but what are you doing? Snap out of it will you? Naruto watched from the wall he was perched on top of as Raizetsu fearlessly ran towards the talon claws of the Satori, who actually looked taken aback as it staggered backwards, even dropping one of the nearly dead prisoners, as it stumbled back actually looking to Naruto's eyes that it hadn't seen Raizetsu coming which infused Naruto considering that the beast had seen everything up until now. The hair on the back of Naruto's neck stood on edge when he watched a beast toss the bodies over his head back towards the suction force of the box and turned its body Naruto's way, looking perhaps more furious than it had before which Naruto felt and could only shake his head, hoping against hope that it would in some way dissuade the Satori, but when its crooked mouth twisted horribly he could only sigh. Oh crap. Premonition or not, Naruto's concern was well founded because harsher than it had before Satori started to violently flap its wings, causing the wind to cut at Naruto's bare knuckles, face and ankles, before the squall threw the shinobi from the wall and out of the courtyard of the prison, all the way into a field over 200 yards away. Groaning as his body finally came to a stop sliding and bouncing off of the ground. Naruto spit out a mouthful of blood that came from hitting against a number of rocks and other objects on the ground, grimacing in pain. Running his tongue along his bottom lip, licking and lapping up a sanguine-tasting glob of red liquid Naruto groaned and tried to sit up only to hiss in pain at the number of stinging places on his body, the friction burning and cutting his skin. He could already feel Kaiubi's presence healing up the damage done, though it had to be done carefully with the amount of energy the Nine Tails had lost to fuel the blood clone from earlier. Hey Kaiubi. Do you have anything about this thing that I can use? 
There were a few moments of silence while Naruto waited for his answer, where the only thing that he could hear was the whistle of the wind blowing across the field of grass, filled his ears, before the gruff sound of the demon in his gut came from the back of his mind. Not anything of note, no. All I remember about the Avatar of Enlightenment was that it was not something that should ever be let loose, or it will grow and grow in strength, infinitely. That's reassuring. Naruto mumbled sarcastically as his eyes narrowed when he realized that there was a shadow covering his body, and it was getting larger, meaning that it was getting closer. Really? You followed me all the way out here? Naruto complained as he finally managed to get himself into a sitting position, as Satori hovered a few feet in the air above Naruto, with its mouth open, and a red glow emanating from its maw, the same red glow Naruto had interrupted the first time. You're not afraid of dying boy, not like most. No, you're afraid that your past will repeat itself. That because of weakness you will be vulnerable and alone, betrayed by all you know. That's what makes you tremble, what makes you afraid. Loneliness.how the beast could speak with its mouth open was beyond Naruto, but that wasn't what was on his mind. It was what Satori said that made the raven-haired Ichiha glare at his opponent through the red eyes of his bloodline limit. Naruto did not need to see the full results of the attack to know that whatever this attack was, was not something that he wanted to take directly without any kind of defense. Channeling more chakra into his eyes Naruto Sharingan evolved back into its Manjekyo state. Susanoo. Whispering the name of his protection entity Naruto was quickly covered in a bright flash of white, a vibrant glow so bright it even swallowed the red glow. Once that glow finally subsided a white skeletal torso covered Naruto's body, fur draping off its shoulders like that of a tribal warrior. From beneath the head of the bear thrown over its cull, the amber eyes of the Susanoo glared vehemently at Satori as its attack formed into a dangerously glowing red sphere. Lifting its hands the guardian deity turned its palms outward shielding its body and consequently Naruto's body from the incoming blast that Satori had just shot from its open gullet. The red energy dropped like a rock and collided with the hands of Susanoo and for a few uncomfortably tense moments for Naruto, he watched a back and forth, give and take for ground between his defense and Satori's offense. However before any conclusive winner could be determined the demonic sphere suddenly exploded casting the entire 100-yard radius around Satori and Naruto in a dome of red energy that expanded high into the sky. Looking up from where she was in the prison, Ryuizetsu saw the red dome of violent destructive energy rise high into the air, bathing the immediate area in an eerie red glow. She was snapped out of her reverie when she noted that the one coming from that direction was Satori soaring through the cloudy, dreary sky. Glaring heatedly at the monster that she associated with taking her best friend, Raizetsu slammed her hands together and called on her chakra, ignoring the burning sensation in the moment of adrenaline. Pain. Onidoro. Fire release. Demon lantern. Slowly out of the very air itself, handfuls of strange flaming orbs started to materialize, and out of those fiery orbs disturbing faces with glowing yellow eyes started to form. Raizetsu looked at the ten lanterns with a bit of disappointment with the amount of damage the seal did to her ability to perform a simple ninjutsu. However, ignoring her own shortcomings, the white-haired Kusa Kanoichi sent forth her horde of lanterns at the aerial yakai. About seven of the attacks were off due to trajectory, but the three that collided with the back of Satori caused the beast to screech in pain as its body was burnt, causing its landing to end a bit clumsily. Ah! She screamed out her agony as she felt a fire suddenly build around her body, the consequence of making use of a ninjutsu technique, accessing her chakra with a tenro seal still placed on her body, but luckily for the white-haired Kinoichi Maroi was there to put out the fire and take her to the roof of one of the buildings where they'd be safe from Satori, who now looked to be even more ferocious than before upon being hit. Meanwhile a few courtyards away the Kumo contingent surrounded the box of ultimate bliss, trying to decide what to do. What if we try to break this box? Since the monster came out of this thing maybe getting rid of it gets rid of the monster as well. That suggestion came from Amway who with his sucker in his mouth gave a cautious look at the box that was opened. The suction of the box having come to a halt after Satori left the area was the only reason that the shinobi from Kumagakur were even able to get as close as they were currently. Shai who was standing between Amoy and Derry, sighed and ran his hand along his forehead, causing his knuckles to shuffle through his pale, blonde hair for a moment before he turned his head to Derry and B, who had gone back to his normal state, before shrugging. It sounds like a good idea to me. We haven't been able to even scratch that thing, so why not break the box? HMH, well all this would take is a tailed beast bomb, and I'll put that ugly thing into a tomb. B said, nodding his head along and ignoring the fact that those words didn't even rhyme when put together. If destruction was needed then he was more than sure that his strongest attack would get the job done, which meant that he could go back home and hold a concert for all of his adoring fans. Thankfully for everyone around that the Eight Tails was always around to keep B somewhat on a leash when the wreckage was not able to subdue his younger brother with his iron claw. B you idiot. We can't use the Bijadama here, or are you forgetting the fact that this prison is still needed to keep all this come in afterwards? 
if you use the tailed beast bomb then this whole place is going to get leveled. Oh. That's right yo, I guess that's a no-go. He mumbled to himself, reaching up and scratching his chin, seemingly having gone back into deep thought as to how this seemingly impossible task could be completed. This left Jayuki to wonder just how he got stuck with such an air-headed container to begin with. He stood there contemplated for another few minutes before he snapped his fingers and pulled Derry away from the crowd. Yujido and Samui who were watching the two go on shared a look before Samui sighed and Yujido shook her head slowly. Placing her hands on her hips, Yujido gave her fellow Cloud Jinchuriki an exasperated stare before she too sighed upon seeing Derry shrug and release the sword that was kept on his back, meaning that he ended up agreeing with B. Well this should be good. But one mighty hurlai shall fly, the mighty killer be up in the sky oh so high. Yeah. He shouted with a thumbs up directed towards Derry who nodded and sent his sword slashing upward while focusing Chakra into his arms to make the action faster and more powerful. B, who was standing on the flat side of the blade, also used some Chakra to jump at the apex of the swing, using the momentum of Derry's upward slash to send him even further into the sky above. When he reached the top of his ascent into the clouds, B curled his body into a spherical shape, letting his shape rotate a few times before he uncurled facing downwards. Catching a glance of the box through the cloud cover, B drew his hand back as it went through the transformation of his human hand to that of the massive mitt that belonged to Jayuki, the Eight Tails. Leaving that fist at the forefront B gave out one last shout before he began spinning, letting his transformed fist point downward like a spiraling lance making a stab straight for its destination. He cut through the air like a knife slamming right down on the box with a hallowing crunch, hitting top of the box so hard that the ground beneath the box gave way that much more that it sank down into the earth, leaving it unlevel with the surface. There were even visible rings rippling around from where B's fist was connected with the top of the box. B himself was staring at the box from behind his glasses, glaring tightly at it. He personally couldn't believe that it didn't even dent so much as a bit. Barry who felt it necessary to give her mentor some support, seeing that his plan failed quite miserably took a breath and brought her hands up to her mouth, ready to give some loud cheering that he seemed to love if his numerous concerts were any indication, but before she could even say one word there was a loud screeching sound that most certainly did not come from her. Hakaka. 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 That was the sound that continued to screech out causing Yujito to cover her ears and cringe as her sensitive hearing brought her one huluva headache as it continued to ring in her inner ear. The pain was enough that for sure she thought it would make her ears bleed, causing the feline like Kinoichi to hiss painfully. As someone please make that sound stop. She screamed, part wanting and having to voice her pain, part having to yell over the shrieking and the final part her having her ears covered by her hands. Samui who was standing next to her just finished picking at her ear, checking for that same blood that Yujito was worried about, turned her concern to Yujito who she started to rub on the back, fully aware of her acute sense of hearing. We would but it's actually coming from inside of the box of ultimate bliss. She said with a deepening frown as she turned her gaze to said open box that seemed to be acting like an amp for those horrible sounds. I have a bad feeling about this. Amoy mumbled around his sucker as he pulled out his sword, wrapping both hands around the hilt and keeping it pointed out in front of him, nervous and not wanting to be caught off guard by this box. Ever since they had arrived this box had been nothing but trouble, a truly bad omen, and Amoy was not about to convince himself to start thinking that everything was alright now. Then just as Amoy said that the constant almost monotone chant that had been coming out of the box suddenly stopped leaving the space around it to fall completely silent, not even the wind was willing to blow in this moment. Every shinobi there suddenly felt even more tense than they had when the constant chanting was going on. Well everyone aside from Kerry who moved next to Amoy and punched him in the arm, causing his sword to dip a bit before he righted himself. Ah, my ass is feeling bad. I should have known you were just being a big baby, especially considering that you say that same damn thing every time that we go on a mission, even when we were forbidden from taking anything more than D ranks. Seriously Amoy, you really need to grow a spine, or else you will never be able to find a strong capable woman much like myself. The more that she went on demeaning Amoy, and in the most friendly way, while promoting herself she slowly moved so that she was standing in front of Amoy and leaving her back to face the box much to one's dismay. No, seriously Amoy think about the future. How are you going to do anything if all you do is complain and worry about what might happen to you? It's a wonder that you even made Chunin. When the redeed that was ripping into her friend saw his eyes widen. She thought that perhaps she finally managed to break through to him, causing a victorious smirk to break across her features. He lifted his hand like he wanted to say something, but she shut him down by putting a hand on his shoulder shaking her head. Now there is no need to thank me. I'm just looking out for you like any good friend. Screw this. 
Amoy said with an uncharacteristic amount of annoyance in his voice as he placed his hands firmly on her shoulders and turned his teammate around to face the box, letting her see something that caused her amber eyes to expand quite the same as Amoy did just moments ago, and the reason for that. The reason was that she was seeing a horde of creatures marching out of the side of the box that she and the rest of the Cloud Squadron was facing. Each of these creatures looked the same in the way that they had a black humanoid torso on top of the lower half of a snake. Their arms were abnormally long, and they were topped off with long claw-like fingers on each hand, much like the Satori itself. But what caught her eye the most was their heads, because while they had the black outline of a skull, there was nothing there in the face, it was an empty void that allowed them to see the back of that black outline, almost like it had been forgotten. W what are those? Kerry mumbled with a bit of a quiver in her legs, as she and Amoy instinctively moved back to back much like Samui and Yujito had done as the horde of Hanta, hunters, slowly started to surround them in a complete circle, separating the pair of Yujito and Samui from Amoy and Kerry. Who cares? We have to fight. Derry shouted over the sound of the Hanta surrounding him. He had to spin on his feet holding his blade out like a third arm, bisecting the monsters that had surrounded him, so that he may be back to back to back with Shai and B. But Naruto, the red light that had swallowed up the space around the prison field, had finally faded, and with it Naruto's eyes opened, sitting up and groaning, as he made it to a seated position his Susanoo which was still clad to him, didn't even seem phased by what was just unleashed upon it. I'm glad that the attack didn't seem to fully reach me. That's not an attack I want to test my Susanoo with unless I have to. Suddenly his eyes widened and Naruto fell forward catching himself on his hands and knees, he started to throw up blood. Taking a moment to recompose himself after the retching that his insides went through during his brief spar with that pain, Naruto sat back on his legs and rubbed his mouth with the back of his hand, cleaning the blood away. Note to self, using the Susanoo outside of Kurahane forest hurts, the kind of hurt that reaches every cell inside of my body. Sighing under his breath Naruto cut the chakra to his eyes, letting the Sharingan fade completely in hopes that the throbbing behind his eyes would go away. Placing his hand on the top of his thigh just in front of the kneecap, the Achiha slowly started to stand up, wobbling a bit from the exertion that came from having to call upon the Susanoo. After a few moments of panting Naruto managed to stand upright without any kind of struggle, his blue eyes narrowing off in the distance, when he noticed the large body of Satori was hit by some kind of fire release. Alright so it looks like I need to practice using these moves out of the environment of Kurahane. But doing so will harm my vision. Damn, what a problem. The sound of a screech off in the distance was what knocked Naruto out of his own irritation, locking his knees Naruto settled into a crouched position, just as his chakra flared. In that same moment the wind suddenly started to howl as they wrapped themselves around Naruto's body. The wind started to intensify and even change color into a light green from the usual clear transparency that came to be associated with wind. It was there but just never visible, till now. He hadn't been spending all of his time working on the Sharingan, his other skills had been polished just as much if not more. Fujin no Yoroi. Armor of the Wind God. Naruto's sharp blue eyes focused themselves onto the highest building there in the prison, before he sucked in a deep breath and lunged forward into the air, but instead of falling through the sky, Naruto dug his foot into midair. He used it for a holding before he shot off of nothing elevating higher into the air, as he literally crossed through the sky to get to his chosen point of arrival. Fujin no Yoroi. Tengoku Po, Armor of the Wind God. Heaven steps, each time that Naruto's foot came down the sound of the wind and air itself splitting around his steps, screeched through the area. A trip that would have taken him a minute. At most two were completed within the span of a few seconds when Naruto suddenly came to an abrupt perfect stop, splitting the space between Ryuzetsu and Mary. His sudden appearance caused both Ryuizetsu and Cloud Shinobi to take a startled step back when they realized Naruto was standing there. W what the? Naruto I thought they took you to open the box. How are you on your feet? It was Ryuzetsu who asked the question that was burning on both ninjas' minds. Easy enough, I tricked me into taking a blood clone that they used to open the box of ultimate bliss. They did so and while everything was happening I was busy removing the Tenro seal. Naruto gave his brief explanation along with a slight shrug of his shoulders, taking the surprise and brushing it right off, while also allowing his armor to fall off and vanish in the winds. He paused there and blinked before giving Mary a look. He didn't know exactly who this guy was, but he saw the Tenro seal and a cloud headband. Speaking of which, do you guys want me to remove those seals? It will be a cinch with my chakra available to me in full. Mary's hand went down to rub at his exposed chest, where parts of the seal could be seen before the rest of it continued on under the cover of his coat. Ryuizetsu turned and gave Naruto a confused stare before she gained an expression of realization. You're in Yuzumaki. Can you really remove the seal? I thought that the only one who could do that was Mui, the one who put the seal onto us. Scoffing Naruto took a step towards the edge of the building they were standing on, so that when he turned and looked at the two of them, they were both in his field of vision. 
that may be true if there wasn't a decent seal user in the place, but any Uzumaki or even Jiraiya could break something as simple as something as a chakra prohibitor and an elemental failsafe. Simple. There was a momentary silence where both the white-haired Kanoichi and Mary simply gave Naruto a deadpan stare that he cared not to notice. It was clear from their shared stare that neither of the ninja knew exactly what he was talking about, but both knew that from where Naruto was going with this, that it meant he should be able to break the seal. Right. And how would you break the seal exactly? Simple, I just put my hand on your chest. He responded without really thinking about the way that his words might have sounded. Mary who was familiar with what was coming next moved to the side just a bit more, hoping to get out of the radius that was being covered by the eerie aura that Raizetsu was releasing. Meanwhile Raizetsu's brow started to twitch irritably at hearing what came out of Naruto's mouth. Sure, he was a powerful ninja, but that didn't mean he could go around saying something so perverse, so openly, so bluntly. What did you just say? Her voice was merely a whisper, but even Naruto who still seemed oblivious, noted that there was a change in her tune. Now despite of everything, Naruto never really did have any experience when it came to women because back in the village none of the girls even remotely appealed to him, and the one date he did go on was with Yuna, who was already interested in him enough that she was the one to ask him out, and she was the one who came to his place of residence to pick him up for the date. So yes, it was safe to say that his experiences with the opposite sex was still very much in the novice range of things. Hence why he was giving her a clearly confused look as to why she was upset about him doing good and removing her seal. I said that if you want me to remove that seal, then I am going to put my hand on your chest. This time when he explained everything he figured it was best to do it much slower and perhaps even more elaborate than the last time. Where the seal is located so I can break it with my technique. His blue eyes suddenly widened when he realized what was wrong. It was a realization that caused a bit of color to make its way to his cheeks. No, no. I didn't mean it like that at all. The middle of the chest is where the Tenro seal is, that's all. Then to make the point even further he pointed to the one on the center of Mary's chest. Raizetsu's wide eyes opened and closed rapidly for a few moments before she too came upon a moment of realization that she may have in the heat of the moment misinterpreted what Naruto was trying to say, which brought forth a blush to her cheeks as well, much to Mary's amusement. Oh. She mumbled trying to cover her face with her bandaged left arm. Nodding Naruto decided it was best to go to Mary first who looked at him with a nod. He knew that Naruto was his best chance in making any kind of difference here. Naruto gave the man a nod of his own, before closing his eyes and focusing, the blush on his face a thing long of the past, as he went into his serious shinobi operating persona. Lifting his dominant hand up to Mary's chest, there was a visible glow on the surface of his palm, only instead of green like a medical jutsu, it was blue, showing it was raw chakra. Mary saw that there was a kanji on Naruto's palm that said free, but what he didn't see were the two smaller kanji on Naruto's fingertips that tapped just above the top of his seal that said on the tips fire and ante, the Yuzumaki's brows furrowed for a moment before he sent a massive pulse of chakra through his hand. Yuzumaki Fuenjutsu. Fuen. Kai. Yuzumaki Art of Sealing. Seal. Release. Almost immediately Mary could feel whatever complex mechanism of the Tenro that was keeping his chakra repressed but still available was completely gone, causing the Kumonin to crack a grin. Opening his eyes Naruto took a step back jabbing his thumb over his right shoulder down back towards the spot where the box was. On my way over I saw your comrade surrounded by something ugly things. They could probably use the backup. Taking Naruto's advice to heart, Meroi took a step forward and patted Naruto on his shoulder, grateful for what he had done. Thanks kid. I'll do that. He then jumped down leaving Naruto and Raizetsu alone on the roof of the building. With the past incident fresh on his mind, Naruto figured he needed to be brutally honest right from the get-go this time, which was why when he leveled his sharp but friendly enough blue eyes on Raizetsu's eyes that were staring back at him, he pulled no punches. Okay I'm just going to lay this out for you. If you want me to remove the seal I need direct contact with the seal like I did with Meroi. Which means... Naruto at the end of it started to mumble, sounding less and less confident about it as he averted his eyes. To say that she was uncomfortable with the situation would be a gross under-assessment of the situation. Sure, Naruto was nice enough in the limited time that she spent with him, and she had grown to respect Naruto with each time that they spoke. That didn't mean that she felt comfortable stripping in front of him but. No, it's fine. I want to be able to help in this fight. I was never good at being the damsel anyways. She said that maybe not confidently but determinedly as she slid her arms out of the green kimono top, which she followed up with her black shirt, causing Naruto to blush and look away, but when he took a glance, he saw that her entire upper body was wrapped with white cloth, binding her chest down. I guess that is how she managed to trick everyone into thinking she was a guy. I wonder how she got past the security pat-down. Maybe things were different back then. 
when he realized he may have been staring at the glare that he was on the receiving end was any kind of indication he hurriedly looked away with a slight gulp. He wasn't sure how long he was looking away, but he only turned his head when he heard from Raizetsu herself that it was okay. Turning around she saw that her bindings from her collarbones to her bust were now loose, but she was holding her arms in a way that covered her modesty completely, using the cover the mass of white cloth helped to provide. Naturally Naruto's eyes started to wander downward, but thankfully the seal was placed a few inches above the curve of her breasts, which made it more clear for Naruto to see how her gender might have been missed. With the binding so tight no one would even consider that she was a girl, Naruto realized that now. Stepping forward the raven-haired shinobi from the land of fire lifted his hand, and much like he did with Meroi, he closed his eyes to better focus his chakra. A moment later his hand lit up blue with the same three kanji that lit before. Covering the seal with his hand Naruto released yet another strong pulse of chakra through him, his brows furrowing as he did so. Yuzumaki Fuenjutsu. Fuen. Kai. Yuzumaki Art of Sealing. Seal. Release. The white-haired Kanoichi's eyes opened the moment she felt her chakra control return to her, to the perfect degree that she once held, a gift thanks to her Keke Jinkai. She immediately felt that Naruto took a step away from her and turned his back to her, something that she appreciated as she put her black shirt back on. Taking a kunai she reached under her shirt and cut the bindings before she slid back into her kimono, leaving it open. Silently she strolled up and stood next to Naruto, as the two watched Satori look around at the scurrying prisoners, like it was choosing from a menu at the local eating establishment. Narrowing his eyes Naruto watched the Satori's attempt to abduct yet another soul thwarted by the fact that the smaller humans hurried and hid inside of a building that was just out of Satori's grasp, much to the beast's ire. Raizetsu do you have any tips as to how to hurt this thing? I saw you hit the beast, but when I tried to sneak attack it along with coordinating with the Kumonin we couldn't even touch it. That was a piece of news from Naruto that caused Raizetsu to crane her head to the side, initially having to think if she did something different without knowing it, but when she realized that she had not, she instead gave Naruto a confused, bewildered look. Are you sure that you weren't just hesitating or something because of how afraid of this thing you were? Or something like that. Now it was Naruto that had a confused expression plastered to the features of his face. If that was true then just how did Raizetsu manage to do harm to the Satori where no others could? He was so focused on the fact that this mystery just got all the more complicated that he didn't even answer her. Raizetsu for her part did not push him because she could see on his face that he was doing some thinking. Reaching back on every last piece of information that he could, Naruto piled everything together, from what he read beforehand to what he learned in actually facing it. For some reason Naruto's mind wandered towards his time alone with Satori and the words that were exchanged, or more what Satori said to him. Then he took what Raizetsu had just said, focusing on the word scared which triggered him back to what Satori had said when Naruto's sneak attack had failed. Fear, being afraid. Those were two things that always seemed to come up when Satori was involved. Wait. Is it sensing us through our fear? The books only said that it fed on fear, but if it is using fear to find us then. Frowning slightly Naruto's eyes glanced to the side at Raizetsu for a moment before he too went back to looking at the steadily agitating Satori. If that's the case then why isn't Raizetsu coming up on Satori's senses? Is it that she is immune to fear? How? No, that doesn't matter. I need to figure out why I am. Afraid, what am I afraid of? Naruto asked himself, he was by no means under the impression that he wasn't afraid of anything, because if that was the case, then he'd either be supremely arrogant or insane. In the depths of his mindscape the Kaiubi who was lounging on his hill, opened a singular blood crimson eye hearing Naruto's thoughts. Whether his Jinchuriki knew it or not, this was a moment that would help in dealing with his inner darkness if he was successful. Being with Naruto since literally day one the Kaiubi knew Naruto just as well as he knew himself, meaning that he knew the answer to what was asking, but he wanted to know if Naruto could find the answer for himself. Needing to get to the bottom of this Naruto suddenly dropped down onto the roof of the building sitting in a meditative position, a look of focus on his face. This of course earned a few slightly louder than normally asked questions from Raizetsu, who was expecting nearly anything else from Naruto. However her questions were ignored as the raven-haired Yuzumaki clan head started to drift into his subconscious. When Naruto opened his eyes he was expecting to be standing in front of a large orange fur chakra monster otherwise known as the Kaiubi, hence the momentary surprise of instead finding an ocean of darkness surrounding him. It was just like that time right after the Chunin exams all those years ago prompting Naruto to ask. This again. I really don't have the time for riddles and frustration right now. Then if you remembered correctly all he needed to do was count down the seconds until he heard an even tone pointing things out to him that were brutally blunt for better or for worse. He waited. And waited, but when nothing came Naruto's face scrunched up and he stood up looking around futilely because still all he could see was darkness. The same thing he saw all those years ago. Nothing had changed one bit. 
okay, I have absolutely no earthly idea what this is all about, but I do know that I don't have time for this, so maybe we can do this another time. Even trying to be polite as he was it was clear that it was completely insincere and filled with irritation. Naruto recalled from last time that there was nothing he could do to free himself, so he figured appealing to whoever was in charge here might help. Haha. <laughs> is this what the powerful Naruto Uchiha has been reduced to? Someone that needs to beg for help. Maybe I should just call you Naruto Namikaze then. Naruto spun around hearing that voice. This was one of those few times where he passed over being linked to Minato and Kishina, but only because of the voice itself. He knew that voice even if it was slightly distorted from darkness because that was his voice, and much younger him. And he was not wrong because standing there looking back at him with an eerie smile was a much younger him. His hair was a spiky black that was short and much like what his caretaker Makoto liked to add. Then to further drive home the fact, this boy form of Naruto was wearing blue pants and a white shirt with the Namika's insignia in the center of it, but the difference from him then and this representation was the fact that this Naruto's eyes were a pure red color, there was no distinction from iris, pupil or whites just red. Like a demon. The younger Naruto gave his lips a slight lick before they parted and showed his sharp teeth, his lips twisting into a sick pleased grin. This was just the kind of reaction he wanted to get from Naruto, confusion and apprehension. Things that could be exploited. What's wrong with Naruto? You look like you have seen a ghost. Not happy to see your past self. Many people would love to have the opportunity to give advice to who they were. Naruto's wide eye stare faded and was replaced by a harsh piercing glare, but the subject of that fierce glare just laughed completely unfazed with the way Naruto was looking at him, causing Naruto to scowl a bit. What kind of trick is this? Is the Satori trying to mess with me by bringing back the worst time of my life? Naruto's accusation was blunt and sharply directed, but the younger Naruto shrugged with a carefree expression. Ah, it is possible that the ugly thing could do something like this. But in this particular case this is all you. Since I am sure you don't want to do the little song and dance about who I am and why I'm here, I'll just do things the anticlimactic way. You can just call me fear and I'm here to take over your body and bury you away. Naruto's eyes widened for a moment before he growled slightly at the insinuations behind Fear's words, he even took an instinctive few steps back to put some space between him and the supposed body thief. Naruto's course of action caused Fear to throw his head back and start to laugh. Yes, that's the look I want to see from you. To be honest I was planning on waiting until you were weak, since that's when your mental barriers would be down, but since you came looking for me, I just couldn't pass it up. I figured it would be appreciated to bring back some good memories, which is why I picked this appearance. What do you think? Naruto's glare tightened further as he watched fear brush down the clothing on his body, causing Naruto to have to look at a miserable time in his life, only bringing unrest to his chakra. Quit with the joking. You want my body? Well, I am not giving it up without a fight, and when this fight is done, then I'll make sure you are removed completely without any prejudice. Naruto shouted passionately as he pushed off, already charging forth to level fear with a fierce right hook. Oh you can try, but you will find that every last part of that statement is completely and irrefutably false Naruto, but. In his focus on dishing out some form of pain, Naruto missed the amused look flash across Fear's face, before he appeared right in front of Naruto, his right fist smashing knuckle to knuckle against Naruto's in a perfect imitation. But. If you want to fight then I suppose that we can dance for a little bit out of respect of this being your final time in charge. The difference between Naruto's stoic intense silence compared to the bloodthirsty grin that was on fear and by association younger Naruto's face was as different as dawn and daybreak. There was even the difference of Naruto's cool blue eyes and fear's violent red eyes that showed difference with the only common factor being the face. Come on Naruto. What's the fun of a fight if there is no banter? Bah, forget it. Both bodies in the fight moved on the same path to disengage from the previous position, following the same course of actions where they both lashed out with the same identical kick. Both their hands were planted into the dark floor as the insides of their shins pushed against each other struggling a few moments before realizing it was futile and jumping back to a ready position. Okay so he's been able to match each and every move I have performed even with his smaller stature which normally demands that I have a physical advantage, but apparently not this time. He's probably mimicking me just to get in my head. He's nothing, he's not me. In the time he spent trying to convince himself Naruto failed to recognize the point that fear had already managed to worm his way into the Uzumaki's forethought. I really should be thanking you honestly, Naruto. Not only did you get stronger by awakening the Manjekyo, but now you're also afraid of being blind. Something that I haven't gotten the privilege of feeling in forever. So good. I don't have to use my Sharingan to defeat someone who could do no better than posing after me. He may have said that, but now that a Sharingan had been brought up, it felt like an itch in the back of his mind that he knew he couldn't scratch. 
perhaps before he learned the price of his power Naruto may have taken the risk, but going blind eventually from deterioration that was caused by the strain it put on his eyes was something too grave to ignore. He lifted his hand forming the classic sign to create a series of shadow clones, his eyes drilling holes into the essence of fear that was trying to manipulate him. I can use plenty more techniques. Here let me show you that I am not a one-trick pony. Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. Three Naruto's raced forward ready to do battle with fear, but before they could get there they were cut off one clone, for one clone. Each of the clones was engaged in an old-fashioned test of strength, their fingers laced using nothing but leverage trying to force the one engaged with into submission, but considering that they were identical in strength despite of the height advantage of normal Naruto and child Naruto, they were evenly matched, leaving Naruto standing behind one side of the line and a laughing fear on the other end of the three clone a piece stalemate. Yes. Keep using up your precious chakra because you are slowly getting weaker even if you are in Yuzumaki you will run out and I will be there to take advantage. Fear bellowed with a smirk as all six clones leaned forward and headbutted the clone in front of him, causing a line of smoke to separate Fear and Naruto, but regardless of not being to see anything, Fear shook his head and clicked his teeth as he held a hand out, letting a sphere of rapidly shifting winds start to form inside of his palm. Foolish. Lunging ahead Fear made a straight line right for the separation of smoke with his hand that was holding the leading the charge, knowing just what was coming for him on the other side. And he wasn't disappointed when his attack was met by an identical one from Naruto, the two spheres of wind grinding against each other, responding to the will of their user. Looking up from the meshing point, Fear smiled as his eyes locked with Naruto's both of their mouths opening and saying. Futen. Shinkajoku. Wind release. Vacuum sphere. The sound of Naruto's normal voice and the gravely one that belonged to Fear melded together, but even together their voices paled in comparison to the low screech that emanated from where the identical wind release technique struggle for supremacy. However both realized something quite quickly too when they noted the pressure in their hands had lessened, thinking the attacks were dispersing, both looked down to find that the two attacks had managed to start to combine together and grow in strength so much so and so rapidly that the two could no longer contain the potential energy in their hands. Both wielders of the knew that the amount of energy in their hands was no longer containable and hence dangerous to the both of them. Naruto was thinking it, but it was fear that spoke aloud summing up their shared sentiment. Oh crap. Then showing why their concern was well-founded the mass of dangerous energy erupted in the form of an outward circular explosion that propelled both combatants off of their feet and backwards, their spines pointed back with their legs and head lurched forward. Hitting the ground and skidding off the darkness that was the floor both versions of Naruto gasped out a pain groan and rolled onto their stomachs, hoping to relieve the pressure on their backs. Panting under his breath Naruto tried to gather his bearings, some after having his head bounce off the floor a few times, and needless to mention, but the floor wasn't quite the most comfortable thing to land on for sure. So that's what happens when you put too much power into that move. Explosive. Explosive, concussive force to the face. Not sure of the state of his opponent, Naruto forced himself to a standing position before walking back towards the center of the explosion, a trail of copper-red blood dribbling down the right side of his mouth. He was pleased to see that when fear made it back in front of him, that he was in a similar state, except instead of red blood running down his chin, it was a path of a thick black liquid that looked like a sludge to Naruto. Licking his lips, fear brought his hand up and used his thumb to wipe away the liquid on his face, cutting it off from just below the lip. It's always nice to see what my new body can do. Naruto's head was down which made for an unreadable expression, but before fear could get in another word edgewise the sound of a laughing Naruto Ichiha found its way to his ears, causing his face to scrunch up in confusion. After sucking in a few more precious lung-filling gulps of oxygen, Naruto's head lifted showing fear a smile that was stained on one side by the blood that spilled from Naruto's mouth. You. You just don't understand. You can't take control of my body. For the first time since his appearance as a young Naruto with that familiar spiky black hair, the entity known as Fear lost his composure, his youthful features breaking into a scowl, believing that it was Naruto and his inner confidence, or as he saw it arrogant speaking up. And why is that huh? Is it because you still have so much to do? Because you have a dream to fulfill that having me will only hinder you in completing it is that it? You think you can do it alone? That's it isn't it? Blue eyes slowly moved upward to meet the glaring red orbs that opposed him daring them for Naruto to say otherwise, but the raven-haired Yuzumaki was not one to be so easily deterred. Shaking his head Naruto reached down and gently placed his hand on top of Fear's right shoulder, causing the entity masqueraded as a small Naruto to recoil in visible shock from an action that was clearly not anticipated. Fear tried to pull himself free of Naruto's grip, but for some reason, no matter how hard he pulled Naruto would just not let him go. No, that's not why you're wrong. You are wrong because that means you will be alone. And don't you think that you have spent enough time here in the dark, ignored? Don't you think so? 
Naruto's voice was softly worded and considerate, something that caused Fear's eyes to widen and for his knees to wobble some. Unable to believe just what was happening, Fear was literally stunned speechless. Seeing you? Seeing me made me realize that I may have been a bit untrue to us in ignoring my fears. I was afraid of being hurt again after so much pain and emotional abuse that I suffered as a child. It is the same thing I have been doing to you, but I see it now. That you are a part of me that I can now accept. I accept that I am afraid of being alone, but let me tell you something. We aren't alone anymore. We have Susei, that old crow and a whole clan of summonings who will be there for us. We have two sisters that have gone out of their way to make things right, we know we can count on them. It may not be a whole village, but that is never what we wanted isn't that right? Fear's red eyes were visibly trembling along with his lower lip, but despite the appearance there were no tears, but Fear's face did move into a warm smile as he clasped Naruto's forearm, squeezing it firmly. You're right. I am terrified of being stuck here in this terrible place with no one to talk to, but hearing you admit that is something that I needed. That we both needed. We are afraid and that's okay because that's what makes us human. We fear things harming those we care about and caring about things is not a weakness, remember that Naruto. Now that you know what you fear and have mastered it go out there and kick that thing's ass for us and our friends. Naruto watched on silently as fear started to slowly sink into the floor below the two of them completely unworried and wearing a similar foxy smirk to the ones that he wore when he pulled pranks at a younger age. He wanted to say something fitting for what was happening, but was stopped when a bright flash of light filled the chamber blinding Naruto with its intensity, but instead of fighting it, Naruto embraced it, figuring that this was his way out, and he was right. What Naruto didn't see was that in that brief moment of a flash was a pair of eyes watching his every move, those eyes carried an impressive amount of intensity inside of them, and once Naruto was gone that voice that Naruto was expecting to encounter spoke up with a few brief words. You are on the right track Naruto. Chapter 22. Enlightenment's demise. Feeling the subtle but clear change that came from leaving the stasis of his mindscape to the real world, Naruto took a deep breath and got back to his feet standing next to Raizetsu with a look of determination etched into his face, blue eyes nearly overflowing with it. Raizetsu, who did not have the pleasure of knowing what happened to Naruto, turned to him and felt compelled to ask what happened. What was that all about? I realized that after you told me about what you did to hurt the Satori, that the reason no one else could put a scratch on it was because we are afraid of something you are not. That's why I went into my subconscious to face my fear. Taking a few steps forward Naruto stood at the edge of the building, peering down at the monster that was blind to his presence. The white-haired woman next to him came to a stop next to Naruto looking down at the beast throwing prisoner after prisoner into the box and scowled at the beast that took her best friend. That doesn't matter now. We need to do something. He nodded his head quietly to her words already having a plan to deal with the creature, but he would need her help in doing so. That is still the plan, but I am going to need your help. It looks like each time Satori is even relatively cornered he tries to fly into the air. I need you to keep it on the ground while I activate a ceiling array. Are you up for it? Am I up for it? Who do you think you are talking to? Raizetsu challenged back with a smirk before she pushed off the building top, not even waiting for an answer before she started to bound from building to building, using her advantage against the beast to get behind it, hands already rushing through the signs Naruto himself was more than familiar with. Pain. Kakakyu no Jutsu. Fire release. Grand fireball technique. Naruto watched as from Raizetsu's framed mouth came out a cone of bright orange flames that quickly morphed into the shape of a flaming ball that was fired off towards Satori's back. Just before her attack could hit its mark the beast turned its body feeling the heat, using its wings to shield its main body. The white-haired Anbu from the land of grass turned her head slightly when she heard a chuckle coming from behind her as Naruto shot past her before dropping back to the ground, his Sharingan eyes looking up at her. Gonna have to try harder than that. Come on Raizetsu I am waiting after all. Naruto called out from the ground. She could feel the small tick twitching on her forehead as even now that careless idiot down below taunted her, but she knew that his point was still a very much valid one that had to be reiterated. Grunting in frustration Raizetsu decided to go in a different direction with her attack, she was going to herd this thing into one spot. Pain. Onodoro. Fire release. Demon lanterns. One by one those moderately sized flaming spheres with their nasty faces came flying out of the sizzling air that was behind Raizetsu's body. Swarming around the monster, creating a massive rotating ring before one at a time the spheres shot into Satori's body, pushing it in the direction Raizetsu wanted, and the smirk on her face spoke of that. Then showing that a rank as an Anbu-class Kanoichi Raizetsu's hands and fingers blurred in a series of motion that even interested Naruto who was watching a good, safe distance away. What made it even more impressive was that her chakra came out of her body as white and started to make the air itself sizzle. Spreading her palms out Naruto watched on as four small orbs of white flames encased the Satori in a square formation. Pain. Shy high ban. Fire release. Four fire burn. 
With a snap of her fingers, the four orbs shot high into the sky and disappeared into the dark clouds for a few moments before the clouds themselves started to brighten. Slowly the clouds parted and down came four beams of white fire that went all the way to the ground, where the flames started to vibrate before they turned and collapsed on the Satori, making it look like one geyser of fire. The only thing that was more prevalent than the smell of the beast's flesh burning with such a disgusting, revolting smell, was the deafening screech that the monster released. However Raizetsu who saw a sickening black smoke start to rise, covered her mouth and nose, in case something toxic came off the beast, while she watched it burn, sweat rolling down the side of her face from the sheer heat. As someone who was able to use the fire release and quite proficient in his own opinion, even he was impressed by the amount of firepower that Raizetsu was packing. Not only was the quantity and scale of the flames impressive, but the intensity of them was something to be feared. What a frightening move, fitting for an Anbu. When the screeching died down and all that was left was the sound of the fire crackling on itself was all that was left the flames started to shrink and condense leaving the Satori in place, but the effects of the attack was devastating. Where there used to be black flesh on its body there was now scorched flesh and even in certain portions, its skeletal frame visible. And if that was not bad enough then the fact that one of its wings was burned down until it was nothing more than a bone stub had made a few of the onlookers visibly ill as they turned away and tried to plug the smell from their noses. Raizetsu and Naruto both watched as Satori tried to use its talon-like feet to support its weight that was trembling from the pain that was no doubt enough to make even an ancient demon-like enlightenment to quake in agony. Naruto, however, was not just sitting there watching, he was putting the final touches on the sealing array he was working on with the aid of his clones. The seal itself was quite large, and it had to be to fit Satori inside of it, and it consisted of a swirl much like the Uzumaki clan seal, but instead of ending in a tightly curled end in the middle, the massive center to the circle was empty. But just before that massive empty circle, there were what seemed to be skeletal hands reaching out from each direction, right towards where Satori was struggling to get back to a standing base. It's time to put you to bed. Permanently. Naruto muttered under his breath, glaring spitefully at the beast as he started to fuel the seal with his chakra, causing the ink to start to glow. Yuzukijfu and Jutsu. Dojo no Kitsugo. Whirlpool Shadow Art of Sealing. Soil Binding. Right as Naruto was about ready to activate the seal and finalize the complete demise of the Satori the beast with a sudden surge of energy that both Naruto and Raizetsu thought it no longer had the beast started to suddenly start to gain altitude. Damn it. Raizetsu stops it. Naruto cursed out as he was too busy keeping the seal powered up. However before she got the chance something that she did not expect happened when from out of the sky above her came a flying. Or rather falling Mui who had one of his hands pointed down with the other hand bracing that wrist. Screaming out his heart the man's eyes glared hatefully at the beast while his long, black hair flew behind him still flowing in the air. Katen. Tenro. High release. Heavenly prison. The now non-gloved hand of Mui landed where the beast's face was expected to be with a heavy thud that somehow even seemed to echo out around them even being outside. It was not even half of a second later before the Tenro seal appeared around the beast's body to scale and started to shock it back into screeching submission. Seal it now. Mui shouted as he looked over to Naruto, having to keep his hand planted on the beast so that the seal itself would remain as strong as possible. He knew that it meant he was going to die, but then he'd be with his wife and son, and he was at peace with that. Ah, I knew that idiot was still kicking. I wouldn't have had to break the Tenro if he was dead. A change of hearts was not something I expected, though. Oh well, this works. He thought to himself with a smirk, but in that moment that he was distracted Satori used his one good wing and lashed out miraculously towards the direction of Naruto, whose eyes widened in shock as the speared tip of the charred wing went through his chest just to the left of where Sasuke had stabbed him a few years back. Naruto. Raizetsu screamed in a panic, watching the wing of Satori lift Naruto off his feet, but the black-haired Yuzumaki still had his hand sign held. Cringing in pain Naruto could feel the puncture wound, and while it wasn't as large as large as the Chidori, he had the displeasure of receiving in the past, but what concerned him more was the fact that he could feel something poisoning his system. Ah, hey, uh, I can't believe that I let my guard down, and how is that tea thing still moving? Panting heavily Naruto spat out a mouthful of blood that splashed against the seal before he started to wiggle his body, throwing all of his momentum backward so that inch by inch he could work his body off the spear that Satori's wing had become. That's a fine. I and needed the B blood anyways. Naruto called out as his fingers shifted once. Fuin. Seal. The air shimmered before a translucent purple barrier formed from the outer rim of the seal, creating a soundproof barrier around Mui and the Satori, which might have been for the best considering the fact that the earth itself seemed to be swallowing up the Satori who was clawing, thrashing and struggling to try and pull itself back up, its screams going silenced by Naruto's seal. 
something truly horrible and fascinating at the same time happened, and that was that this thick, black almost miasma-like substance started to wriggle off of the body of Satori and immediately started throwing itself against a barrier which rejected it and sent it back to the ground. This happened a few more times before the black substance too seemed to lose its fight as it was sucked into the earth, with everything else left in the seal, before the ink itself vanished. Smiling faintly Naruto tried to stand back up and was met with momentary success, thanks to the Nine Tails chakra that was inside of him started cleansing it, but the Satori was older than even the Kaiubi, and that was apparent when Naruto dropped face first into the dirt, his complexion that had tanned out turning ghostly white as he struggled for breath. Naruto. Ryuizetsu called out to him once she landed back on the ground and was sure that there was no sign of Satori, Mui or even Yuku left after Naruto's admittedly impressive seal had done its work. Not wanting to waste a moment as she saw that he had yet to move, Ryuizetsu dropped to her knees and came to a sliding stop right at his side. Grabbing him by his sides, her fingers dug into the seemingly worn but rather smooth material that was his trench coat as she used all of her strength and flipped his dead weight over onto his back. Instantly her training went to work and her eyes roamed down his front where she saw the initial wound, and to her shock, it was already for the most part closed by some tender pink flesh. What worried the Anbu was the fact that Naruto's blood was both red and black like tar. Was he poisoned? She asked herself looking at his complexion and the hurried pace of his breathing, before moving her fingers to his pulse point, only to find that it was slowly decelerating from whatever it was that he had been infected with. You idiot. You went and got yourself poisoned and almost killed. You don't even care about this land and you are risking your life for it. I thought you weren't a hero though Naruto. This isn't your dream. The white-haired woman scolded her new friend while shaking him slightly causing Naruto to groan which ceased all her actions. Glaring at him as her eyes steeled with determination, the white-haired grass Kinoichi set Naruto back down flat. No, I refuse to let you die. Closing her eyes and moving her hands from the bird seal to the sign of confrontation, her hands glowed white before the glow faded and she parted his lips with her thumb by gently tugging at his bottom one. Ryuame Tensei. Dragon life reincarnation. She couldn't heal the poison scourge that was flowing entirely through his body with just her hands, she was going to try something more drastic and invasive. She was going to kiss him and connect their chakra networks to use the nature of her Kekei Genkai to purify his blood. It would cost her the rest of her life force, but she was ready to make that sacrifice. Taking one, final breath Ryuzetsu leaned down, pushed her hair out of her face, and pressed her lips against Naruto's, which she found to be surprisingly warm all things considered. Getting past the moment of contact she quickly went to work connecting their chakra networks, which only took a few moments to do. Once that was done she then began the slow transfer of her life force into Naruto's, as she kept her eyes closed and the rest of her senses focused on his vitals. As she felt her body weakening to strengthen Naruto's the white-haired women went through silently sending her thanks to the people that got her to this point starting with her parents, then her sensei, to Miyuku for being a friend to her, and finally the man who she was saving that unknowingly liberated both her home and her mind. Just as she was about to resign herself to her coming fate, waiting for that moment where body gave out her eyes snapped open because she felt the cold hand of Naruto on the side of her face, and when she looked down her shocked wide eyes found his half-lidded wide eyes, and the two stared for a few moments before Ryuzetsu slowly pulled back weak but certainly alive. Her mind rebooting faster than Naruto's, she got her word out first. H. How. Tuckling softly Naruto's fingers brushed the tanned skin on the side of Ryuzetsu's face before his hand fell away, his chest returning to a more normal pace of ups and downs. You know Ryuzetsu. I don't think that fatalism suits you very well. Stopping and chuckling again, Naruto slowly tried to sit up, something Ryuzetsu had to help him in doing. Also you just stole my first actual kiss. Blushing at the way he worded it, she quickly turned her head to the side muttering a few choice words, but loud enough for him to still hear. I idiot it's not like that. I was saving you. On the matter of that, she turned back to the Achiha confused. How did you recover so quickly? He moved his hand over the hole in his trench coat, looking down at the wound with a slight wince, but he was pleased to see that the last desperate act from Satori hadn't scared him like the Chidori from Sasuke. Well you already know that they needed Tailed Beast Chakra to open the box, and I have some of the Nine Tailed Foxes Chakra, and that helps with my recovery rate, along with my natural Uzumaki genetics. Then there was whatever you were doing to help me. Thanks for that he said sincerely with a bow of his head. Ever since he was young a self-sacrificing act of kindness had been about as rare as a double rainbow in his life, and he needed to thank her for that. I was only helping you since you can't do everything yourself. She said trying to dismiss his thanks, but in the end, the small smile on her face was undeniable. No matter who you were, being thanked felt rather nice. It was strange and yes it was strange, but the intimate moment between Ryuzetsu and Naruto was snapped when in front of them appeared Derry, B, Yujito, Samui and the others with Derry taking the lead in this situation. Did you two finish off that? That thing? 
Naruto and Ryazetsu took a moment to share a glance before it was Naruto who turned to the white-haired right hand of the rakage and gave him a slow brisk nod, confirming that they had finished off the Satori. Shai who was standing off in the background, closed his eyes and folded his arms over the top of his chest as he nodded. It makes sense since the box suddenly fell apart before the metal of it literally faded away. Eri had other plans however, when he saw a very dangerous threat to Kumo sitting before him weakened, and with the Avatar of Enlightenment, taking care of all that was left as a threat to his beloved home as Naruto Uchiha, a weak Naruto Uchiha. The chance was just too golden to pass up on. Reaching behind him and freeing his large blade, pointing it at Naruto causing everyone to go alert. As drab as it may be Naruto Uchiha, I am afraid I am going to have to ask you to come with us. I'll ask once nicely. His clear threat caused Naruto's cool blue eyes to narrow dangerously and for Ryazetsu's hand to clench against his back as she was clearly not going to let him be taken hostage. Even the Kumo ninja young and old were surprised by the man's rash decision. Samui was the first to take a step out from behind the experienced Kumagakur Jounin, her blue eyes leveled into a glare as she stood between Derry and his target, her fiancé. What do you think you're doing Derry? We can't attack him or did you forget? Samui's question was met by Yujito nodding her head behind the man, though there was a slight twinge of pain that traveled through her heart when she remembered that Samui and Naruto were engaged, since there was still part of her that had a crush on her fellow Jinchuriki. Where there was support for Samui, there was also support for Derry in the form of Amoy and Kari, who both had their blades at the ready leveled in the direction of the pair of non-Kumo ninja, while B and Shai remained neutral. Barry's usually lazy, unfocused eyes hardened some which made Samui flinch in shock, since moments of passion like this were rare for him. Quickly he stepped forward so he could whisper to her, and Naruto wouldn't hear him. Are you crazy? We can kill him and take his eyes now and then you won't even have to marry him. You'd be free. He retorted in a sharp but hushed whisper. And what are you thinking? Do you think that someone like him would just go down without trying everything first? The fight won't be easy, and I am not entirely sure any of us could beat him. His eyes could stop B-sama and Yujito before they even get going. Shai's Jinjutsu will be useless and don't even get me started with Kari and Amoy. She said trying to use logic to just cover the plain fact she didn't want to fight him in the first place. Fortunately or unfortunately for them, before things could get any more heated B pointed out what they missed while discussing what to do. Hey, enough with all the quiet hush hush talk he already took his walk. When Derry and Samui took a look they did indeed find that both Shinobi and Kinoichi had vanished from the spot that they were occupying, causing both Kumo Ninja to sigh, but for different reasons. All the Shinobi left moved to form more of a circle, instead of just letting Derry and Samui be in the forefront. With the silence spreading for longer than expected, it was Yujito that broke the silence left after the tense situation between her comrades formed. So now what do we tell Reikage sama I am sure Naruto will tell the people back at the leaf what just happened. Instead of Derry coming to his own defense, it was the blonde-haired Jinjutsu specialist that came to his friend's aid. Technically all we did was request that the Leaf Nin come with us to deliver a report on the destruction of the Satori. It's nothing they can truly use to break our alliance that is soon to come. Nodding Derry put his hand on Shai's shoulder and gave the smallest of smiles. Right but our business here is done. Let's get back home and make our report. Thanks for getting us out of there. I don't think I would have been able to deal with someone of his skill for as long as I am now. Naruto said with a grimace as he felt the gravity inside of his body lift and then sink from the aftereffects of the shunshin. Helping Naruto sit down on one of the few rocks that were around the remains of the campfire, the two had a handful of nights back once she was sure that he was going to be able to support his own weight, she moved over to sit on her own rock. Yeah, I wasn't looking forward to a fight right now either. She admitted as she finally allowed herself an exhale now that everything with Satori, the box, and the cloud was all over. Why would you be fighting them? Naruto asked curiously as the concept of something or someone helping him in a personal matter that was not his senseis of crows as foreign. If she had a bit more energy she might have glared at Naruto, but right now she was feeling both physically and emotionally drained by the whole ordeal, so all she did was smile and shake her head. I didn't go through the work of bringing you back just so you could rot somewhere as a hostage. Naruto's blue eyes that were usually kept almost closed in a stoic stare widened in shock before they softened some, and a small thankful smile took over his face. I guess I should thank you again. I'm not used to people sticking their necks out for me. Why not? Sure Naruto was a bit cold and had some issues being overly sarcastic at times, but those were not any reason to not look out for him. It wasn't like he was some kind of psychotic maniac. Sighing Naruto lifted a hand and brushed through his raven black locks, with his fingers giving Raizetsu what could best be called a complicated smile that only made her more curious. How about I explain that some other time? It's a long story and I think I am a bit too tired to tell it. Seeing the way Hiri acted to it was enough for the white-haired Kinoichi to realize that she was treading on a sensitive subject, which was why she immediately dropped it. Alright but I'll hold you to that. 
she said with a smile as she gave Naruto a glance before she looked over his shoulder at the grey, overcast sky that was outside of the cave. With more and more of his strength coming to him as the moments came, Naruto took advantage of the lull and broke the skin on his thumb, drawing blood that he spread as he flashed through the signs. Kuchius no Jutsu. Summoning Jutsu. Raizetsu's attention was brought back to the man in front of her when the poof of the summoning seal released the creature that Naruto summoned, which happened to dissipate and reveal a crow with sleek black feathers that seemed to have an overcoat that gleamed showing just how sleek his feathers were. Blinking its black eyes once the avian summon fluttered its wings one time to right itself and maintain a steady elevation, the bird turned its head to look directly at Naruto, who had a very faint smile on his face. What do you need, Naruto-sama? Do you want me to bring a message back to Susei? Tuckling Naruto shook his head and reached into his coat, recalling his hand and tossing out a piece of dried meat to the carnivorous bird that gobbled it right up. No, not this time Yoru. I need you to bring the message back to Shikei that my mission is complete. Okay, no problem. I'll go right now. And Naruto-sama I am glad you're safe. The bird said with a happy little chirp before it took off and vanished in a similar plume of smoke which it came into the world in. Having been able to see the interaction between animal and summoner firsthand, Raizetsu waited until Naruto looked back at her before she smiled. It's nice to see such a bond between someone and their summons. She said honestly. Honestly forgetting that she was here, Naruto suddenly looked a lot more bashful than he was a moment ago. It wasn't often that anyone outside of the family he had made with the crows saw the dynamic that he shared with them. Ah hey, uh, yeah well we are a big family of sorts so oh, yeah. Uncomfortable with the potential subject, Naruto decided that it was time to quickly deflect the attention from himself. What better of a way to do that than to ask her what she planned on doing with her future? So what is your plan for Ryuzetsu? Not having planned that far ahead, Ryuzetsu brought her bandaged hand up to her jaw and cupped it pensively as she gently chewed on her lower lip and thought. I honestly don't know if I want to travel around or stay here in the land of grass. She informed him, her eyes reflecting her lack of certainty. Well, whatever you choose I am sure you'll give it a good, long thought. One day later, Kumagakur, standing in the office of the wreckage were B, Derry, Samui, and Meroi, each of which had pieces of information or perspectives that the group as a whole thought that the wreckage would want to and need to hear about the incident in Kusa's blood prison. Sitting behind his desk the bulky, burly wreckage folded his arms together on the top of his desk, the golden wrist weights clanging against the sturdy wood of his desk. He moved his sharp eyes from one person to the next before he eventually came to a stop on Meroi. Meroi, start your report. He ordered, causing the man to give a rather firm nod. Well. The whispers we got a few months back about Mui planning something big in his prison were indeed true and to find out what I had to get close to the warden himself. I'll save you the details on that part, but eventually Mui had me scoping out potential individuals that had a great amount of power so he could use them to fuel the opening of the box. Meroi knew his rakage well which was to be expected with years upon years of serving him and he knew that he was a man that wanted to get to the point of such things. Eri felt that there were more important things that needed to be mentioned like who was there, which is why he inserted himself in the report before Meroi could continue. Boss but there is something more important. Naruto Ichihari surfaced and was there. Now that was a piece of information that had A's eyes widen in surprise. Due to the raven-haired Yuzumaki having almost vanished from the face of the planet for the past three years, there were many people who forgot that the winner of the last international Chunin exams even existed. Wanting to have this information confirmed he took a glance at Meroi who shrugged. Naruto Uchiha was someone who had recently been shipped in with the latest batch of inmates and there was no preparation for his arrival. We as those in the know had no idea that he was going to show up. Meroi liked the kid, but it was the truth and he had to tell his rakage all of what happened. He uncrossed his arms and threw his hands from the left then to the right as he pulled out yet another one of his wraps. Yeah, yeah they didn't get him in a rumble it was more of a stumble oh yeah. Sighing at his brother and partner's antics the rakage closed his eyes for a moment and calmed the twitching he felt in his brow before he turned his eyes to Samui who had yet to offer her insight on things. Okay, so they used the Achiha brat's power to open the box. What then? Samui, seeing that she was the one being addressed by their village leader, straightened up some and continued to report. When we arrived on the scene Mui had just opened the box and was about to carry on with his wish. Instead of wishing for what his supporters wanted he wished for the revival of his son. A retelling of the story caused her to remember that moment of unnatural unease when the box opened something that still affected her slightly, which was why she paused, but being experienced as she was, she quickly played it off by brushing some hair out of her face. Things didn't go as planned, and instead of his son the Satori came out of the box, and we engaged it in a short battle before Naruto joined in, but even with our combined attacks, we couldn't even touch it. Picking up where Samui left off Derry rubbed the back of his head, disheveling some of his shaggy, white locks. 
Shortly thereafter Naruto Uchiha took the Satori and started to battle the creature off in the distance while we were stuck dealing with these otherworldly creatures. Boss, the Uchiha has shown the Manjekyo Sharingan. And the Susanoo and the Matarasu. What a roared as he shot up to his feet, the abrupt nature of his action nearly throwing his oversized desk to the floor capsized thanks to his thighs hitting the underside of the desk when he sprung to his feet. The Manjekyo Sharingan was an instant boon to the strength of the hidden leaf, and just when he thought that the hidden cloud was getting the clear upper hand in terms of military power. B flinched when the desk hit the ground, many times before that sound was the prelude that led to his brother delivering him the Iron Claw. Luckily the Jinchuriki of the Hachibi it was Derry that took the attention once more. Unfortunately, boss. I may have just gotten a glance of the head of that thing, but I know it was the Susanoo, and there is definitely no mistaking those black flames. Growling under his breath a large man turned suddenly causing his white and yellow robes to whip around him as he looked out the window that gave him a peering glance over his village. This is big news, but at least we have a secure relationship with both him and the hidden leaf. I am not so sure thanks to Derry. Samui muttered under her breath causing A to suddenly turn around and glare intensely at the white-haired man. What was that? He asked with no form of sympathy in his voice, the aggression apparent. Tuckling lamely since it was all he could do in the literal face of his boss's anger, Derry wanted to look away, but he knew that was the wrong move, so all he could do was face down that glare with an apologetic smile. I may have tried to persuade him to come with us. Using my sword. There was a snap in the air and a spark of lightning that surged across the cage's broad shoulders as his anger got the better of him for a moment. Instead of backhanding Derry through well like he might have done to a lesser shinobi who did something so dumb he took a deep breath. No. No, it is okay. If we get a message from Kanoha about this, then we can cover it up as just wanting to make sure he had a secure way home after being gone for so long. After that the room fell into a long, almost awkward silence, before the rakage stopped and looked at each of them, making everyone minus B stand up a bit straighter. Alright, you are all dismissed. The group then turned to leave each and every one of them lost in their thoughts, some like B muttering things to himself. Though they were not nearly as eccentric as his. Except for you Samui. We have to discuss some things about your coming engagement. Stopping her plans of going home and relaxing, she turned her head to the rakage and gave her head a soft nod. As you wish, rakage sama She muttered with no sign of favor or annoyance, as she looked to pay to see what it was he wanted to talk about. It's about your engagement to Naruto. Then just like that, the indifferent shading to her blue eyes steeled over a moment before her eyes softened again, a complete and truthful representation of what she was feeling internally. If it is for the good of the hidden cloud then I will do rakage sama the blonde woman who had her entire ninja career in front of her, said faithfully, even though this choice might derail the entire thing and relegate her mediocrity. I know you will Samui. I know you will. What Samui did not know was that the answer that she gave was one that was almost directly similar to the one that Naruto had given to the Hidden Leaf Council when they had come to him with the same decision. Crossroads in the Land of Grass, Usa no Kuni was not a place like so many others that were named and had nothing even remotely in common with the geography around it. In fact, Kusa was a place where one person could hardly look left or right without seeing wild grass that was taller than your average to above average person. Roads in the land of grass could hardly even be called roads since they were rarely anything more than simple dirt paths that were outlined by the tall grass that occasionally were dotted and marked by signposts in places like the one that Ryuizetsu and Naruto were currently standing in. Are you sure this is what you want? Naruto felt the need to ask as he looked at the friend he had no expectations of making with a soft smile on his face. He had already asked her if she wanted to follow him, since he had one more stop to make, before going back to Konoha, where he was sure there was a place for her in. Raizetsu's appearance was a little different now since she shed her bandana, placing it around a memorial cross that was left in for her old friend Yuku, who had an empty grave next to his father's empty one. Now her long flowing white hair was not covered, not a single inch of her radiant white hair was covered. It was quite the sight when the sun hit her hair at an angle and just made her hair glow. Shaking her head negatively she used one of her hands and brushed back the hair that was covering her eye, though it didn't help since her hair just swung right back into place. Smiling at the genuine offer he made, she reaffirmed her answer. I appreciate the offer Naruto I really do, but after all that just happened I want to make sure that Kusa becomes stable. She truly thought that the refounding of Sun Agakur would be her true home. Alright, then I won't try to convince you any further. I hope that you can achieve whatever it is you have planned for your home. If you ever need some help or are around Kanoha stop by. I still owe you for saving my life. The number of people that had to do that for him could be counted on one hand, and Naruto planned on paying back each of them when the time came. Raizetsu wanted to tell him that he didn't need to thank her for doing the right thing, but she had learned that Naruto was incredibly stubborn when it came to this subject, so she just let him have this one. I'll hold you to that Naruto. 
there was a moment of no one saying anything that was broken when Naruto reached out and held his hand out for Raizetsu to take in a handshake. Quickly taking his hand in her own, the two shared a firm friendly handshake. Then I won't say goodbye but rather see you later. Blinking once then once more Raizetsu's lips twitched upward into a distinctly amused grin before her hand came up to cover her mouth as she started to outright laugh and giggle into her hand, much to Naruto's silent ire. That. That was very corny actually. She continued to laugh while Naruto's internal fuming went outward and became a bit more covert when just above his eyebrow there were the makings of a very subtle twitch. Thankfully Raizetsu managed to get herself back together before Naruto's irritation boiled over. The invitation works both ways. If you're ever back around these parts, track me down. Sharing one last nod born of mutual respect the black-haired shinobi and the white-haired Kinoichi turned around walking in opposite directions, one further into the country and the other out of it. But for Naruto, he didn't get far before he was swallowed in a plume of smoke and transported out of Kusa. Kurahane Forest When the smoke dispelled that signaled Naruto had been reverse summoned the raven-haired man was left standing in the lounging room of the boss of the crows, Naruto's Manjekyo Sharingan boring down heavily into Shikei's eyes, the energies in the forest fueling his ocular powers. The red floral iris on the black that was each of Naruto's eyes regarded Shikei's deep, soulless eyes before they both smirked respectively. All right Naruto, I want to hear your report on what happened personally. Shikei requested knowing full well that things like if it was still alive, where it was, and what was used would all be important things that he as the boss and elder for the crows he needed to know. Nodding his head, Naruto immediately went into telling his story from how he got himself into the prison to how he got put into what was essentially solitary confinement. Then he went into how the box itself was opened before he finally told the old crow about how he defeated the thing and the sealing jutsu that he used to make sure that the terror that was the beast was over for good. The giant avian let out a sound from the space between his beak that came out like a low, piercing whistle that cut through the wooden chamber room. You Yuzumaki do come up with some truly terrifying things. Well, the world is better off with that horrendous existence gone for good. I know I won't lose any sleep over it being gone. Yeah, it was quite the experience. Naruto admitted with a soft, tired chuckle as he pushed the strands of hair from over his eye and to the side of his head. Tilting his head back Naruto peered up through the beams of light that were grazing down through the leaves and hitting him in the face. The giant bird nodded his head in understanding as he too remembered a few battles from back when he was younger that totally changed the way he looked at things, went about doing things. At least you came back alright. When your opponent is something older than even the tailed beasts that is something worth celebrating. He let his shoulders rise and fall a few times as he took his exhaling breaths, but eventually he started to lift one of his hands and lifted it up to the hole in his trench coat that underneath showed his skin had gone back to the same complexion as the rest of his flesh. I wouldn't have been alright if I didn't have some help. That nasty thing managed to pierce me through the chest and poison me. Now that was a piece of information that caught the crow's attention, even if Naruto's immune system was near otherworldly, the Satori was actually from another world or at least dimension, and the poison from it should be affecting him for more than just two days. How are you even standing then? Naruto paused for a moment wondering what to say and what he could say about what happened. He honestly did not say something about Raizetsu that was false or might point her out like some person of interest, but he remembered the family they were. He trusted Shikei which is why he told him everything he knew about what Raizetsu could do. By the time Naruto had finished giving his tale of what happened, Shikei's eyes had slightly widened not in disbelief, but rather surprise, at the rarity of what Naruto had run into. That girl has the blood of dragons running through her. Truly exceptional. Dragons? Naruto asked, sounding rather skeptical as those kinds of creatures were something he only found in the stories that Hiruzen had read to him when he was a child. Surely you are kidding. I mean other than her name and her ability to spew fire, I don't see much of a similarity. Yes, it might seem crazy for you humans. Even your oldest ancestors would have been unlikely to see the dragon race, but we summon animals were around when dragons roamed the earth. Even some of the mid-tier dragons were able to fight tailed beasts and elder summons. Recalling a rather vivid encounter with an ice dragon, Shikai ruffled his feathers. Manjekyo Sharingan eyes dilating slightly as his imagination went to work putting together skies filled with these fierce, scale-bound creatures that ruled the air and land with a whole pack that was as strong or stronger than the tailed beasts. The thought caused him to shake, but whether or not that's because it appealed to his battle luster his fear was unknown. Using his tongue to lubricate his suddenly dry mouth, Naruto used the only question he could even think of asking. If they were so powerful then where did they all go? Lifting one of his wings and using his beak to peck at the feathers on the inside of his wings, in what was a nervous tick he gave his answer. No one really knows. It was shortly after Hagoromo and Hamura's greatest battle, and then it was like they never existed in the first place. Of course, there were a few older dragons left, but they have long since expired. 
Those two names sounded very familiar to Naruto, but for some reason, he just couldn't put his finger on where he heard them or who they were. Turning his head up to look at Shikei, Naruto's black and red eyes reflected that confusion. Who are Hagoromo and Hamura? That is a tale for another time, my boy. Tell me now that your training is complete and the ordeal with the Satori is behind you. What will you do? Are you going back to Konoha? As much as he enjoyed having Naruto around the forest playing with the hatchlings and sparring with the older crows, he knew that to continue growing Naruto would have to leave the nest. I'll go to Kanoha soon, and hopefully while I am there I'll figure out some way to stop the deterioration of my eyes. Right now the Kaiubi is holding off the damage, but that won't last forever. Back when he was in the Achiha district reading up on some fire release training, he saw some information about the Manjekyo Sharingan and what it could do to his body. Unfortunately, he didn't have the foresight to read up on how to fix that damage back then. But before that, I am going to visit the village of Natashiko. I heard that they incorporate a fierce kind of wind release into their techniques, and I want to compare their strength against my own before I go back. There was an excited gleam in his eye when he thought about going up against someone that was supposed to be good in what he specialized in. It got his blood pumping. Akatsuki meeting site. There was a dingy cave with absolutely no lighting, but it seemed that around the cave walls, there were these ledges on the walls of the ground, and that could only be said, because with a slight whirring sound, eight phantasmic figures appeared in a circle around the cave. The cave was silent for a moment as each pair of eyes got accommodated after literally being pulled into this meeting against their will, but that silence only lasted for a few precious moments before the clashing personalities. Well clashed. For fuck's sake, not you heathens again. I am tired of having to deal with Kakuzu always talking about money. I don't need to hear your blasphemy either. The silver-haired cultist screamed, his voice screeching and cracked as he screamed. You're right Hayden because what we all want to hear is a radical fanatic screaming at the top of his lungs. Already tired of hearing the eccentric member's voice, the blue-haired wielder of the two scimitars spoke up, already annoyed. Fuck off Kentaro. Feeling the insult grating on his nerves, Kentaro's advice only made Hayden's voice get louder and more unbearable. He and here I thought that the swordsmen of the Hidden Mist lost all their humor when I left them. Good to see that some people that come from that village have a little bite in that tongue behind those shark teeth. Amused by what he was watching play out in front of him, the Hidden Mist's monster grinned toothily. Please don't go around fanning those idiots' flames. They are loud enough as is without you egging them on. Knowing that this could go on for some time, the gruff voice of the puppeteer tried to curtail Kissam before things got worse. Why Sasori Sama? Passion like that needs to be let out in one moment where it leaves a glorious impact on those around it, like a good piece of art. Hmm. The blonde bomber formerly of Iowa spoke up seeing nothing wrong with the lively discussions. Don't be a fool. Art is something that lasts for all eternity that thousands and thousands of people can't see not only now but years into the future. That is art. What Dadara said was so disagreeable with Sasori to a fundamental level that even though he planned on staying quiet, he too found himself being drawn into an argument. And there they go talking about art again. I swear these two are nearly as bad as that idiot partner of mine, but at least they don't scream. The bounty hunter and the one in charge of collecting funds for the Akatsuki spoke up with a sigh. Come on Kakuzu you have to admit that watching them argue with each other like a bunch of children is amusing. I know it makes me chuckle. Hey. If the wielder of the Samahata had been there in person he would have nudged Kakuzu with his shoulder as he chuckled. And as most of the meetings had started between the powerful S-class criminals, the whole group turned into a juvenile mesh of throwing insults both spiteful and petty at each other, until the cave was nothing more than one bowl of white noise that made it difficult for anyone to hear anyone else other than the person insulting them. It was a picture of dysfunctionality. Silence. And just like a dampener had been dropped over everyone's mouth, the arguments died, and everyone's head slowly craned around and looked towards the figure in the center who was looking everywhere, but nowhere at the same time, with his ringed almost dead eyes. There was something about the eyes of their leader that even though none of them were there in person, it still felt like those harrowing, mystical eyes were carving through everything they had and right into the dark, twisted souls inside of their beings. Even Kissam who was usually unshakable lost his small grin as he looked at the man known as Pain, the leader of the Akatsuki. Once the silence was established Pain started to speak out not even bothering to look at anyone, even Kentaro who was directly in front of him was not the point of his focus. It's time that we start moving and taking what is ours. The Tailed Beasts. At this point, all members of the Akatsuki stood a bit straighter as their posture got more serious, some because of the concept of fighting a Jinchuriki or a Tailed Beast, and some because they were getting excited. Pentaro and Dadara will go hunt down the one tail. Its Jinchuriki is the current Kazakiage, so tracking it down will not be difficult. Do whatever is necessary to capture it because once we have it extracted the Kazakiage will too die, and that is nearly as important as the one tail itself. Kentaro simply nodded his head, while Dadara made a quiet remark how his art would forever change Sunagakur. 
You take Haydn and work on finding some way into Kumo's government. Spare no expense to get some way to get the two tails out of the village. Do you understand me? He paused here to glare at Kakuzu who bit back any form of back talk and nodded his head. It is too strong for us to pull off a full-on invasion with just one team. Be discreet. Honan, you will continue to find information on the three tails and six tails. Do not fail me. Pain intoned flatly as his eyes flicked to the side at the figure next to him that had yet to say a word. The feminine, spectral figure lifted her head, causing it to rise out of her shoulders and take more of a defined human figure that wasn't quite there before. Of course Pain sama The four tails is somewhere out in the mountains outside of Awagakur. He hasn't had much contact with the hidden village as far as we know thanks to his hermitage, so that shouldn't be too difficult. You and Sasori will take care of this. Behind Pain slowly out of the shadows of the cave came what appeared to be some kind of humanoid head that had some form of weird gag between its lips and teeth. It had a total of nine eyes, and only two of them were filled with the other seven a blank void. What about Hachibi and Kaiubi? Haydn asked, not so subtly licking his lips as he thought about sacrificing such powerful things to his lord and savior Jashin. Blinking flatly Pain slowly turned his gaze towards the silver-haired scythe wielder, who when he met gazes with Pain, went stiff as a corpse, his blood freezing cold. Those will come in time. To capture either of those beasts we will need to respond with total force to fight those villages. Each member had their orders given to them, and none of them were going to openly question the man that some people called God. They may have been powerful in their own rights, but they were not that stupid. Zetsu helps Kentaro and Dadara. We will be sealing the Achibi first, and I expect results by the end of the month. Do you understand? All three members nodded their heads. Dismissed. Chapter 23. Battle with Anatashiko. Elemental Sea. Is this what sailors have to deal with on a constant basis? This is no easy job for someone without chakra. Naruto murmured to himself as he sat there at the back of his single sail wooden boat. The morning was a few hours in which was why Naruto thought that it would have been alright to make his venture from the port, but he quickly found that he was sailing right into a squall on the water. His first exposure to the storm startled him only because he was in the process of meditating just as a way to conserve his energy for the two-hour long trip to the island he needed to visit to truly restock his supplies, food, and ninja tools included. However, once that shock surprised Naruto's body went right to work calming the storm around him. Being more than acquainted with how the property of the winds work Naruto left one hand extended out in front of him, using his expert control over the element to make sure that the hectic winds out on the water didn't tear through his sail. The next thing that he needed to do was a bit more of a task and required some more active concentration as he had to dip into the knowledge that his Sharingan had allowed him to copy, the bloodline limit having activated as he used his other hand to control the waters around his boat. Now being that water was not one of his natural elements, the concentration on Naruto's face was clear as the furrowing of his brow and the instinctual spin of the three tomo in each eye. He had to strain himself to not only reach the water with his chakra that was seeping through the boat, but he also had to control it which he couldn't do with finesse, so instead he used his raw chakra reserves to overpower the water, taming it. Naruto had to wonder what was happening right now, since what was happening went against everything he got while at the port town on the mainland. The raven-haired young man wanted to be so sure that he even made sure to ask multiple sailors, fishermen, and travel captains. It was the shared sentiment that today was going to be a good weather day that led to Naruto sailing further into the land of water. Taking his eyes out of the inside of his own boat, Naruto looked up at the sky, ignoring the spray of warm salt water that was splashing up and hitting the side of his face, while he kept his red eyes focused on the clouds overhead that were not a deep black like one would expect, but rather gray and unassuming. What the hell is going on? With both the water and winds hissing even the most minute of mistakes, a fraction of attention turned elsewhere meant that a boat would be flipped over and capsized. Normally something fatal for citizens meant an annoyance for shinobi, but nothing really more. Still. Naruto mused to himself as he looked out over the waterfront to see in the very far distance with the aid of his Sharingan that the port town of the island he sought to dock at was visible. That being said it was Sharingan enhanced vision which meant that any kind of stable land was about an hour and a half with the kind of weather he was having to deal with or even longer if he had to swim or even run across the water. Well, he still could use his heaven steps to traverse the amount of space that there was. But he opted against grossly misusing his skills like that. For all the negativity he had to deal with in his voyage, Naruto was pleased to see he was only slightly off-centered from the port which was good. In his opinion, it could have been much worse if he had reacted later than he did to this storm. He might have ended up on the opposite side of the island or missed it altogether. He wasn't sure that his stomach could handle that much longer in the form of travel without eating. Taking the hand he had up in the air and letting it relax some since the winds had died down the closer he got to the land he put it against his turning stomach. I hope their fish is good at least. Kurahane Forest for all its perks was not a place of fine cuisine, fruit abstained. 
Southeast Land of Fire. The forests in the Land of Fire were always so picturesque that the people of the land admired and even gloated about it. In fact, it seemed that the people all around the nation of fire took so much pride in their one with nature that instead of clearing the woods to build their homes, they instead built their homes in spaces preordained by where the vegetation grew up. There was one man that did not share that sentiment, and it was the blue-haired former swordsman from the Hidden Mist, who was dressed in his black cloak with red clouds, that was constantly being flourished as he took one sword in each hand and slashed any kind of vegetation that was unlucky to be in his warpath. Constantly the sound of tree branches hitting the ground and the sound of a sharp object cutting through the air filled the silence that sandwiched in the very unpleasant cursing that was being spewed by Kentaro as he split or cleaved branch after branch. This is just fucking absurd. Doesn't anyone in this crazy hot country know how to clear out pathways? Seriously? He growled through his sharp shark teeth as he continued to swing and slash both of his sword arms, furiously leaving a new path in his wake without a care. Meanwhile, his blonde partner was trotting along next to him with his arms calmly hanging at his side, putting out infinitely less exertion than his clearly ruffled, perturbed partner. The impish mocking way that his lips turned up spoke leagues of his amusement with the situation. Hmm, if you keep doing that then you're going to dull your blades, Corento sama Yeah. Whirling around in one furious, seething movement Corento cast his enraged brown eyes on Dadara, while putting the edged curve of one of his scimitar to his partner's throat, an explosive anger erupting from him. Don't you dare compare my swords to the trash you're used to seeing that impostors call a blade. He hissed at the end of his breath holding the sword to his throat until he was sure that his message was understood. The Bakuten user who did not think that his teasing jab was worth getting into a fight with a deadline hanging over their head, one that was placed directly by their leader. Calm down Karento sama It was a joke, a joke. Hmm. He muttered trying not to move too much or too abruptly and not wanting to set him off. Much like one would react when in a staredown with a wild animal. Garento's fierce scowl faded the more that he looked into the eyes of his partner, who did not appear to be intimidated or amused. Just looking into such an empty reaction kind of killed his anger and caused the man to scoff and drop the blade. Whatever, I just want to get out of this blasted heat and away from these damnable bugs. Bugs? Maybe it was because he had his arms and everything from his neck down underneath the thick cover of his Akatsuki cloak and his head beneath the conical straw hat, but he had yet to feel even a single tiny leg crawling over his skin. Growling in frustration he watched as a small black beetle landed on the back of his hand, lifting its little feeler legs and rubbing them together. Almost deviously. Yes, bugs. He hissed out, taking the fingers on his other hand and flicking the bug away, only for another one to come and take its place. He watched his partner dealing with his frustration and frowned, either these bugs were starved and that bold or something else was happening. Frowning his ears picked up on some buzzing and he looked up, his one eye widening. Corento sama he called out giving Corento just enough time to look up as a black sphere fell on top of them. The jutsu. Mushadama. Hidden jutsu. Insect sphere. The small sound of an insect's chittering, when multiplied by hundreds of thousands, became near deafening when they were all together bouncing their communication off the others until the sound was loud enough to sound out anything else. Taichu I got them. The Kadechu are starting to eat their flesh. Dropping down behind the abirum was a man in a jounin flak jacket with grey eyes, a young woman in a chunin jacket with markings that showed she was from the more obscure Karama clan from the Hidden Leaf. Then dropping to the ground in front of him were two men, one from the Hayuga and the other from the Inuzuka. Good work abirum. Pull back your bugs. We still need to be able to identify their bodies so we can report it back to Hokage-sama. Inuzuka, Hayuga go to make sure that they are indeed dead. Don't give them a chance to blink. He barked out making sure along with his female subordinate that their ranged fighter was protected. Go. Both men nodded their heads and walked up from pinching directions to cover any direction that they could take to escape. It was the Hayuga that lifted his hand telling the Aburum to release his chakra lot and beetles so his Byakugan could see through their massive chakra. One by one beetle after beetle flaked away up into the trees above head disappearing to go out and continue their carnivorous living elsewhere in the forest. Both the Hayuga and Inuzuka used their own special traits to search the area, but found nothing. It was the Hayuga that turned to look at the captain with an unsure, unsettled frown on his face. Haichu, we got one of the bodies here, but any sign of the other one is comp, his report was cut off when the contingent of Hidden Leaf Shinobi suddenly were alerted to a sizzling that came from the spot from between the two Kanoha Chunin. Shit. It's a bomb. The Inuzuka howled as his danger instincts kicked in, and both he and tried to leap away from Dadara's body that was indeed starting to smoke. Unfortunately, for them, they couldn't clear the distance before the bomb went off with a cacophony that swallowed up the two closest to it, while the other three leaf nin were disoriented. Boom, no. The Karama woman whispered as she watched her two friends join the Chunin task force and be swallowed up in a volatile eruption of explosive power. 
she could already see chunks of legs, arms and even a foot strewn around the grass that was now a combination of charred dead and soaked in blood and bone marrow. The stench was so rancid as it burned her nose she almost wanted to throw up right at her feet. The slight ruffling from the leaves of the tree that was now half missing and on the brink of teetering over alerted the leader of the Kanoha group that Dadara dropped down in the middle of the blast site with a smirk. Not a bad piece of art at all. Hmm. He said with a knowing smirk as he looked at the leader that was glaring daggers at him. It's kind of funny that you thought you'd kill me and Karento sama like that. Hmm. Ignoring the jab at their skills and taunting at their assumptions, the Jonin in charge turned his head and looked to see that both of his subordinates were still slightly shaken by the death of their comrades. You two stay back and try to strike when I make an opening, got it? Both nodded their heads albeit shakily. He couldn't blame them, but he couldn't allow them to go into grief either or else then they were all going to die for sure. I know it hurts right now you two, but you have to focus or else you won't be seeing your family again. Ready? He didn't need to look to know they nodded. How sentimental. It makes me want to puke. The leader of the squad looked down, eyes wide to see that it was the blonde's partner literally coming out of a spot in the ground right beneath his jaw. Coming out of the ground like a rocket, Corento delivered a sharp uppercut to Jonin's jaw, sending him flying towards a tree. Glancing towards where he kicked his opponent he smirked seeing the Jounin riding himself in time to stick his feet to the side of the tree instead of being barreled through it. Dadara, finish these two quickly. We have a job to do. He said with a light chuckle as he launched himself at the Jounin, one blade at the ready. Watching his partner start to clash his sword against a pair of kunai the leaf nin used to defend himself, Dadara chuckled to himself with a brief shake of his head. When he laid his eyes on the shaking Chunin he gave them a pitying look. You two don't stand a chance against me. The least I can do is turn you into a wonderful piece of art, hm. This is my gift to you. His words seemed to light a momentary flame of defiance in them, as both shinobi brought out a kunai, but that seemed to be the extent of their fight, as they went to shaking in fear. Between the Kurama girl's left leg and the Aburam's right leg out came a white centipede that dug out of the ground, followed by another one. Faster than the two terrified shinobi could react, they were wrapped up and bound together back to back by the explosive creatures, making their eyes widen in terror when they realized that their movements were being completely restricted. Quickly the instinctual urge to survive kicked in, and the two begged Dadara, begged and pleaded as he brought his hand up to his mouth. Sorry, hmm, but once an artist has created his piece of work he must let the eyes of the world see his work. In one grand, explosive moment, hmm. Katsu. Near his tree, the Jounin's eyes widened as he was forced to watch on helplessly, as yet another explosion swallowed a second pair of his comrades. Another group of his comrades he was supposed to protect that he could not. Suru, Yevon. He whispered to himself in an eerie moment of emptiness before his blood boiled in a fury. I'll kill you both. I'll kill you for them. He screamed as he pushed off the tree using its stability to enhance his own momentum, as he drove both of his kunai straight for the heart of the swordsman that easily shifted and parried off the blows through a spray of sparks. This Kanohanin might have had the speed of the standard Jounin, but it was nothing impressive to the trained, honed and tempered instincts of Karento, who personally refused to lose to anyone until he defeated Mehik. If this is all you have then you may as well take your own life and save me the trouble Karento mumbled, his eyes half-lidded and bored in having to deal with this shinobi. His pride as a shinobi and a capable one at that was rather large and vulnerable. The opponent of the Akatsuki could not take his pride being down talked any longer. No. No, I'll kill you instead. He shouted as he performed a shunshin to relocate himself just enough that his ex-lash at Corento's throat came from just off-center. Smirking victoriously as he felt his blade striking home he was about to demean his opponent, just like he had been getting, but didn't get the chance, because the blue-haired swordsman's body lost all its form and turned into water, while at the same time the actual Corento came through the water, form swiveling around the Kanohan Inn and lobbying his head from his shoulders in one graceful motion. Chinkiro, Mirage, perfectly efficient as always, Corento sama Dadara complimented him with a smile as he stepped around the decapitated corpse that was bleeding out on the grassy ground so far off the beaten path that it was completely unlikely it would ever be discovered. Letting out an incoherent grunt Corento used a very low-level form of water manipulation to wash away the blood that was dripping from his blade before it could oxidize and rust over his blade. Whatever, come on we have to get to Sunagakur soon or else pain will be breathing down our necks. Adara had no qualms with doing that, nor did he have any plans on giving his leader any reason to investigate his actions, but that didn't stop him from asking a question that had been bothering him. How are we going to get into the village anyway, Karento sama I mean I suppose we can just carve our way through everything if we have to. No need to do that, Zetsu has set up a plan for us that should make things go smoothly. Apparently, the Hidden Sand is about to undergo a festival that is used to celebrate their Kazakiage after his first six months in office. Because of this, the Kazakiage will be expected to make an appearance, which means security is going to be buffed up. 
he started off marching down the path with Dadara right behind him. Fortunately, Sasori has a plant in the Sand Council that will be activated by the side of one of the Akatsuki rings. I'll take the front gate and use this to create some havoc in their ranks, where a majority of their forces are set while you fly in over the top and deal with Gara of the Desert with your ranged capabilities. Corento finished off with a tone finality. Most out there would have a shred of hesitance in having to deal with a cage, a village leader, but then again the Akatsuki were no normal bunch, and that showed in the excitement on Dadara's face. Yes, I will show the world the caliber of my art by taking down the world's youngest cage. He promised, lifting one of his hands showing that there was a mouth on the palm, its tongue rolling around the mouth. But Naruto, reaching into his pockets and pulling out a thing of 200 ryo for his rations, Naruto handed over his money to the elderly fisherman behind the counter that was providing him with the rations of fish that he would cook himself later for dinner and then some. Humming in satisfaction, the fisherman with a cheerful smile on his face took the money and secured it safely in his register beneath the top counter of his vendor's stall. Looking up and seeing Naruto still putting his goods away he initiated some conversation. It's not often that I get to serve someone as famous as Naruto Che. He said with a grin. Naruto's reaction, however, was nowhere near as kind as his posture tightened up, his eyes chilled over and his fingers twitched dangerously. What was that? In these times people who knew a name before being introduced could be considered dangerous, and Naruto wasn't going to let an appearance fool him. The old man quickly realized that he personally had forgotten about a thing called shinobi paranoia, where because of the chaotic lifestyle they led, they went into hyper alert when anyone knew who they were, when they, that person being the shinobi, didn't believe the person they were talking to, should know who they were. Not feeling the desire to be set on fire, the old shopkeeper amended his statement. For an old man like me who keeps his eyes on what is happening in the world, it is easy to recognize the last international tune in exams, even if your hair did get a bit longer and your body taller. A moment, that is how long Naruto's chilling blue eyes stared unmoving into the eyes of the merchant, before Naruto was able to pick up that the man was indeed telling the truth without a hint of having an ulterior motive. Right, I guess I am not too familiar with my unwanted fame. Naruto suggested the reasoning behind his behavior with a slight shrug of his shoulders and not even a flinch of his facial features. Nodding his head, not impressed but rather refreshed by the younger man's point of view, the older man decided to give his two cents. That good young man keeps that modesty and that head on your shoulders, and people will come to you like animals to a soft light. I don't want people to follow me around. Naruto muttered, keeping that thought to himself so as to avoid some unnecessary and honestly unwanted opinions from the old man in front of him. Keeping the inhale he wanted to take to himself Naruto bowed his head just a fraction, showing his gratitude for the service he was just provided. I'll keep that in mind sir. Thank you for the fish. And with that Naruto took a few steps back before he continued down the merchant row. He had made it five minutes down the road back towards the port when his momentum was stopped by someone who just ran into his shoulder, not only causing the man who ran into him to drop something, but for Naruto's body to turn the opposite direction with the momentum. The man currently crouching down trying to pick up some lugs and bolts had a rather broad body that even under his pink shirt and purple overcoat that the man with brown hair and brown glasses wasn't in the best condition. After the bespectacled man was done scouring through the dirt and dust to forge for the items he brought back into one confined place, he lifted his head and peered up at Naruto over the top of his glasses, a nervous smile put Naruto's way. I'm sorry about that sir. I was in such a hurry that I wasn't paying attention. Tuckling because he didn't know what else to do once he got to his feet, but before the encounter could continue any further the strange man quickly turned back towards his original direction and scrambled away. That was strange. Naruto whispered to himself looking at the man's fleeting back before he too turned around and went back towards the port. From the back of his head, the raven-haired shinobi heard another voice speaking up, its tone predictably rough and surly. I believe that ninjin was what you kind of call a nerd. His presence alone was enough to make me disgusted. Lifting his brow Naruto continued his relaxed pace towards the other end of the island, and already he could pick up the heavier content of ocean salt in the air. That's harsh even for you Kaiubi. I am an entity of malice and destruction. If that fool would have bumped into me like that I would have flayed the skin right from his bones. The giant nine-tailed Kaiubi sealed inside of Naruto scoffed vehemently. Shaking his head and ignoring the few people that were looking at him oddly, Naruto replied to the massive chakra inside of him. And that is why you have been passed from Uzumaki Mito Uzumaki over the years. Perceiving what Naruto said to be an insult the creature long embodying destruction itself let out a menacing growl that rang inside of Naruto's ears, not that Naruto showed any signs of being worried by the Kaiubi. You might have made my stay here more bearable, you damned Ichiha, but mark my words, I will eviscerate you one day in the not-so-near future. Tuckling as he made the last turn he needed to take to make it towards the port district, Naruto stopped just to the side of the signpost that told him where he was on the island. 
And I told you that when that day comes I will defeat you not with my eyes but my hands. There was a moment of silence before much like the black-haired ninja, the orange-furred Kai Ubi too started to chuckle, though his chuckle was much deeper of a baritone than Naruto's. You do realize that. I know that is why I stopped here. I'll talk to you later. He said cutting off their connection before he turned around and saw maybe 20 steps away from him were two women. One of them was in a black cloak with a hood pulled over her head, while the other had the same cloak, but her hood down, showing her red lipstick and angled face. Why are you following me? Naruto asked briskly as he looked at the cloaked figure to the woman behind her, a person she assumed was her attendant. He didn't know who was going to provide the answer he sought, so when the completely shrouded one spoke up his eyes snapped to her, glued there. I am here to fight you. Her voice was flat, almost detached in nature. Hiking up one eyebrow that lifted upwards under the strands of black hair that were hanging over one of his eyes, mostly covering it. Why on earth would I do that? He asked curiously. Sure his schedule wasn't that packed, but that didn't mean he was going to go around answering any challenge that was thrown his way. This time, it was the attendant, Takua, who gave a brisk answer as her eyes flicked from her mistress to Naruto, who was standing there with his arms pulled across his chest. Because of Jurei Asama's agreement with Shizuka Sama's sensei that his next student would fight Shizuka when she came of age. Unfortunately, Namaka Sama is married so this agreement falls to you, his only son. Naruto's gaze went from curious to near deadly in a flash, as he stared down Takua to her credit didn't flinch as she stood behind Shizuka, who still seemed to be looking off at the ground. I haven't worried myself with their affairs, and I don't plan on starting now. Takua looked at Shizuka with a soft frown on her painted lips before Shizuka with an irritated sigh, pulled her hood down, revealing her beautiful features, her deep green eyes peering fearlessly into his blue, as her black hair blew with the wind. I don't care what your relationship with your father is, honestly Naruto Uchiha. But my village's customs demand I find a powerful opponent and defeat him in a battle to the death. If for some reason I lose you will have an entire village of women at your command, myself included as your wife. I refuse to fight you Shizuka. Now, I'll ask you to leave me alone. Naruto finished off icily trying to use his raw presence to make the Natashiko Kinoichi without drawing the civilians around them into this. All it would take was one wrong movement here in the land of water, and he might set something off far more deep-reaching. Frowning at his refusal Shizuka glared heatedly at Naruto, which was even more unsettling with the empty way her eyes reflected anything. Why is it because I am a woman? Are you afraid of losing to a woman? Can your fragile complex not take that? She taunted him with a mocking smirk. Here Naruto outright snorted at the claim thrown his way. Naruto actually recognized her headband as an Adashiko Kinoichi, but that didn't change his mind. He proposed that maybe some of his ancestors like Madara Cheha might have considered women to be weak and fragile, since he was one of the last true old guard, but that was not him. No, I won't fight you because that law is the stupidest thing I have heard in years. That law takes away your ability to choose, that is why. For a moment the words Naruto just spoke overlapped and then sensed with the words that a younger she had said when she first found out of the expectations put on top of her. The defiance, the want to be free hearing it from someone else, made her freeze and play silent for a few long moments. Then the reality of the world she lived in came back to her, all the voices telling her of her responsibility to her to her teacher, to her village, and to her sense of honor as an Adashika warrior. Feeling that familiar cold feeling swelling inside of her, she slowly undressed, handing her cloak and traveling pack to Takua. Standing there in a grey-blue battle suit that hugged to her body showcasing her shapely figure along with a shoulder guard on her right shoulder and near the center opened up revealing even more of her fair flesh and her large cleavage. Her hair showed itself to go back down all the way to her waist while she pulled her gloves tight. Fine, then stand there and die. I have a duty to my village to fight you here and now. Whereas Shizuka was preparing herself for battle and Naruto was still standing there arms drawn over his chest, eyes regarding her stoically. His patience with her one-minded way of thought was being tried. Really because to me it looks like you are just giving up without trying to make your own choice. Nearly losing her cool, calm and focus, Shizuka had to bite the inside of her lip to refrain from lashing out right back at his easily spoken words that had no base to them. What would you know about my situation? Nothing, that's what. She said quietly as her eyes tried to rip through Naruto with all their intensity. You're right I don't know you, but I can see that you're giving up on your ability to choose. You're not fighting for yourself. Naruto spoke with a shake of his head that was clearly one of disappointment. The air around Shizuka started to circulate blowing and tossing her long ponytail all around as she nearly assaulted Naruto right there for speaking to her like that, but she held on by the smallest of threads. What would you do when there was a whole village there to crush your dreams? No family there to point you the way you are meant to go only dragging you down your destined path. What Shizuka failed to know was a number of similarities and parallels that she and Naruto actually shared. Much like Naruto spoke without knowing she too ripped into him without knowing of his personal life. 
It was these life experiences Naruto had that allowed him to give an answer full of conviction. I'd get back up and continue to fight for what I want to do, who I want to be. Laughter, that was the sound that tore through the light wind, laughter that belonged to Shizuka. It was a sound that had no warmth or fondness in it, but rather a dry mockery. Narrowing his eyes at her, Natashiko stopped laughing, her expression flat and empty as a white wall. Yet here you are afraid to fight a girl. You're just like all men out there. All talk, no substance. Shizuka's last insult was all Naruto could take, and it was not solely because she was slowly wearing down on his ego. No, it was something a bit deeper than that, something that affected him down the darkest corners of his insecurities. It was only because of what happened back at the blood prison that he was even able to look at someone who was a reflection of what he could have been had he folded when he was younger that he was able to do this. Fine. I'll show you just why we are meant to make choices. The Kiwa who had been watching the verbal confrontation unfold silently stepped forward between Naruto and her mistress. She looked from Shizuka to Naruto and then back before she nodded. I know a place where this fight can take place. Follow me. Naruto and Shizuka's battlefield, Oten. To Kenro. Earth release. Iron Fist prison. The ground itself started to shake before the earth sprouted out tall, steel walls that popped out one at a time, until the starting point was met from the other side by a same steel plate wall that started off the circular dome. Both Naruto and Shizuka were standing on top of the walls, but Naruto was more interested in watching the ground be cleared out, leaving a completely empty trench crater for a field. When Shizuka jumped down Naruto did the same leaving the man and woman standing on opposite sides of the field, keeping a blank stare on the other, sizing each other up for a few silent moments. Figuring trying to ask one more time would not hurt things Naruto spoke out breaking the silence. Do you really want to do this? Yes, I need to do this. She spoke her beliefs in her duty, and her lack of belief of following what she wanted was not going to change now. The only thing that mattered to her was proving that she was stronger than Naruto. Closing his eyes Naruto took one last deep breath before he opened his blue eyes and took off his trench coat. He didn't have the materials to get it fixed should things go wrong, so instead he just took the coat off and tossed it to the side leaving him bare chested, the scar on his chest as eye drawing as the seal on his stomach. Shizuka was plenty used to her male opponents leering at her, and she usually used that to her advantage, but when she got the chance to take in Naruto's toned upper body, she took it for a few moments before focusing again right as he spoke. Show me what you have then. She wasted no time rushing forward with her hand wrapped in a coating of wind chakra that actually looked so volatile that it actually wasn't clear but slightly foggy. Holding his ground until she was right on top of him, Naruto waited until the last moment and slipped to the side avoiding her attack. Natashiko Ryu. Koharepikan. Natashiko style. Hardliner Gale Fist. The Yuzumaki clan head was expecting maybe a gust of air to burst out from her palm, much like Chakra did from those aiming to disable the Tenketsu, but what he got was actually a roar of wind that fissured the ground around her and actually had enough force that it put a cut on his cheek that started to bleed slightly. So this is the Natashiko style, how fierce. He mused to himself as he started to leap away from the ground that was breaking near his feet. Quickly she took advantage of the fact that Naruto had to be on the retreat, lest the ground toss him to the floor by jumping into the air, a kunai lodged between each of her fingers, the blades gleaming dangerously. Natashiko Ryu. Shinku Enbu. Natashiko style. Crimson dance performance. Throwing her barrage of kunai right at Naruto's body in a wide arc, she powered her kunai, increasing their speed and cutting power with her wind chakra. Dodging the first few handfuls of kunai Naruto, expected that to be it, but much to his surprise, she continued to lash out throwing kunai after kunai at him, with a graceful fluidity that showed no signs of stopping. Weaving and ducking the blades by the thinnest of margins, Naruto realized that she wasn't going to stop. Enbu. Naino Dan. Dance performance. Second step. Somehow she floated in mid-air and started to make use of her own momentum and of course the air around her to turn her body to spin so fast that the air around her twisted and turned like a small tornado. Then out of that tornado came a flurry of deadly accurate kunai, all still powered by her wind chakra. Impressed, Naruto looked up at the blades that were coming down on him almost like black rain and stood his ground. A seal briefly flashed on the back of Naruto's hand before trusty blade Twilight appeared in his hand already coursed through with wind chakra, which he used to cancel out hers, his sword play flourishing and twisting to deflect the blades away as he slowly walked closer to her. There is no way she can see me spinning that fast, just got to get close. He told himself as he got closer and closer. The closer he got the faster his hands had to be, but Naruto was up to the challenge, but just before he got into striking range, she stopped spinning her hand already up to her mouth. Shit. He cursed, already bracing himself. A senpu, violent whirlwind, Naruto could feel the pressure of the wind trying to crush his body, but it was bearable as he dug his feet into the ground, using it to stop his sliding back, his own wind manipulation being used to cut through the stream. Why aren't you fighting back? 
Are you looking down on me? You still haven't even used your Sharingan. She growled slightly feeling that her skills were being overlooked, that all her work was being diminished. Brushing the dirt and dust off of his skin in what could be considered a very flippant gesture, Naruto looked at the glowing Kanoichi for a moment before he gave an unapologetic shrug. You can look at it that way, but if you want to know what I am doing really then I'll tell you. Dueling another wind user. Her eyes widened slightly, even losing their sharpness for a moment before she gained her game face again. Then fight back. She all but ordered him with a passionate shout wanting a real fight. Very well. By the time his words had been carried to her by the winds themselves he was already gone and she was on high alert. Sensing it at the last second Shizuka turned her body completely around to see Naruto already behind her with his attack in hand. Futen. Shinkajoku. Wind release. Vacuum sphere. Was that a shunshin? He's so fast. She said in a slight panic and just before Naruto's attack could hit her right in the stomach, she thrust both of her hands down into Naruto's one hand. Her hands were coated with the same wind chakra from earlier, chakra laced hands about to impact a sphere in Konohanin's hand. Natashiko Rai. Koharepikan. Natashiko style. Hardliner Gale fists. The volatile force of the two powerful wind-based attacks going off right against each other created a tornado in a vortex that could not be contained by either Shizuka nor Naruto. Quicker than either expected the powerful unruly wind quickly broke free from the vortex that was created and sent both bodies skidding to opposite sides of the battlefield. Asping for the oxygen that was ripped right from her body, Shizuka tried to arch her back off the painful angle that she fell a rock onto. Get up. She screamed at herself knowing she was still in battle. Scrambling to sit up immediately she looked ahead where she thought Naruto would be. It's over. Naruto's quiet voice caused her eyes to widen as she felt his palm resting on the back of her neck. All he used was wind techniques and he defeated me this easily. How strong is he? Shizuka thought in disbelief. Closing her eyes she didn't know what to do now that her strength that she had been gaining for years failed her. Their techniques are powerful, but they are too straightforward. Maybe implementing a variant wind technique that provides you some more range. Naruto mused as he kept his hand on the back of her neck in case she tried anything rash. Please, deliver the final blow. She spoke up in a soft tone, hollowed by defeat. Frowning slightly Naruto pulled his hand back standing straight up, towering over her seated frame. I told you that I wasn't interested in fighting you for that or because I wanted you or your village. Then I'll take the girl. A voice spoke up from off to the side before the ground rumbled and from out of the earth came a massive robot's hand that not only batted Naruto back from the girth of its hand but also already had its bulky fingers wrapped around Shizuka's body. What an underhanded trick. Takiwa spat out with disdain as she prepared to free her mistress, using the long blade fastened to her back. Already worming her way out of the grip, Shizuka smirked as she pushed her foot off of the closest thing to a face that the robot had used to gain elevation. This is nothing she proclaimed as her foot was coated in that powerful wind chakra that she used to deliver an axe kick that carved up the metal-like wet paper before she leaped back from the explosion. The woman with the ample bust didn't even have the time to land on the ground before this strange red and violet seal appeared on her stomach. Her eyes widened, dilating in pain as she thought lightning was spreading through her. All that pain came to a stop replaced by a numb feeling as she was pulled towards the porky man that Naruto recognized from earlier. Finally, Shizuka and Natashiko village are mine. He roared in victorious laughter, his head drawn back as the sound of his victory clamored out to the heavens. With my bolts connecting you to my control I will rule all of Natashiko. The man was too distracted and Naruto was just too quick that he didn't even notice as Naruto appeared in front of him with his sword running with wind chakra. It was only when he cut the chakra strings freeing Shizuka did her captor look down at Naruto's cool blue eyes that struck him with fear. Hatching her with one arm Naruto transformed his wind chakra to lightning chakra and held the blade horizontally over the top of his head like an animal bearing its fangs. Scum like you needs to be removed permanently. Ichiha no Kiba. Tsuri Shijeki. Fang of the Ichiha. Suspended impact. 1. Crackling that was the only real sound that the glasses wearing man could hear as the lightning flourished upwards in random, violent spikes before in a flash of light blue, the energy fired forward, maintaining the slender, slightly curved nature of the blade. The attack went straight forward and cut right underneath the man's throat at the topmost, center of his chest, the blade impaling the man against a metal wall, his feet hanging off the ground. Ignoring the now corpse Naruto turned away from the body that had blood dripping from its mouth, instead paying attention to Shizuka, who was looking at the man holding her with a slight blush, due to the contact with Naruto who was still shirtless. Working her way from his grip she stood up and looked at him with an accusatory glare. Why did you save me? First, it was her refusal to leave him alone, and then it was her insistence to fight him, and finally it was her showing a complete lack of gratitude for being helped out of a situation. Frankly, Naruto was fed up with it all and let it burst out from his mouth in some, not choice words. I am tired of your shitty attitude. The least you can do is show some gratitude. 
Her eyes went down for a moment breaking their glaring match because as she thought about it, she did come off as an ungrateful brat. She was raised better than that and she was going to reflect that. Taking a calming breath she turned back to Naruto with a minuscule frown on her face. I didn't mean it like that. You had the chance to defeat me or at least get away from this fight you clearly don't want. Is that what you want? Do you want me to defeat you, to kill you and end this quest you put yourself on? His words made her eyes widen and her body recoil in shock, but Naruto continued on with his words while she was vulnerable to their message. You have spent so long with your heart and mind locked away because of what you are expected to do that you have forgotten what it means to make a choice of your own. Looking away from the side Naruto's blue eyes squinted, nearly closing them as he reached down and put back on his trench coat, leaving the zipper down the center open, enjoying the breeze against his warm flesh. I really don't know much about marriage, so I won't say anything about that, but I know someone should be able to choose what they want to do. That's it. She muttered short on words, but with plenty of awe filling her normally void, green eyes. Not only had he defeated her with ease, begrudgingly admitted, but he also saved her from that crude puppeteer and continued to challenge everything she was forced to believe. Her silence was taken by Naruto as something for him to continue on speaking, doing so without him even really knowing why he was doing it. There is this girl that I am arranging to marry from another village. I don't know her all that well, but I made the choice to do this because it will make those around me safe, and she chose the same. It might not be the best thing for me, but at least had the ability to make that choice. Looking up into the white fluffy clouds that were slowly drifting across the clear blue sky that was left without a blemish over the top of them. Smiling fondly Naruto's eyes eventually came back to the attentive face of Shizuka, who had not seen that level of affection on Naruto's face or in his eyes. If my choice can keep smiles on the faces of the innocent children at my village, then I can gladly bear the choice that I might not be as happy as I could be elsewise. Or. I might even end up happy. Who really knows? How? How can you sacrifice your own life for people you don't even know? She asked, hanging on every word like it was an answer to a divine riddle or some kind of cosmic problem. Naruto's blue eyes glazed over for a moment as memories of his childhood spent out in dirty alleys, in the woods with wild animals that were as ready to rip out his throat as the villagers who were supposedly more civilized. If I can provide a place for children to follow their dreams, or anyone for that matter just through my actions, then I can shoulder the burdens that come with that. I can't make my choices, I have a destiny. Expectations. Though she might have worded that she did not sound anywhere as near as confident or as sure in her words as she was when she first met Naruto. Turning his shoulder to her but still looking over at her with something of a smirk on his lips, Naruto gave a shrug. You have the talent to change things. Or as selfish as it may sound, take the opportunity and leave behind that life to someone who wants it and find something that you want. Oh that reminds me, your follower, I put her under a Jinjutsu with a clone and sent her back to your in-room just in case I had to make a getaway. Goodbye Shizuka. Figuring this was the best he could try and get his message to her, Naruto turned and started to walk away from her. Silently the Natashiko Kinoichi watched as Naruto walked towards the walls of smoke that were born from the metal walls being brought down, thanks to Takiwa being put under the effect of a Jinjutsu. As she watched them she remembered what her mentor told her on her deathbed. Yes Shizuka-chan, you bear the weight of your destiny on your shoulders, but that doesn't mean that you need to keep yourself locked away in the darkness of your heart. At that moment she didn't know it, but those metaphorical chains that were wrapped around her heart, constricting it, started to fall away as she looked at Naruto's back, moving slowly but surely ahead. Making her choice the lovely woman ran forward and came to a sliding stop next to Naruto who stopped curious as to her action. Wait, I am making a choice Naruto. I want to follow you. There was a moment of silence, then a second and finally a few seconds turned into seconds before Naruto's mind finally rebooted. Wait. What? He was rather stumped by what was happening. I want to follow you, Naruto, that is my choice. She wasn't going to tell him bluntly, but she wanted to see just what kind of life that the man in front of her lived, and there was no better way to do that than to be on the path with him. For the first time in quite some time, Naruto didn't know what to say, and that came through in the owlish look he gave her, stunned. That's not what I meant. Why not? As your fiancé, it is expected of me to be near you, by your side. She returned heatedly. First, he was telling her to make her own choices, and now he wasn't going to let her make the first choice she had made freely in some time. It was absurd. That word, that one word rang inside of his head. The weight of that word caused a light blush to come to his cheek as he nearly gawked at her. What do you mean fiancé? He shouted back not at all on that train of thought. Now it was Shizuka's turn to let a red flush fill her creamy complexion as she averted her eyes and glanced to the side with one of her hands holding onto her arm. Well, you did beat me. We are technically now engaged and since I won't be taking your choice by bringing you back to my home, I have decided to come with you to your home. She stated confidently. Her eyes were all Naruto needed to know to realize she wasn't going to back down. 
when being face down with his own logic Naruto had two options. The first was to deny her request thus marking himself as a hypocrite or to take her with him. He wasn't ready to openly put himself out as contradictory, he just sighed and relented. Fine. Come on, we need a place to camp before it gets too dark. Twelve nights later, Sunagakur, Azakiyaj-sama. Garasama. If you asked a current Kazakiyaj, Garasabaku was told when he was younger that one day the adoration-filled cheers of the populace of Sunagakur were going to be thrown at him instead of rotten foods he would have killed them on the spot. Yet here he was six months into his reign as the Kazakiyaj of the village hidden in the sand, and they no longer saw him as the monster that was sealed away inside of him, but the most vital person to them that existed currently. It was almost overwhelming, but still it brought a soft smile to his face as he gazed upon his village lit up so bewitchingly with lanterns and festive banners. Things had been going very well since he took over, the mistakes of his father's power-hungry ruling style, being replaced by a reactionary kind of way of governing from Gara that both supported the people physically and the safety of a stronger shinobi force to mentally, by providing a safer, more prosperous place to call home. Sure they were not quite at the standing of the hidden leaf or the hidden cloud, but he was more than certain that they could fight off the hidden stone, should they try anything, and hopefully soon they would be the peers of the stronger villages. His musings on the present and future of his village were cut short by the sound of a hand knocking on his door a few times before the door opened, and Gara's brother Kankuro walked into the room, smirking at the pleased expression on his younger brother's usually empty face. They are waiting for you to deliver your speech to them Gara. He said with a smirk that grew on his face as he looked upon his little brother dressed in the Kazakiyaj's robes, it filled him with pride. Gara nodded silently, already having prepared himself a small excerpt that he would deliver to the people that gathered to see him. Of course, this required security being upped in a number of high places all around the festival grounds, along with a slight increase in the number of men and women put on the main gate. He tried his best to dissuade his sister from going overboard, but she was having none of his arguments which led to him giving in to her demands. The two brothers took a quick stroll out to the balcony of the Kazakiyaj's tower before as planned, Gara created a sand platform that took him high into the sky above his people that were thrown into a frenzy at the sight of their beloved Kazakiyaj. Then Kuro now that he was alone on the balcony, let out a single proud tear roll out of the glazed eye and down his cheek. Years ago he wasn't even able to risk walking next to his brother without being maimed or worse, but now here he was with his little brother as the Kazakiyaj, the strongest ninja in their village. And it all seemed to start back after the Chunin exams after the last international Chunin exams, where his brother came up to him and just spoke his mind. I am tired of people looking and treating me like a bomb waiting to go off. I want to be someone that inspires confidence and awe in people. I want people to look up to me. I want people to feel safe when I am around, and that starts today in Kankuro. I hope that you and Tamari will support me. He could still remember the smile Gara gave him that day as clear as any other memory he had. It was one of his most cherished memories. Gara panned his gaze across the adoring crowd before he sighed once calming down the butterflies he felt fluttering inside of him. He could do this. He had done it already when he convinced the council that he was the right choice to take over the position from his father. 2. Many a year ago many of you thought that I was a monster only meant to kill and harm those you love. You weren't wrong in thinking so, but still you all gave me the opportunity to prove to you that I could change, and that all started six months ago when I became the Kazakiyaj. Gara's firm voice washed over the silent night sky dropping down and reaching each and every onlooker down below. From up above he could see the shamefaced expressions on a number of older individuals in the crowd, but no longer did he hold any ill will towards them, which allowed him to continue on without malice or hate. You all showed that you were hesitant at my appointment, but because of how young I am not who I was and I thank you for that. I thank all of you for that. Here he let out a truly warm smile that made some of the ladies who had a crush on him blush, the children that admired him to cheer in their squeaky voices, and the men that supported him to grin. In return, I have used my blood, flesh, and soul to defend you all from anyone who sought to take away what is ours. The crowd started to applaud, but Gara continued to speak louder. As long as I, Gara Sabaku am your Kazakiyaj no harm will reach you. Sunagakur will be. Gara's attention was caught by something that suddenly made a charge towards him from the sky even higher than he was. Whatever the projectile was it was moving so fast that all he could tell was that it was a white blur. Eventually, it caught close enough to his face that he was able to depict it as some kind of strange mockingbird. That was made of clay. Katsu. An explosion of sulfuric bright smoke swallowed Gara, hiding him from the view of civilians and shinobi. The shouts of Gara's name and the cries of jubilation were quickly replaced by shrieks of panic and confusion as they saw this strange, massive owl start to slowly drop in altitude until it was floating right where their Kazakiyaj was. It was only when the shinobi who knew this wasn't right started to move them somewhere safe did the civilians realize what was happening. Their Kazakiyaj was being attacked. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy it. If you want the next part of this video. 
turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video.